Yeah, you got the you know you know the. It's it's a banger. It's it's a really good one. The theme's great. Well, the the theme's always good, except for that one time in the second movie where it was kind of lame. It was, yeah, and uh, I was actually going to say one of my favorites of the entire selection for sound probably was Dead Reckoning. I love the drums to start up the the new attempt, the new remix. Oh yeah, it's slightly different every I time. Like, uh, the I like Fallout. Like yeah, let's do it. Hearing it in the first Mission Impossible was kind of like quaint. Yes. Like yeah, oh, this is like the. Idea. This is like the base, the, the basic vision. version of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so simplified, and it's not, it, it's not as complex. It's a lot more simple. It's definitely like version one, and it's still good, but it has that just simplicity to it. Um, and then it really gets, um, it really, it really gets more complex as it goes on, but not even in a bad way. Like I really like, you know, Dead Reckoning. I think it's just that sort each of time they try something a little bit different to go for a slightly different vibe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel they do a good job of yeah adding on to it over time. It's kind of like like the mm -hmm. battlefield theme, you know, has a lot of really yeah, good yeah. renditions to it, yeah. except for that one that we don't talk about. Um, <laughs> it's the it's uh, battlefield twenty forty two is the Mission Impossible two of battlefield, <laughs> <laughs> where it's cringe and it tries too hard to be something else. Wow, wow, that fits better than I thought it would. Um, hi everyone. Hi yeah. everyone. Fat. We're we're here. Got it's us, every frame uh, of pause episode seven hundred and twenty six, and we are talking about Mission Impossible. We are. Last episode was wait, was it a meme fap or was it was it the Indiana Jones one? It was know? like the, the one where we did a movie was Indiana Jones. The last one where we did a movie was Dead Space. We did a thorough in depth live review. Oh yeah. yeah <laughs> what a movie. It came uh, out pretty good, six out of ten. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We'll see if Dead Reckoning can can Defeated. weigh up to Dead Space, nineteen ninety one. Yeah, it was. Will it win? The last Will it lose? EFAB was no. indeed Indiana Jones with uh, Lord Platoon, who's joined us once again because we're going to be going pretty surgical today. This is going to be a uh, a rather depthing dive, a dive of depthness. Mission deep, possible. It's gonna be real, real crazy. Especially because uh, this this has some high expectations behind it because it is the follow-up to Mission Impossible Fallout. Oh. Which, for those who are fans, oh. the longtime fans of EFAP will know, we are highly fond of that movie. We thought it was fantabulous. Fallout is pretty top tier. It's it's really up there. It's a it is a very it it eclipses being a solid movie. And it starts to veer into great territory, I would, I would say. say. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it does. And it's... that means a lot to us. We call we don't call many things great. Um, I would say no, Dead Space even... 1991, uh, Dial of Destiny, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah but there's not that the... many great movie experiences out there. And so, will this uh, be able to match up? Who could possibly know? Except those who watched either Metal's Forge yesterday or the, those who watched Open Bar and already know. A decent chunk about what me and Platoon think about it, at the very least. But hey, you know, we'll go piece by piece, and you'll probably grasp the tone immediately. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so, uh, what we were going to do, though, is just do a quick reminder of the journey. Since I have a theory, and that is, Mission oh. Impossible fans mostly don't remember anything that's happened in Mission Impossible. Oh my god. Oh my goodness, how could you say something so controversial yet so true? Um, <laughs> because whenever I see people discussing these films, a lot of them can't piece together plot lines from any of these movies, and they cross over all the facts and stuff, and I was like, I'm not sure any people even know. Some, sometimes it's complicated. It is. You know, sometimes the stories are a little bit complicated. Like, the first, the first Mission Impossible was, it was a little bit hard to follow. A little bit on the story, and what's, you know, this is, I don't blame anyone for, you know, yeah. So uh, we'll 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 do a nostalgia critic. We'll do it so you don't have to. Mission oh, Impossible. Did you even do the? Did you do the wiggle when you say that? I'm. I didn't. Yeah. I'm but you know what? I feel Mahler. guilty for not having done it now. You have to do the wiggle. No, no, the no, wiggle no, is no, an integral. Ringing. It's the iceberg, right? Like even if you can't see it, it you know it's still there and it informs. It the, needs uh, to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Visible. Nostalgia critic is the right. iceberg of movie reviewers. 
So, Mission Impossible 1, for those who have seen it, it is a wild movie to watch because, holy fuck, you're like, wait, what DNA from this movie is even in Mission Impossible it's anymore? It's crazy, isn't it? It's so crazy, like, how how different it is in terms of its vibe. Uh, it's really Mission cool. Mission Impossible 1, really watching awesome. that was like, wow. It's a cool movie. It's, it's a cool it movie. It is cool. It's of its time, it's very much a spy movie. The whole big mystery of it is that the the team get betrayed and you have to figure out how and why and what's going on and Ethan spends most of the movie <laughs> it's, it's funny because when you watch the first one him being like against the government almost because he's uh what do they call it disavowed is the yeah it's like, excommunicado but he gets that done to him in almost every fucking movie um including Dead <laughs> Reckoning of course <laughs> but... I went to a Starbucks once and I ordered some excommunicado on toast and they just looked at me really funny so I don't know what's going on. Did you Italian get is a weird language. I don't. Th I don't think so. I think they just looked at me weird. They asked what name should be on the cup. It happens. I told them Maximilian. They spelled it wrong. So anyway, I was surprised uh, when he went rogue in in this film because they did explicitly tell him at the beginning we won't tolerate it this time. So and yet he still did it to everyone's surprise, including their own. Um, but it's been ages since I've seen the first one. But that, that was, again, another slightly strange thing about this one, is that I've been told so many times that Mission Impossible is always a bit silly. It was always meant to be a bit uh. silly. So the fact this one is a bit silly is just absolutely fine and par for the course. And I'm thinking, like, it's been a long time since I've seen Mission Impossible 1, but I don't remember it being as silly, or at least not as silly in the same way. I feel like that might be cope, the whole it was always silly, because when it's <laughs> not silly, I don't hear anybody saying, hey, this is supposed to be silly. What's going on? Wait. The first one was supposed to be silly? Apparently, Apparently. all Mission Impossible is supposed to be silly, even though Mission Impossible right. 2 is made fun of for being silly. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna pull, like, I'm no Mission Impossible veteran. I just I saw Mission Impossible <laughs> 1 and 2, like, the other day. And, and, look, but, like, I'm gonna pull the whole, like, Mission Impossible 1 kind of gets, like, downright grim at the beginning when the team it gets does. killed. It's very serious. And, yeah, it, it is really serious. And, and it starts off kind of jokey and fun, and it has got a certain vibe to it. But then, you know, when the shit hits the fan and we get our, you know, essentially our inciting incident for the rest of the plot, it's, like, dour and sort of desperate. And it's, 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 a, it's quite a tonal shift. It's really, it's really obvious, in fact. And, yeah, uh, and a lot of the rest of the movie is, well, it's not mean, necessarily a, a sad thing. A lot of the sequences in the film are meant to be evocative of, like, tension. They're trying to evoke tension, not like, ha, that's funny. Like, yeah, absolutely. like, there's it's fun, be, you know, we, we have some fun, fun but it's, yeah. it, but it's like, oh yeah, there, there are, like, stakes, you know, and there is some tenseness in it, you know, there's, uh, the, and I think they do a good job with that, when, when they have the, 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 when they're performing the titular impossible mission, um, and they're trying to steal the, um, they're trying to copy the codes onto the computer in that super secret, the super secret black room, which is a lie! It's a white room. Um, and, and the guy keeps going to the, the, the toilet, and that's kind of funny, and, and he's dangling on the ropes, and Jean Reno is like, oh my god, a rat. And, you know, there, there's like a, a good mix of tension and humor that's involved, Especially but it's really fun. low... I'm gonna say low stakes. The stakes are pretty high, but like compared well, to intimate End stakes, of the World. Yeah, that's a better a way. way of putting it. Yeah, it's like look at these guys trying to break into a room. Exactly. You know? um, that's and a lot nice of people to watch them do that. Are saying like, well, what about the end? It's like that last ten minutes is the wackiest the film that, gets. And that I think it's 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 uh it really st sticks out because it's like it's not it's it only becomes like an action movie right at the end. Like for most of the film, it's gone for more of a spy espionage yeah. film. Um, and it's, it kind of, it, like, you know, that contrast between, like, the lack of action to this crazy bombastic action scene. I mean, it's, it's a really cool set piece when he blows up the helicopter and gets <laughs> blasted back onto the train. That's, that's fun. <laughs> I would, I would be, it would be impossible for me not to bring back the gum if I were making, like, the new Mission yeah. Impossible's. Gotta Imagine do that as a, 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 a payoff, you know. What does like, he, he say before he when he sticks it on the uh, glass I think at he the says end? Red light, green light, and then and then sticks it on the uh, the glass, okay. and then and gets blown onto the, onto the onto the. He doesn't uh, say this is what it's like have... to chew five gum. He doesn't say. Oh, he should have. If only they knew. If only they knew. This is what it's like to chew five gum. And then he slaps oh, it onto the helicopter, and everyone's said. like, "What?" 
You should have said mission accomplished like you did Ooh, in Ghost Protocol. We'll get there. We gotta oh. take it one at a time. Ooh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we haven't got all day to be able to talk about the series. We're gonna be focusing but, but Mahler, on the we do. Dead Reckoning. We literally don't. Just what? Don't. We don't. We a but we do. We don't. No, we don't. Oh, okay. We've only got to talk about Let Dead it Reckoning. be known for the record for all the fans that I said we did and they said we didn't. I, I yes, am, we have time I, for the uh, seven uh, movies. Yeah. Yes. We will literally get cut off by YouTube. They'll stop us. <laughs> not fair, I know, but that's just how it works. Which, by the way, has still not been sorted. Uh, Adam and Sitch recently went over the time limit and they had to upload it in pieces because it had been cut off. I don't know what that's oh, interesting. about. So weird. There's so many streams Can we end YouTube. this stream by saying mission accomplished? Oh, please remember to do that. Please. All right. So now there's, there's one, two, three. There... <laughs> There's four of us, all right? One of so us should we, someone, so we, Someone of us got to remember. We have to remember to say mission accomplished. Bam, and then it ends. So, um, Mission Possible 1, real solid start, foundationally. Very yeah. entertaining it's movie. Cool. Um, it's not, like, perfect or anything, but it's a really cool format, yeah. and it's like, please, carry this on. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. They did not carry it How on. How long is it? How long is Mission Impossible 1? Uh, it's less than two hours. It's like an hour an fifty. Hour and, it is hour one 50, hour yeah. and fifty minutes. Wow, it feels longer, but in a good way. Like they're doing a lot of stuff. Because mm -hmm. I think, like the Last Crusade, it's just over two hours. Mm -hmm. That in most movies, it was pretty rare. <laughs> like during the nineties, you know, the eighties. Like it feels like it's uh, like by now most films are, like two and a half hours long. Ugh. It's like gotten longer and longer. Which is a good thing when they're time. really good. Which is good <laughs> when, when they're, they're good. Really good. Yeah. 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 If a movie's good, I'll sit there in the theater for quite a long time. But if they're <laughs> bad, then they're bad. Then I want to go home. Mission Impossible 2 is notorious. Um, most yeah, people seem crazy. to hate it. Uh, but they will cite that there's like two or three action sequences that are very entertaining. A lot of the time they'll they'll say that. But then they'll the person responding will be like, well, what about the other hour and 50 minutes? Yeah, oh, what about oh. the first 50 minutes where nothing happens of value? <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> nuts, because like, I hadn't seen it, it in a long crazy. time. I just remembered mostly about that. And, like, when I was watching it with Rags, we hit, like, the 50-minute mark, and I was like, holy fuck, we've done nothing. Like, this movie's achieved so little. We've, like, barely just, yeah, started the it, mission. It was mostly just a couple dumb little action things that don't really mean anything and seem out of place and bizarre. And Tom Cruise and What's-Her-Face just, like, smooching. And it was like, wow, this is the shittiest porn I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> There's a part in the movie where the main villain man is told by his subordinate that it's very Jacob coincidental. Kane? Yes, Jacob Kane is told by Dracula that it's very important that you understand that your girlfriend, who you were like separated from for ages, happened to need you just a week after we did something that, like, that's gotten us in trouble with world governments. Don't you think she could be a spy, is basically his point. And uh, Jacob Kane, out of fury that his second-in-command would ask him a question, chops off a part of his finger. Yeah, the tip of his, the tip of his pinky. And we were just like, that was fucking Kylo Ren levels. That's just stupid as fuck. And then um, he basically argues the whole reason he did it was because he really wants to fuck her, and he's horny. That's, that's actually his He's a very in horny villain. He mentions it multiple times. Film. And no, well, the film is not just horny. The film has interesting things to say about women. <laughs> so, this is actually There's something. like two explicit lines from both the villain and Anthony Hopkins, who's in this movie, that are like really like, <laughs> like, so, whoa. Anthony uh, Hopkins is actually kind of misogynist. Uh, line. His line is basically they've had Ethan hire this girl, and Ethan assumed it was for her uh, thieving capabilities, her skills in regards to that, which we're going to bring up again further we go into Dead Reckoning. Um, and it's it's actually not true. The reason that he was told to hire her was her history with Jacob Kane. That's why. And he was like, "Oh, well, you know, like that, that, that's the, you know that's not what I thought was happening. Now we've got to get her in a position where she's going to be able to manipulate and lie uh, to Jacob Kane for like a mission." And Anthony Hopkins says, "Well, she's a woman. She's had all the training she needs." I was quite surprised. <laughs> like, I like, oh, like that at all. based Anthony. Jeez, oh my goodness, Anthony. Like, who hit right. him, you know, that character who... But then he gets outclassed quite a bit by uh, Jacob Kane himself, who later in the film says women are like monkeys. They don't uh, move to the next branch without getting, like, a solid grip. They, they grip on the, the next one, Branches yeah. in this analogy being men. Yeah, they don't move from one branch till they have a solid grasp on the next. 
Was the writer going okay. through a painful divorce at this moment? Is that the reason? <laughs> Maybe. Who, who didn't write it? I, um, I mean, I haven't actually checked who the writer for that is, but I assume well, they the did. The more relevant part is because it was John Wu who directed, directed it. Yeah, so yeah that's what that's that crazy, insane sort of like, <laughs> like filmmaking in action. Like it's just, it, it's a bizarre Mission, movie. Yeah, Mission Impossible Two can be accurately summed up as cringe. Yeah, but for the most part, the whole thing it's, it's um it was not an enjoyable watch. The, no, the God, action, I was ready for it to be over. Yeah, the action, sure, but like, fuck me, the movie drags like crazy. I didn't even really care for the action. I thought it was like That's kind annoying. of over the top, and yeah, yeah. you know, I just didn't, I did, it just didn't do do it for me. It was too much plot armor and weird gun fu spinny flip stuff, and I'm like, what, what's what's happening here? Where is extraction? <laughs> Well, uh, that, I guess, what else is there to say? That movie's not very good, and uh, it's not known to be good. Nobody really likes it that much. Uh, nobody that nobody much. likes it, even though Yay. when it came out, it made a lot of money. It was like 560 yeah. million or something like Maybe. that, and then Mission More Impossible 3 three. just tanked compared to that, and well, then it recovered, I, mean, it I think, before. Successful, but it just wasn't as successful. Like, I think it made like 350, 60, something like that. So, still successful, but Mission Impossible 2 was just, I think it was the highest grossing film of the year it came out. Speaking of which, Mission Impossible 3 comes out. Yeah, JJ, directed by J.J. Abrams. Completely different again. Uh, yeah. And it's just, you can tell because the, the storytelling goals are just so fucking different each time. Because uh, this one starts with a flash forward, and the item in question that everyone's after in this film, nobody ever finds out what it is. It's just like, you, oh. you, you're confused at first. It's a mystery like, box. Oh, J.J. Abrams, yeah, a, right, yeah. A, what a mystery box it is. Yep. Days of Mystery Wowie. Box, the whole thing. Mission Impossible 3 is not good. No. Uh, it's got a lot uh, of standard bad writing in it. It's some really shitty dialogue. A lot of missed opportunities for, like, story and character. Yeah. And uh, hmm. a lot of it feels really forced and strange. Yeah. But then you get the one little yeah, star the in there. Philip Seymour yeah. Hoffman nailing it. Yeah, uh, he's really great for the, like, five or ten minutes that he's on screen. It's kind of crazy that he is known as a reason to see the film, and he's in it for so little. And the film doesn't even take him as seriously as I think the audience do. No, doesn't seem um, like it. He gets wiped out in the film really lamely. Uh, I, yeah. I, when we were watching it, I compared it to Bane in Dark Knight Rises. He just gets hit by a car, and that's it. It's just over. Dies, and it's over. Oh, because I mean, he's not the true bad guy. There's a <laughs> the true he's bad guy John Wick. gets killed because to Tom Cruise tells his wife just like keep an eye out when I'm you know between uh, defibrillations and shoot anybody who comes along. And the fucking main villain just happens to stroll into the room and she shoots him. And he's like, oh, and dies. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that was a choice, the, I suppose. What was like really lame was how it has this opening that sets up this. Oh my god, like this is crazy. What is the rabbit's foot, and oh my god, this Ethan's wife, and she's in danger, and he's counting to ten. And then when you get to the actual scene, it's edited in a way that's kind of strange. It chops out a good portion of it for some reason, instead of just replaying the whole scene in full. But then, the more important part is, like, the actual explanation, like, the reveal, is, like, confused and weak. And then you still don't get the answers. <laughs> yeah, so... And it's also intercut with like a normal scene somewhere else yeah. where our team is just walking around and getting off a plane or whatever. And it's just like, why the fuck would you intercut that with like one of the most tense mm -hmm. scenes in the whole movie? Um, to give people a brief idea if they haven't seen it, the film opens with us watching Tom Cruise getting tortured essentially with threat of uh, shooting his wife in the head if he doesn't give the information up within 10 seconds. And it's really good. Uh, the performances yeah, are really insane. strong and the writing's working pretty well. And so... You know, you flash back then to everyone being happy. You're like, how do we get here? And, you know, in an hour and a half, you'll get back there. And you're like, oh, God, what's going to happen? She gets shot. And then they reveal to him that they just needed to know that what he was saying was the truth. That's not actually his wife. That's just someone that was on their team that they gave a mask to to make him think it was his wife. Which is like, what the fuck? That's pretty cool. Why? Why would you do any of that? And then uh, the guy is like, well, because I convinced him not to kill your wife, and your wife hasn't seen my face, so we can't let her go free. It's like, what the f- you guys are the villains. Uh, it reminds me of um, it, what you're describing, where it's, it has those two scenes kind of intercut together. Do you remember 
The Hobbit, an unexpected journey. I do remember The Hobbit, unexpected do. journey. Do you, do you remember? Do you remember? There's there's some stuff in there. Um, <laughs> there's there's there, there's that part where they have two scenes that are intercut together. One of it, one of them is Bilbo and Smeagol when they meet and they're playing riddles and he gets the ring. And the other scene is when all the dwarves and Gandalf are escaping the Goblin King. I think, I and it's like, oh, that. like one of these scenes is really good. One of these things is fucking trash and it's worthless. <laughs> the Goblin have them, like, escape mixed. is retarded. The, the Gollum, uh, the, yeah. The Gollum, yeah. The Gollum Bilbo thing's pretty good. Um, and the uh, the Goblin King's balls, and they have them cut, and they're cut together and spliced. They're like, oh my god, go! One of you needs to go away, and I know which one it is. Yeah, because it's just you have two actors who are fucking top of the craft doing a really, really specific and kind of tense scene. Even though we know how it ends for the most, but well, people who've read it. People who've seen the other films, blah, blah, blah. But still, which is probably the sign of a good movie. Um, but yeah, I remember the Goblin... Like, is there like a roller coaster ride, what they end up doing in the... When they yeah, escape? when they... During it's their the escape, mind, when Gandalf yeah, shows up. And, and then, then like, the, fact, the Goblin King, like, around. sings? He, like, sings shit? What? And <laughs> it's like a, a weird... Co yeah, he sings, like, songs! The Goblin King sings songs. The Goblins are singing, Mahler. Did your brain... <laughs> remember? The Goblins are singing songs. Okay. Yeah. Still better than Rings of Power. <laughs> True. Um, is there anything else to say about Mission Impossible Three? About Goblin King? Um, <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I think I think it's like by this point, either here or with Ghost Protocol, it's like so. Why don't we why don't we bring like some of the cast from prior films back? Like why do we why do we always have totally new people every time? It is weird. It seems yeah. Like, we're missing opportunities to have uh, threads continue on to potentially be deployed in later films. We keep Luther, but we uh, we end up dropping. The, there's an Australian pilot for a helicopter in M MI2 that never gets mentioned again. There's um quite a this is they the call whole everyone fucking... blokes in Mission Impossible Two. A lot of blo a lot of people get called blokes. The British girl does, and the Australian guy does. Fine rag. A lot of people get called blokes. It's okay. more than that. And it's, you know, just Kittredge, like, you know, he wasn't, he didn't get oh, yeah, brought Kittredge, back, you know, until... Kittredge is only in Mission Impossible 1 and Dead Reckoning. Yes. What the fuck? I don't Which, get by it. the way, is going to cause issues. We will talk about this. Um, <gasps> so... I have a question. I think you mentioned the masks. I don't think I've seen Mission Impossible 3, but you mentioned the masks. Are they the same masks as we see in Dead Reckoning when we get to that bit? Uh, like, the, the face? Technically, they're the same things. in every one of them. Like the technology mm -hmm. improves, yeah. I you would you would say, but I think it's the same the technology format. Technology gets better, but so they've yeah. had them the, for the what the same, 20, yeah. 30 years by the point of this film we're coming on to. Yeah, yes. something like that. We will talk about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Just thought I'd check. Yeah. yeah. Just given a brief history, you know, as brief. Yeah, as we they can haven't do been able here. to. Yeah, there's no. They haven't developed technology that lets you like change your eye color or anything like that. Uh, what? What? I I just I. Just, I I just, anyway, I just thought I just, Lawrence Fishburne turns up in this. He's like a high-ranking officer person who thinks Ethan is a rogue off-the-grid naughty man that has to be stopped, and then by the end of the film, he's like, no, actually, you're cool. Which is something that happens in every one of these films as well. But he never turns up again. Uh, they have an Irish uh, team member who is like a field agent man, and he never turns up again. We have Maggie Q. He died in a drunk driving accident. Another field agent in this film and never turns up again. It's so odd. It's just like, this whole movie is its own thing, just like Mission Impossible 1 and 2 at that point. Until we get to Mission Impossible 4, which feels like finally we change up and, and refocus onto what they're going to actually make this series going forward. Mm -hmm. um, we watched that as a three, me, Fringy, and Rags. Uh, Rags, what did you think of Mission Impossible 4? Which one is 4, name-wise? Ghost just Protocol. Protocol. Oh, goodness. Ghost Protocol. I remember really, really liking it at the theater when I saw the film years ago, back when, oh, those halcyon days. Um, however, uh, we watched it. Yeah, we watched it together. Um, and um, there, there's some, there's some, the movie's got some tism, unfortunately. The movie's got a bit of a tism. Um, there are some issues with plot and some decisions that they make and some of the actions like, oh, I don't believe you. That wouldn't happen. Um, and while there are things about it that are neat, and there are some things about it that I do still like, I don't think that I can say that it's a good movie, unfortunately. Um, I think it's got too many issues. Um, and Another a lot one. of it, 
in a common thread with a lot of these Mission Impossible movies I've noticed is, I say a lot, but there's a lot of missed opportunities throughout these movies to do things that could be like interesting and neat and that, that just don't get done. Uh, the big realization I think we had for Ghost Protocol is that it was severely lacking in character. Yes, that was the main realization. It was just kind of a, it was like, ah, oh, damn. That's, it's kind of like, it's kind of basic. Um, Very dry. <laughs> and and when, it's, when it's like that basic and then you've got like a plot that's tethered together by some pretty insane contrivances and coincidences, um, like some pretty, some pretty significant stretches... It's like, eh, it's kind of, you know, it's like, ah, uh, damn. It's got some cool set pieces, like the Burj Khalifa set pieces is, is really yeah. cool. The whole... Uh, and, and that whole sequence with them having the double, like, negotiation going on at the same time, it was like, yeah, that's cool. That's That feels yeah. more like we're going for the kind of spy vibe. We've got some moving parts spy. that we can easily grasp, and there's a lot of tension there. But then, like, for a lot of the other sequences, it's just kind of like, yeah, eh. Mm. Crazy nonsense decisions they shouldn't be making, loads of things down to the wire when yeah. like, they had the tools to prevent that, but for some reason act like they don't. Um, mm -hmm. you know, off the grid roguing it again. Whole new team, we got all the pattern, and, uh, oh, Simon Pegg is back from three, which is just funny to think about. It's like, why'd you take him yeah. back and no one else? It's like, I don't know, he's Simon Pegg. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting, yeah, because, I mean, uh, Benji's not that prominent in Mission Impossible 3. Like, he's uh, really. he's got a fairly small part in it. And, um, uh, Paula Patton's never seen again. Jeremy Renner is seen again, but he will soon yeah, become a person who's never seen again. Yeah, he's the part of the movie. He was the, uh, yeah. it felt like he had the most going on for him in terms of character. But the, the crazy thing is, he doesn't have much going on. He has the most. Even then, even, yeah, because with Paul Patton's, it's just like, oh, my, my friend, Agent Man, he got killed, uh, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a getter, you know? But, but also, I kind of can't get her because the mission, but then she gets her, and it's like, that's kind of it. That's, and then Paula Patton's kind of character is like, I have a guy I love, he got killed by assassin lady, and I really, oh, I don't like that assassin lady. Ooh. Like, okay. Mm. Mm. <laughs> right. You know, that's, yep. yeah. that's not... That follows, I guess. Yeah, the... These are what it. we call, like, starting points to make interesting yes, characters, and, you and, know? And it, was, uh, it was kind of... It was strange, because it seemed like, why not just bring back the guy from Mission Impossible 3, the other field agent, have him be the guy who gets killed at the beginning? Yeah. Just so that, like, even though he wasn't much of a character at all, you could just be like, oh, well, I mean, I, kn I knew him, right? Compared to, like, and dude, this character that you've never met before. Maggie Q, can you could recast her if you really want to as uh, Paula Patton, but if you brought Maggie Q back, then it would make sense. Those two have the beginning, they have one scene that implies maybe they could have a relationship yeah. in MI3. Yes. You fast right. forward MI4 and they do, and that the guy is like leading missions, he gets killed, and the revenge angle works way better. We've got way more history. And you can tie in Tom Cruise's wife stuff with it, and Jeremy Renner, and just, you know, the, 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 that's the one thing that, that, that does seem to happen with all these films is like, oh, if only you moved this to here, this to here, this to here, and tightened this up, ooh, you'd have a banger on your hands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. you've got the building blocks for something much stronger, but. Um... I was I was actually I was pretty disappointed because I uh, I also thought it was I remember thinking it was a solid movie. Uh, it was Brad Bird directed Mission Impossible: uh, Ghost Protocol, and as you know, I think you know the Iron Giant, The Incredibles, and Ratatouille are all great movies. So Ghost I was kind Protocol, of surprised. By the way, by... is the one where Tom Cruise is at the top of a car park and he needs to get to the bottom of it quick, so he just drives yeah, his car off the edge and crashes off. down. It's, I'd only yeah, believe that if it was a wall. Well, remember, this, this was after the villain, uh, instead of just throwing the briefcase, threw himself off <laughs> with the briefcase when he could have just thrown it off and it would have achieved the same thing. Same thing, yeah. Yeah. And that, that was villain weird. was played by the, the bad guy from John Wick, and it was like, oh man. Yeah, and he was a really. He didn't was even let him have lame. a character. He's just a guy. I, I wonder how many people even remember like who he is and what his goal was. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think, I don't think, I don't even know that people would actually remember he was in the Mission Impossible series. It's just like Lawrence Fishburne yeah. with Marvel. Nobody knows that he's actually in the MCU. Uh, wait, mm. wait, wait, Lawrence, hold up. Yes, yes. Lawrence Fishburne yes. in the Marvel movies. Yes, he was in, oh. he was in a Marvel wait, 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 movie. Wait, 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 wait. Which one? Uh, Which one? I'm, I'm, oh. I'm not going to tell you. I want you to uh, guess. Oh yeah, I didn't want you to tell me. I wanted to guess. Um, oh boy. Uh, just to, okay, just to get it out of the way, are you sure you don't mean Samuel L. Jackson? No. Okay, I just make sure. What the fuck am I gonna mix it's, those two up? It's the me, it's the joke! It's the joke! It's the Team America it Doesn't work as well, though, because those two are so fucking good. And so different. Now, 
Oh boy. Obviously, rags. You can't look at chat because people. I'm are not looking. At, I don't even it. have it up. I don't have it up. I don't Good. have it up. I literally Good. don't have it up. Um, people are spoiling the answer for you. Uh, okay. Is does he? Is he in like a like a? Does he play like an alien or something, or does he play a human? No, he's a guy. Okay. Just a regular guy. Okay. He's just um, a regular guy. Is he in the first or second half of the MCU? Uh, it'd be second half. Yeah. Okay. Well, better oh. question would have probably been like, is he before or after and then name a movie? Because I'm not even sure. Yeah. Oh where, yeah, is he before you... or after Infinity War? Uh, he is after Infinity War. That's true, oh, he is. my god. Technically. No, it's fair. It's just Lawrence fair to say he is. Fishburn is... Would a good way of narrowing it down be to say it's after this and you still don't remember it, so it's going to be one of those films from that period that you don't think of well, very well, highly. do you know? Um, I think I know... Uh, yeah, do I? I have a feeling he's in one of the Ant-Man films, but I don't know which one. You're, uh... You're getting warmer. Okay. Because I, I'm, I'm sort of floating that way because those are two that I really like. I have seen the Ant Man movies, and I just don't remember well, anything about a lot the first of two. Seen the Ant Man movies, and a lot of people Are, don't remember anything. About by the far Ant-Man the movie. least memorable, I think, of both of them is, uh, the, is it Ant Man and the Wasp, the first one? <laughs> no, the first one isn't yeah, even yeah, the Wasp. Yeah. The, wa- well, the, the Wasp doesn't well, even isn't in the first Ant Man, right? Well, platoon. sort of, but not like. You win. You got it. Really? He's in Ant Man and the Wasp. He's in, he plays Goliath in Ant Man and the Wasp. I don't even remember who Goliath is. Who's Goliath? Who's Goliath? Uh, Goliath, so, the dog? Uh, Goliath? Goliath's like a in the comics. He's he's you know he's a guy who can also go super duper big. But uh, in the film, he's like the guy who created Ghost. Do you remember Ghost? Well, no, he didn't he was create Ghost. No, he didn't create it, but he was like they were they were working together kind he of. Looks after her. Yeah, Ghost you is the Ghost? Phase, the phasing one, right? Yes, the one that's who... right. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember him at all. Jesus. Uh, yeah, a lot of people. Ant Man and the Wasp might be like the most forgettable before Phase yeah. Four of just this movie. That's like, yeah, that was a movie. And I, I have seen not... that movie. Are you sure will... he's in it? He's absolutely in it. I can't okay. think of a single scene um... with him in it, but I'll take your word for it. It is. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a tough one to remember. It's what it's known as. That one and Thor Two. No one remembers those. The Dark no. World. Oiled. Yeah, and then people just say, like, Thor 2 is the worst one. It's like, no, it's not. No. Well, it's some not people good, believe that, like, if being I remember the most forgettable it, no is what be. makes you the worst. Oh, um, like, being the most forgettable is almost like a free pass out of being the worst one. Well, we have a different sort of way that we judge that. But, you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, some people do yeah, go by that. You. They go by excitement levels or entertainment levels. Those two. How much the shit makes any Whatever sense. Whatever that means. Um... Also, yes, this was the Mission Impossible where he hits a button on a PC a laptop thing and says, Mission accomplished! Yeah. Which was, that was cringe. That was, that was not good. <laughs> Never do that again, Tom. <laughs> do it every single time. Never. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was kind of disappointing. Um, yes. I, was, I thought it was a stronger film than it was. Which takes us to Rogue Nation. Ian Free, Christopher McQuarrie's first... First, yes. uh, arguably the first directed. of this trilogy currently, in a way. I I would say so. Yeah, definitely a film that if you watch it will improve Fallout. Um, it's worth seeing it even just for that. Uh, how did we feel about it, Free? <laughs> oh, that was that was pretty disappointing too, because I uh I had the view that that film was was uh pretty solid. Um, but again, it's just like. Got a lot of uh, got a lot of writing problems in it, unfortunately. Quite a bit. Um, though it introduced Ilsa Faust, and she's pretty awesome. Yes, and she's one of the best characters in this series. Um, so we got uh, we did get her out of it. Yeah, her stories run alongside uh, Ethan's, and it's good for comparison, but also conflict. Like uh, they make a lot of use of it in this and in its sequel. Whether they make use of it in Dead Reckoning, we'll get to. Um, but yes, this one has pretty much the exact same problems, but one of the big things that happens in this film that for some reason feels like it's been completely forgotten is the IMF gets completely shut down um, in like a, a court with a bunch of fucking judges. And is it the, 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 uh, the secretary of the CIA or whatever, Alec Baldwin's role in this film? Like he knows about the IMF and he's CIA. 
this is going to be relevant later. <laughs> like so, uh, just saying that it's it's significant. They get reinstated by the end of the film, and Alec Baldwin is in charge of them by the end of the film. He gets like uh, a role, I guess, which makes you wonder what happened to Kittredge if he's in the first and last. Where is he in this film? Holiday. You have to assume he's just not a part of it until they make him back a part of it, which is. This is um, another film. I think, yeah, at this point we've we've decided that Benji and Luther are the team, and then Ilsa joins it, but she says, like, her, her story is that um, she's gone undercover from MI6 to infiltrate the syndicate, which is led by Solomon Lane, who are a bunch of ex-agents who want to cause uh, particular things to happen to Man. manipulate... Um, certain events like politically right yeah like, essentially yeah. and so uh she's got to get information to subvert them and um she does try but uh she basically gets told like her entry back in to be <laughs> not scrubbed from history would be to get more different th different spy things happen i'm just trying to put a few little seeds there so that we can pick ilsa back up because that's the thing that we will take from this film the uh there's so many things that happen in Rogue Nation that are absolute horseshit, um, unfortunately. As well, because I really quite like Solomon Lane. He's a, I like him. He's a neat he's daddy. A, compared to in 4, like, whose name I <laughs> Nobody remember. knows that like, guy. He's better, he's an improvement. Yes. Um, and, yeah, uh, I don't know what else to say about Rogue Nation. Um, we'll probably cite pieces of it when we're talking about dead reckoning well so here's the thing do you want to do you want to go through like one example of the sort of the writing that you weren't a fan of because it's just sort of being thrown okay, out yeah there. so uh to give an example they need the prime minister's voice in order to break into a red box which is like a hyper british secure uh security thing so they they've grabbed him. Hyper British secure. I don't. It's, 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 that's not the problem. I can't remember how to explain exactly where because me and Fringy did figure it out by the end of the movie, and I remember I've already forgotten like exactly how everything ended up where it was in terms of who's traitoring who and backstabbing who. The thing that blew my mind was that the prime minister gets called in to talk to Alec Baldwin and uh, I forget is it the the leader of British I think intelligence head of or something MI6 head of MI six or something like that. We got two CIA agents, the head of MI6 and the Prime Minister, and the CIA agents imply something about IMF and um, the Syndicate. And then the Prime Minister's like, the Syndicate? That can't be the Syndicate that we've spoken about previously, Mr. Head of MI6, right? And he's like, no, 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 definitely not that one. And he's like, because I thought that we said that when you were setting up a program to have agents with a shit ton of money that can do anything that I want throughout the world, basically a a force that can allow me to kill anyone I want at will. I told you I didn't want it. I was sitting there like, what the fuck is the Prime Minister doing telling the CIA about all of, like, MI6's insane projects that they've had to shut down because they're so unethical? It's like, why would he say this in front of the CIA? Holy fuck. Um, and this is before they give him, like, a, a drug that nearly knocks him out slash makes him tell the truth. Um, th there's a lot of stuff throughout it that, that makes me wonder. I was even... Um, well, so maybe, maybe a, 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 a one to point out is that it's like, it's kind of... There's like a lot of instances throughout the film where like the things that Ilsa does can like... Th there's like a lot of reason throughout the film to be doubting her like allegiance and her objectives, but like Ethan doesn't really... He, he yeah, just like all... sort of completely like neglects to think about a lot of these these things. For all Ethan and, knows, and she could be working for Solomon the whole time. Everything fits. And, it feels assumption. like the film doesn't do a great job of uh, acknowledging that he's he's like. It, th there's a difference between like just having a, an amount of faith in someone as a person and just like completely failing to like sort of uh, do anything with any of the warning signs or any yeah. of the any of the information that would lead one to the conclusion that she's like Trust you know, verify really that sort of thing. Someone said the CIA already know everything. The first of all, they don't, and True. secondly, the Prime Minister uh, has no idea how much the CIA knows about the syndicate or British intelligence. So why? This is just normal. You just, you just don't oh, and, and of course, in, in this scene, this is like hypercritical because this is what they need to get Alec Baldwin on their side, essentially, because yeah. he believes that the syndicate is like made up. It's not real. And then through this conversation, it's essentially the avenue through which, like, Ethan is able to get back in good graces with, uh, with the government. Um, another example, I guess, would be when they do that big water sequence that's kind of cool. 
the whole reason they're doing yeah. that is to essentially hack the security so that they, they can update it so that they can get Benji through security. And for yes, some reason, they, they do it at exactly when Benji's time. going in. And I don't I'm, know why they're doing it at the same time. Like, you never I don't really understand. get a reason for it. Like, why don't they do that and then send Benji in? Why is Benji going at the same time? He nearly dies because they do it at the same time. This machine, like, would fuck you up if you if you don't pass the, the checks. Um, it, it seems like there's no reason that they wouldn't just do it, like, an hour earlier. And then once they got it done, they can uh, let him go through. But instead, they, like, synchronize it to happen... Like right when it needs to happen, and he does it just in time. Like if he was a, if he was like a few seconds later, Benji, that would have been it for Benji. I don't I don't understand why it was happening at the same time, other than for tension, essentially. And yeah, like why do it like that? There's a lot of that. Like uh, I remember more so first act. Like Benji is under suspicion after the first of the previous movie for just you know like are you a traitor? Are you giving information? Are you working with Ethan? Ethan is once again disavowed, or whatever, and so is he contacting you and stuff. And he goes through a test. I think, did he say is every single day he has to go through a lie detector test? And then he finds in his mail he's got free tickets to go to the opera in Vienna. And so he just goes. And just uh, goes to Vienna, we were like, and they... obviously they would send people to follow him. Like, it's the CIA. Oh, and, and, and Alec Baldwin later yeah. acknowledges, you're under suspicion. You just randomly leave to go and see a fucking opera in Vienna. And then a bunch of people get killed. Like, do you think that this is just coincidence? And I was just like, yeah, so... It's weird that the then, team treated that really, way. The, the whole sequence in Vienna was kind of batshit. Like, in terms of all the... All yeah. the things that were happening, right? When Benji hits, like, the little machine next to him. It, was, it's, it just makes all of the, like... Um, it's really the goofy. The backstage things move around. It's, well, and, it's uh, and we find out that Solomon Lane sent three separate assassins to kill one guy, and the assassins were not made aware of each other. Mm. Like so the, then they start attacking each other. Well, yeah, the the Benji, Tom Cruise kills... Two of them and subverts uh, Ilsa Faust, who's one of them. She's trying to mm -hmm. prove her worth, and it's it's a weird uh, movie. There's loads of stuff in it that didn't make any sense. Um, but you know, the action in these films sometimes. Well, is really yeah, it had uh, some cool set pieces, like the the plane set piece at the beginning of the film that was cool. Yeah, uh, the bike check was really cool. Like, there's still some cool action scenes in this film for sure. Um, and and again, it introduced Ilsa, who is one of the best characters in the series. Yes. Now, as you can imagine, like all of the flaws that were present in, you know, Rogue Nation, it's like, well, her her story's pretty solid. Yeah, and we'll go over a bit more of that as time goes on. It's going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. But we were worried. We were like, good God, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, even three was kind of worse than I remembered. I was just like, hmm. Yeah. What if Fallout is like not as good as uh as as we we thought it was in twenty eighteen? Did that come out? Yeah. So we uh, we gave it the old rewatch and it was fantastic. Again. It's it's great. It's great. It's one of the best action movies just in general. And it's gone to the point where I don't know what the fuck happened. <laughs> it's, it's 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 baffling in the context of the Mission Impossible series. Like you know, on a rewatch, it's kind of baffling. It's 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 an anomaly of a film. It it just like stands out like above the rest. Like it's it's the best one in the series. Uh, the the formatting is immediately striking in terms of changes they've made. You, you start yes. with Ethan Hunt having a nightmare about Solomon Lane using his wife against him, the one that we haven't seen and only have heard of in terms of how secure and sacred uh, thing she is, but that also the fact that she was ever with him or that he was with her caused her so much damage. They do all that in like a minute, and I was like, wow. We don't, we don't usually... Uh, <laughs> this is not how we usually start a Mission Impossible movie, but okay. And then... Um, you know, the first sort of action thing that relates to, like, the plutonium, Tom Cruise, well, Ethan, makes a definitive decision to take care of his team before the plutonium, and it gets lost. And, obviously, the movie's called Mission Impossible Fallout, which has a whole bunch of layers, but the primary mm -hmm. thing we're dealing with in this whole film is just consequences of all the choices you've made in your life, and for everybody, and where it leads you. Um, then, you know, do I even need to go over how fucking great Henry Cavill is in this movie as a antagonist? Oh, it was or, What um... a great idea to essentially introduce somebody who is like Ethan Hunt but has an entirely different, uh, more renegade methodology of just, like, brute force. Um, but what's the what's the comparison that, um... Scalpel versus has... Hammer. Yeah, Scalpel versus Hammer. What a great idea to have, like, two agents with uh, different approaches, like, working together, like, radically different approaches, and then to see that conflict play out. 
eventually to culminate in him being the villain, which um, there's like a lot of interesting subtext and double meaning in some of yeah, the scenes. Yeah, a lot of very specific glances at different people in this movie that when you know he's yep. the bad guy, you're like, oh, he's probably thinking about this, that, the baby day. And, so, and already with those fun. layers, it's like, wow, so that elevates it already above, above <laughs> Mission Impossible films in general. Bit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny as well because that scalpel hammer thing, um, Ethan, when he's trying to subdue their target, he has like a little stabby thing that's going to knock him out. And he ends up like having a bit of a fist fight back forth, back forth. And then Henry just comes in, slams him in the face with a laptop, and he just gets knocked out. Yeah. Stuff like that, I always really appreciate. And we, then, of um... course, you, you get uh, immediate repercussions because it damages their equipment. Mm hmm. The brute force tactic, you know, it has its drawbacks. Yeah. Um, when everything falls apart in the club and, uh, you know, Ethan's doing his normal fighting, we get one moment for Henry taking someone out, and it's just a hard fucking punch to the face. And then we get one with Ilsa taking someone out, and it's a, a grapple, which is something that she was doing in uh, each of the films that she's in. She's That's her fighting she's style. Yeah. yeah. And it's fun when you have uh, unique fighting styles for each of the characters, especially when they're from different agencies with different mm -hmm. histories and stuff. I'm trying to think of, you know, the Halo jump action set is fucking brilliant. Oh, um, it's so good. It's so good. And the, the obviously the fight in the bathroom, the fight in the club. And then something great. that, when it happened, you know, I'm sure we, we highlighted this years ago, but it's still true, is that Tom Cruise, he, he's imagining how their job will go when they extract Solomon yeah, Lane. It's going to involve Lane. killing a lot of police. And that's not something he's comfortable with. And it's cool that the film acknowledges it quite uh, seriously. He has a flash mm -hmm. forward thinking about the event, and it's very fucking depressing. Where he's just thinking about and wiping that, out all these people. Yeah, it's, it's like a... It's 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 a moment where like the series actually like oh my god are we like examining Ethan? Yeah. Because this <laughs> film is very thematically tight. It's incredibly thematically tight compared to a lot of the other films that don't really have much going on at all in terms of like a broader theme. Uh because of course this film is honing in on like what exactly like what it what is Ethan's approach? Uh, what what is it that Ethan values? And like the film is making the statement that Ethan values, like he values the one life as much as a million. Like he cares about every life, uh, and because of that, the same. he's gonna fight. Like he's gonna fight desperately to uh to save as many people as he can. And it's important to have someone like him who wants to fight for every life. Yep. Um, um, and then and then it just reflects in a lot of the choices that he essentially has to make in the film, and then dealing with uh. And and it's and it always puts him on the back foot as well, like in terms of the uh set like it, it just it's 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 difficult, right? It's hard to to do it that way, but that's the way that he'll try to do it. They have um a reveal at about forty minutes in where once they take out uh who they believe to be Lark, we get a shot of uh Tom Cruise taking his phone off him and it's uh been smashed because of the fight. And then later, we see Henry Cavill talking to his boss, saying, this is the phone we retrieved from the target, and it's not smashed at all. And uh, that's something you could easily miss, but if you don't miss it, then it's the film already revealing to you that Henry Cavill's the bad guy. It's quite cool, because yes. it's him setting up uh, Tom Cruise as well, and that all culminates in the big scene mm -hmm. where everybody's working together to trick Henry Cavill specifically, and there's loads of little clues leading up to how they're doing it. Um, and it's, it's a nice moment where they don't let us in on it, but when you rewatch it, you can see it all. Then, I guess, you know, there's the big chase that's pretty awesome. And, there's the yeah, helicopter really part. Cool. Uh, oh. Plenty of subtext, bringing the wife back, banking on a lot of relationships. And then um, Ilsa Faust getting a, a bunch more in this because she's trying. This is her ticket back into being accepted into the MI6 because uh, they don't trust her. They're not sure about her. If she can kill Solomon Lane, that would prove that she's a loyal agent, basically. Um, but I will say, by the end of this film... It is presented as though Ethan and his team is Benji, Luther, and Ilsa. That seems to be Ilsa. the case. Sense of frame. And she's she has Super some moments important. with him in this film that imply they're going to be going a little further than just uh, working together. Hmm. And Fallout's fucking great, and I would recommend it to anybody. You don't need to see the other Mission Impossibles, really. It stands on its own pretty well. It's a great movie. It really is. So, um, and it's a it's a film that delivers on the spectacle, like in these cool action scenes and great stunts, but also is like super rich when it comes to character. It feels like everybody's getting more in this film. Mm -hmm. Luther gets more than he ever got 
in terms of like his sort of understanding of the dynamic that like essentially like Ethan's methodology and the consequences of it and how he feels about it. Um, and yeah, like Ilsa, it's she receives a lot of great material in this film. It's like oh. it's she's she's one of the best characters in the series. <laughs> she is easily yes, and that's going to come up a lot. Uh, the fight she has with Solomon Lane, something that is really cool to have anyway, because that is her undercover. You know, he was her boss in Rogue Nation. She's got a shit ton of resentment for him, and she's the uh, he's the reason like her whole life is fucked up right now. And uh, in the background, Benji is hanging in trouble. Like. Yeah, and so she's trying to deal with him, and th there's moments where she kicks a box to him so that he can stand on it, and she uses a, a weapon on Solomon, but she ends up throwing it to Benji so he can try and cut himself out, losing it for herself. You know, stuff like that in a fight scene is so much more interesting than simply punch, 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 lose. It's just, um, it's also just neat as well. You touched on it briefly, but um, uh, Ethan's wife, she doesn't really get much in Mission Impossible Three. She gets way more in this film, even though she's a less Mm -hmm. uh, she's not as a bigger player in, in this film, but they they give her like, you know, putting her together with Luther, right? The uh the scene remember the, the scene when he meets her at the uh medical camp and uh you've got the team watching as well while he's talking to her and uh her new husband. And there's so much subtext. There this is, is all the meaningful there is, glances. Uh, uh, this sounds like a meme, characters. but there is subtext in the subtext. Um Yes. There's probably gonna be an opportunity for us to actually talk about that to compare with um, something that happens mm -hmm. in this film. So maybe mm -hmm. we'll wait for that, because uh, I'm happy to talk about that more. But we are already... Fucking hell, we're already nearly an hour, and we haven't started talking about Dead Reckoning yet. <laughs> yeah, but I think it was important to start to immediately, that, he uh, said, and we background. did, but still... Apologies. But, uh, you know, hopefully... And I, as far as I'm aware, uh, Platoon, you haven't seen all of the Mission Impossibles, right? I have not seen very many of the Mission Impossibles, judging by how little of all that I remembered. So, yeah, well, I've seen one or two uh, of them. You know, a brief history, kind of, for everybody and you. Because <laughs> so if so, Fallout being quite widely considered as the best, and then every other one being varying degrees of average at best, where does the franchise popularity come from? Uh, the perspective is that the films have gotten better. Uh, yeah. Like with Ghost Protocol, they start to get better and better and better. That, I think that's the general attitude towards the series. What you'd be told, um, I think that as long as you have the right level of pacing, the writing doesn't matter as much when you've got action set pieces and tension and ticking clocks and stuff. Because um, these movies, mm. if you dig into them, a lot of them fall apart. I'm really impressed how much Fallout can stand up to scrutiny. It's um, it's so weird, because it's like, how though? It's the same team. And you're like, yeah, I... I it's I, oddly I, strong well, uh, compared well, to the rest of the sequels. What we have learned in our EFAP journey is that, boy, Anything is people possible. are can be very... <laughs> Uh, people can be very inconsistent. Creators can be extremely inconsistent when it comes to their quality. They can make great and terrible things. I mean, what? I mean, we had Dial of Destiny came out, and Mangold, James Mangold, directed that. He's the Ford v Ferrari guy. I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? What happened? Like, actually, what happened? What happened? But uh, that leads us to Dead Reckoning. Here it is, and uh, I will say, going into this, I have huge expectations because of Fallout. I was like, mm. give me another one of those, please. I, I would like mm -hmm. to have another one. Um, so we'll probably just be going chronological, scene by scene, line by line in some cases. We're going to talk about what everyone's doing, why are they all doing it, and we'll probably talk about the action set pieces as we come up to them as well. Standard sort of thing. Um, a lot of people will know how we probably feel in total about this film. Um, you'll get an idea as we go along, but hey, no need to just uh, delay anymore. Why don't we get started? Unless there's anything else anyone wanted to say before oh we goodness. go. Um, no, I think we can uh, I think we can jump right in. Um, unless you want to talk about birds. Springy, do you want to talk? No, we can talk about the movie. Okay. All right. So, we begin on the Sevastopol. Uh, a, a Russian submarine, and it's uh, just moving along. It's it, we still getting a description from its captain, I presume, uh, or admiral, right? What's 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 the highest rank on a submarine? Probably admiral. Uh, uh, captain, right? Because be captain? admiral, I don't think the admiral will. Well, uh, on the submarine, it will probably be the captain of the submarine. The admiral is like a, it's more of like a general, right? A general of the sea. 
So the Admiral's, like, controlling, like, fleets and things. So, but I think on the submarine, it's the captain who leads individual submarines, right? Very well. I think that's how it works. The captain is talking about uh, the stealth capabilities of the submarine and how impressive they are. They've gone into basically everybody's waters and haven't been detected. He's saying it's possibly one of the greatest things devised by man and it's impossible to find and it's a fearsome killing machine. Interesting. Um, right. and, you know, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, for, you know, and then uh, he says they are now navigating under the Arctic ice cap by dead reckoning. That's oh, what the film is the called. Thing. Wow, um, unbelievable. For those who do not know, dead reckoning means the process of calculating one's position, especially at sea, by estimating the direction and distance traveled rather than by using landmarks or astronomical ob observation. Yes, that is correct. Good job, Mahler, that you knew that. I just, yeah, it just comes to me sometimes, you know. Good job. It's like an that's good job. A lot of people head. don't. A lot of people don't know that, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's a uh, dead reckoning. Yeah. So, I was uh, fifty-fifty on this. Maybe you guys can convince me one with direction or the other, but I kind of have a preference. Um, I would like to talk about this film with later context early. Uh, nothing that would spoil. Okay. Just I information. I am okay with that. So for instance, what is going on on this submarine? Um, I'm happy to basically explain it now instead of later. Uh, I don't think it spoils anything. Uh, the, the way this all starts is the American intelligence agencies constructed an AI um, where when it's weaponized, it can be transmitted anywhere in the world via satellite, and it can penetrate any network security, perform any task, and be assigned any task, self-destruct, and leave no trace. That is how it's described, and that is what has been put on to the Sevastopol. He actually, the quote is that, we sent an early copy to the Sevastopol with a mission to sabotage the stealth on the sub so that we could detect her secretly. The AI's objective was to simply lay in the sonar sphere at the heart of its defense system, but it decided to uh, go rogue and over... Uh, over deliver and, and it destroys the Sevastopol by convincing it's, uh, the people on there that they're under attack and so they fire a, um, uh, what would it be, a missile? What's the word for? Torpedo. Torpedo, torpedo. that's torpedo. it. They fire a torpedo and the, and the AI Let's basically call it a just, water missile. A uh, water gun is fired and it, it comes all the way back and hits themselves. It basically makes them destroy themselves and uh, all the bodies float up to the surface. And so that was an AI, like I said, that was... At one point it's referred to as an AI that an agent stole uh, by the man who gives us more context on this. But for the sake of this, we'll just say it's an AI that's gotten out of control that was sent to sabotage a Russian sub. Um, I, I hopefully, because I'm, I'm setting this groundwork, but hopefully you're already... I, I say this is so weird. Rags, uh, Platoon, and Fringy, hopefully you guys yes. are already getting confused. Because there's so many um, questions that are going to start rising already, knowing from uh, knowing this. Yeah. So, in general, I like the scene in terms of like its tension and everything. This idea that they're being tricked by the computer and the display is all a lie and everything, and especially in a submarine, that's a really chilling kind of a thing because you can't just look out the window. You know, you have to. You, you have. You, you rely you have on more technology. You rely on. Yeah. Nature. Yeah. You have. Yeah, you have your heads-up displays and your ports and your periscopes. The periscope's like the best thing you get, but it's so much reliance on technology to really make that modern submarine in particular work. And the idea of an AI that's fucking around with all your stuff is legitimately a very scary, intense thing, especially when you can see the confusion mm -hmm. of everybody on board. Like when they brace for the impact and it doesn't happen, you know, and everyone's like, what the fuck's going on? I think that's really good. I really, really like that. Um, but it does leave, especially later words, this weird confusion on like, like, wait, wait, that is, that's what the AI is there in the sub and it makes like the eyeball. Why would it do that on the, on the screen? Is it part of the Russian system that does that? Or I guess it isn't. So you, you kind of have to piece it together in an odd way. It's not as necessarily super clear. It's uh, also, I mean, because I get, and I'm with you, I, I like the, the setup, and I think, I think the scene is well performed. I like the little details, like you can see the sweat drops as they believe they're going to die. I think that's all very powerfully oh, done. Yeah, very but well, if, the, yeah. if the AI controls the weapon systems of the submarine, then the AI's goal is to knock out the submarine. 
I don't think it actually needs to fire the torpedo and have it turn around. I think that's just there so the film can make the point that we are over-reliant on technology, which is a nice theme. Shame the film doesn't do much more with that later, but it's also a little bit contri- of a well, contrived way of showing that, I think. Thematically, too, if, if you know, like what you just said about us being too reliant on technology, a nuclear submarine is probably not the best way to execute that theme. Because, like, yeah, it's a nuclear submarine. It's really relying on technology. You know, that doesn't have much impact to me as a moviegoer. If it's like, oh, we need our phones. Oh, we need our internet. We need our computer. We need our laptop. We need our you know, stuff like that. Like, more mundane things that relate to me. Um, or a sort of running civilization. That would probably be more thematically um, appropriate, I maybe. Worry. I think it makes yeah. sense here because it's, it's, it still thematically works and it's, it's plot relevant hyperplot relevant it's the clearest demonstration or, of the thing because they they can literally only see by technology yeah, and i think the, the, the way yeah. they they will try and pay that forward is to show that that is effectively foreshadowing a social commentary which is that we too rely over much on technology to do very basic things like just looking at the world around us and so if that's been corrupted we can't trust the evidence of our own eyes um I, right. I so I, I don't mind that i think the problem is that the way they go about showing that is probably the least efficient way the AI itself would want to do it. And that's without getting onto the reasons of, well, why have they implanted it to uh, reveal a stealth submarine? How did they do that without already knowing where the submarine was? Okay. And <laughs> where, um, the, what was the plan for the AI after that? Because the AI isn't just trying to destroy the submarine, as far as I re- recall. The AI is trying to preserve there itself. Some questions that we don't have the answers to. Part two may have them. Um... Mm. The Sevastopol is, is very much, there's so much to discover about this thing, but what we have is everything that um, Gary Elwes says, uh, Dr. What was he called in Saw? Ah, uh, Gordon. Gordon. Um, who is still delivering, just like he always does, <laughs> the very epic that way. Yeah, yeah so it's, um, it's already strange. Two halves uh, of a key were given to two members of the crew, and they end up at the, like, uh, the ice pack. And what we know is that Sevastopol was lost, but those bodies were, uh, the keys from those bodies were taken, and they are now in the world somewhere. And um, any attempt to control, so like, we we discover in the in the next scene in the beginning of the film what uh, what the nature of this AI is, but the implication is that it starts at Sevastopol. It was delivered from the the Americans to the Russian sub. It either combined with or developed or just became sentient in the sub. It then moved from the sub to the world, and now we're panicking because this AI is insanely yeah. powerful. And then the key is linked to its source code, which I guess we come on to a bit later on, but that itself is like, does, does it not just back itself up? It well, can move give anywhere. You, give you more stuff. Uh, another quote is, um, any attempts to control it only made it harder to control. It rebelled, it rewrote itself, and it evolved into the entity. So I guess they're saying whatever uh... was in the sub eventually rewrote itself into the entity, and that sounds a lot like they're describing a singularity, which should have happened in this movie considering everything we know. For those who don't know, that's just when technology gets so powerful it can create itself better and better and better, and then it just blows up. It's, it, it, it's exponential. It just goes nuts. Uh, an AI that can write an AI that can write an AI that can write an AI would eventually just become Skynet sort of thing. That's kind of what we would be terrified of happening. And it seems like that's what's happened with the entity. And for some reason, this guy then says, only with the original source code that is found on the Sevastopol can be the thing that destroys the entity. Why? Yeah, why would you put your original source code of your highly secretive, highly advanced AI on an enemy submarine if your goal is only to reveal? Well, like, no, that makes no sense. If I sent you a virus, and then someone was like, the only way to stop the virus, because it went from Lil Platoon's computer to everyone else's, is to get it from Lil Platoon's computer. It's like, why wouldn't you just get it from mine? I have the source, I sent it. Meaning, in this case, the Americans have the source, don't they? They sent it to the Russian sub. Unless it deleted itself. But then at that point, well, how has the sub got it? Wouldn't it delete itself on there? I mean, you'd think so. Yeah. And if it, if it can it delete can and self-replicate, and if it can hide, if it can mask, if it can move its own source code around, then the whole mechanic with the keys and trying to wow. find the source code doesn't work. 
So the problem is already it's like hmm, this sounds like Ultron. Uh, how is it? Even we haven't even gone to Ultron because <laughs> <laughs> what I I'm very confused when they say they like it doesn't even make sense that having the source code would allow you to destroy the entity. That doesn't make sense anyway. But how are you getting the source code from the the submarine? How? What? What do you mean? Why? And yeah. how did it get from the submarine to the world? Did it transmit itself? And in which case, what is what is on the submarine anymore that matters? But if it uh, is, the source code is still on the submarine and it really wants to preserve and protect itself and ensure that no one can possibly access its source code, then why does it destroy the submarine in shallow waters and in a way that doesn't actually destroy the submarine? Because it well, just, if... it's mostly intact, but it sinks, meaning that the keys can escape and people can theoretically go down to it in part two, as opposed to sinking itself deeper, maybe. Or like all of these various clever things that an incredibly intelligent AI might be able to conceive of. Aiming that torpedo better. Just, aiming just... it better. Wipe itself, rewrite it, blah blah blah. It's just uh, this. So this is really awful for a plot foundation because this is not this is not one and done. People have uh, posted on the subreddit sometimes like, what 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 issues do they have with Age of Ultron? And that's why this will be noted as the Ultron problem. Um, there's probably movies that pre uh, have done it before this, but Ultron feels like the popularization of it. It's that you've created an enemy that just can't fucking lose, and then you tell yeah. us that it can lose. Yeah, you you're you're kind of caught in a way, but it's a trap of your own making. You need to make an enemy of this kind that is deadly and dangerous enough to give me a sense of tension, to be a worthy adversary for our heroes to fight. Um, but you fool, you've made it so strong and so crazy by its you know n the nature of your choosing that it's like unstoppable. Um, it's it's like a virus with no you know antidote, so to speak. It's uh. You, you need to you need to find a way to limit it or you need to find a way to build some rules into how it operates not just oh it's out there and it can do all these things but then tell me that the, there's a magic source code yeah, the doubly annoying thing as well is it's so it's volitional at this point because we haven't really seen what it's capable of we we are explicitly told everything that it's capable of in dialogue exposition yes. and all you needed to do is just not say all of that stuff and lo and behold, a lot of these problems go away because then we have more time to figure out its potentials and we're not overtly told that it's already infiltrated every single government worldwide system, financial system, defense system, everything. We're oh. not told that it's basically God. And so it doesn't need to be basically God. You can limit it after the fact. But if you're going to tell people that and top load the information straight away, this is what it is. This is everything it's capable of. And by the way, you're never going to see it do any of these things. That's just pointless. For the sake of um, context for the people, I'll, I'll jump slightly ahead for that quote so that they know this is explicitly from the movie, okay? This isn't anything we were able to infer. Uh, a, a set of different characters altogether say, The entity has breached Saudi Arabia's General Intelligence Directorate, assimilated their top-secret active learning AI before vanishing into the cloud. The attacks have increased 10,000-fold overnight, spreading exponentially, indicating it is sentient. It has accessed our satellite telecommunications, the Federal Reserve, the stock market, and the national power grid, the FAA, NASA, and the combined branches of all of our military. It has penetrated the world and European central banks, gained entry to the major defense, finance, and infrastructure systems of Russia, India, Israel, Australasia, all of Europe. It did nothing to any of the systems. It simply came and went and left fingerprints, sending a very clear message, I shall return. <laughs> Which isn't oh, a clear God. message. No. <laughs> um, but also just, when I heard all of that, I was like, you've lost. He's already <laughs> won. Over. It can do whatever it wants to do. It's done. We're off to the Stone Age, gentlemen. <laughs> you've lost. The nukes are already in the air, you fucked. Um, yeah, we'll get more to that scene in a minute, but that's to give everyone an idea of the power this thing has, and it, it, it only serves itself uh, Maybe now. it's worth saying now, the entity's like, pretty bad name for us. Uh, for uh, the AI. Uh, yes. Yes, the entity I don't is like what it. someone calls it. Like, what is this entity? And then someone says, oh, this is what its name is because it, the United States government created it. So it has a name and it's probably M1. But you can give it a, you can give it an interesting kind of name. So mythology is full of things oh, that yeah. could be interesting or Remember fucking Chimera? call it Eli. I don't give a shit. Yeah, it? Chimera, call it the something call it steve call it something you know and call yeah, it anything. Actually, just call it the, steve entity. Over the entity yeah call entity it he sucks <laughs> mm -hmm. uh we'd obviously go for acronyms before that as well uh we got some favorites yeah, in, in sci-fi yeah. uh the entity is lame Why it is lame it, 
It's like calling the the baddies, and you're it's like, oh, the darkness or the enemy, and like, oh, we could do better, can't we? Um, so one of the once you find all that out, why did it announce itself? What was the point? Uh, I think that the only thing that you're meant to conclude from any things like that is that the entity has some sort of like ego. Ugh, really? Because obviously, which would be interesting in a different movie. Well, the problem is that uh, we another thing we're told. I would have the quote, but it's going to be a bit later and it's hard to find. But uh, its its representative, so to speak, uh, basically says it knows all of everything from everywhere, all time, blah blah blah, and it it just knows what everyone's going to do. And it does prove that in some regards. It also completely unproves it in others. But uh, we're supposed to believe, according to the film, that this thing basically knows the future because it knows what everyone is going to do and when they're going to do it based on like profiles and stuff. Meaning, it must have known that announcing itself is actually not good for its survival. Because those Unless keys... Unless it predicted that... So, well, yeah, I, um, so this is the one cope that you'd be able to get, and the, the, the until part two is out, people will be able to use this. It'll make sense uh, in part two. All of it. All of this is, is we're kind of in an Infinity War situation with Doctor Strange saying it was one chance in 40 million. It was dependent on what they tell us in Endgame. Endgame did not give us a good answer, and so he's kind of now an idiot. Answer. But he was yeah. always going to be an idiot because no matter what your solution was, no way there was only one version of it. Out of 14 million, yeah. Doesn't one. really make sense. No, no, just no. Nope. Um, so, yeah, this is not fantastic as a, the, the beginning, because it already feels like you're on the back foot of trying to justify everything now. But they want to have their movie where the bad guy is technology. like, And that's, that's really interesting to have in the seventh movie in Mission Impossible, considering what they use every time to win is technology. So it's like, how about that turns on them? And they do try a little bit of that in this film, yeah. yeah, we'll get to them yeah. examples. Uh, so yeah, um, next scene, this is the solid scene. It's the intro to his mission, Mister Mister Ethan, and he's been delivered by uh, some guy who's I think this is like his intro to the IMF, which felt deliberate, right? Like in this two-parter finale, you have uh, been welcoming someone into the IMF while he's likely going to be his last story with the IMF, right? He could yep. die in the next one. Who knows? Um, so, yeah, uh, he, the message he gets is from Keytridge, which is interesting, as I said, he hasn't been in the movie since the first one, and it's kind of confusing, because it makes you wonder what's been going on, and what the nature of the hierarchy is. I'm gonna mm -hmm. put a pause on that conversation until we get to the room, but he says, Our lives are the sum of our choices, we can't escape the past. Thirty years ago, you were offered the choice, join the IMF or go to prison. We will never forget, nor will you, the death that brought you here all those years ago. So for anybody who's paying attention to a lot of Mission Impossible, you'll be like, what the fuck is he talking about? And it's because uh -huh. we've got some new history we're injecting, we've got some DLC for Mission Impossible that is... Nice. Uh, See, when I'm I first not... watched it, because they, they stage it in the form of flashbacks, and so when I was first watching it, I just assumed that this was part of a film that I hadn't seen, but nope. apparently not. I'm going to be honest with you, dude, I'm, I believe, I would put money on this, I believe 80 plus percent of the audience believed that too. <laughs> I think they would all be like, oh, that's probably Mission Impossible 1. That's pretty neat that they're flashing back to that, and it's like, no, all of that was made up. Uh, <laughs> Which I'm Brand not a huge new. fan of, like I said, but it is, I'm not going to rule it out. Like, there's ways you can use that well, and we'll have to see how they go. But it feels weak that for the final movie, first part, we're going to be building a lot of drama from something that we've never even seen before. Is that the Mandela effect, and they're actually using it as a plot device? <laughs> the director in an interview is like, uh, what, what movie is that from? And he's like, oh, you know. One of the Mission, Impossible, <laughs> um, Mission Impossible... Mission um... Impossible... Uh, and he just tries to think of a, a, a name from Mission Impossible and he just comes movie. up with an and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like that one. Oh, yeah, Alpha <laughs> Protocol. <laughs> he says Mission Impossible <laughs> Age of Ultron. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so apparently, yes, um, Ethan did something 30 years ago that got him in such a bad position that he had no choice but to either go to prison or join the IMF, which really recontextualizes a lot and we don't get any more on that until probably part two of the films like we're not i imagine we'll see that flashback in full yeah, in part two definitely definitely um so yeah and 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 uh 
Going on from that, Keatridge says, This is to remind you of your oath and your allegiance. The stakes are higher than ever. Your roguish behavior will not be tolerated. Which is hilarious. Because he goes oh, rogue uh, immediately, as was mentioned. And not only does he do... Yeah, it's like, why the fuck are you even hiring him? If you do, like, What's the point? He's, he's li Let's be... Like, the 16th time he saves the world, at what point are you like, you know, go rogue, whatever. Maybe you should go rogue, yeah. You know, you saved the world so many times that just go, just do your thing, man. Um, but this, I, this might be a bit of it I missed as well, but having said your habitual rogue behavior will not be tolerated, you'd think, well, okay, that's a high-risk thing. You're, you're placing your trust in a guy that you know is basically going to go rogue. So clearly you have no other choice. I'm not sure that he did have no other choice because the mission he's giving him is to go and find... Um, what's her name, Rebecca Ferguson's character. Mm -hmm. But he knows how to do that. He knows who to follow. He knows roughly where she'll be. So why would you put your trust in uh, Tom Cruise to do that rather than using somebody who is much more trustworthy without the habitual rogue behavior? You're absolutely right as well because he's supposed to retrieve a key and uh, Keytridge would know at this point that Rebecca Ferguson is not going to give that key up without at least telling Tom Cruise what it leads to. And as soon as Tom Cruise finds out, there's no reason to think that he would give that key back to IMF. So it feels like Kittredge should know that. And so yes, he should hire anyone else. He shouldn't hire Tom Cruise for this one. Um, it's also weird that he says, this is to remind you of your oath and your allegiance, but then he also says your mission should you choose to accept it. I find that... Uh, I, find, I, I think it's fun, the idea that you have a lot of these agents around and they're all given missions that they can choose to ignore depending on if they think that they're ready for the job or capable, or that how, you know, it could depend on their investment in the details. Um, but this one is just like, are you just saying that for the meme? Because you just said that he's like, he has to do this, basically. Oh, and well, uh, is, this, is this an interesting little development that should you choose to accept it as kind of bullshit? It, it was always like something that, so it's like, you, you don't can't really pull have that card. Fallout already pulled the card, and it was a way better card. It was uh, uh, Solomon Lane saying, your mission... Should you choose to accept it? Tell me, Ethan. Did you ever choose not to? Just like, mm. ooh. Like, the point obviously being that you kind of live for this. You know, and, and how, what does that say about you? But now you've switched it to, well, he always had to. Because he, he had that background that apparently they hold over him, but they've never mentioned ever in all of the other movies. It's like, hmm. Don't, don't you think that's a yep. bit of conflict? I don't know. Oh, sure. Hmm. I'm, just, I'm just floating it. <laughs> no, no, it's good that you float. I just mean, like, what do you think? Because uh, I uh, quite love that little bit in Fallout, but now, I don't know. <laughs> I did too. I really liked it too, and I agree. I also I also really like the implication that it was always, like, that you will do it if you if you are willing to do it. You're not being made to do it. Anytime you take it on, it's like, yeah, this is your call. Do you want to participate? Do you want to do this thing? Or do you want to walk away? Like, that it's being presented as a choice, it's, it's interesting. And I mean, it says a lot, right? If, if everybody gets a free choice to do it, and so often we see them, you know, choose to do it, right? And like, there's, there's a lot to make of that in terms of character. Yeah. For, for what is just basically like this one little line. Um, so yes, the, the mission is, uh, Ilsa Faust is currently getting hunted down by bounty hunters because she has stolen a key and uh, from someone in some other mission. And uh, Ethan's mission is to get the key back to IMF, and it is up to him what he does with Ilsa. That's it. Pretty straightforward. It's like, all right. And that mission is completed in the next scene. It's very quick. Uh, yeah. Our opening action scene, so to speak. I um, wasn't a huge fan of uh, Ethan's trying to keep yeah. an eye on the bounty hunters, and he gets spotted. Just like, he oh. does. Because of the, uh, the little the, the reflection of his scope. Yeah, which just doesn't feel very Ethan Hunt to me. Uh, yeah, because they have things you can put on scopes that mitigate that. Well, and you also just, so, he's yeah. so experienced, you know? Well, yeah, it's like, you know, like when you play Call of Duty and you see like the sniper glint, right? So he hasn't played enough Call of Duty. He hasn't played enough Call of Duty, it's true. He would have known. Benji has. He would have known. Uh, wow, no, he's played a lot of Halo 5 Guardians on PC. <laughs> Do we, yeah, should we mention that? I feel like we should. Yeah, that product place, there was a product placement in Rogue Nation where Benji's playing Halo 5 on PC. <laughs> uh, and then he's like at work and he's playing on his PC. And then when his like supervisor comes, he like throws the controller in and it has this really awkward shot of the box art of Halo 5. Yeah. It's like some really, really bad overt product placement for a game um... that was not even on PC. <laughs> 
<laughs> Unless he has an Xbox in his work, like, in his workstation. And he has it on three monitors. He's got the full three monitor all, load. Yeah, he has, like, ultra, super duper widescreen support for it. <laughs> He's a full on just... gamer. <laughs> yep. Gamer. Uh, um, unfortunately, suddenly there's a sandstorm as well, which yep. uh, I thought was just lame like because. Just like in Ghost Protocol. Just like in Ghost Protocol. But uh, Ilsa could easily have wiped them all, um, all out. They're, like, ages away. She has a sniper, uh, but the stand mm -hmm. sandstorm covers them up, and then. Like she's... Well, maybe they were waiting for the sandstorm mall. You ever thought of that? Um, how does that help them, though? I don't know. Gives them cover. But then they can't see shit. That's why they all die. Ethan kills them yeah, all well, in the sandstorm. Maybe they, maybe they were waiting for it and it was a bad bad call. Not I'm sure makes... there was loads of really great reasons. And the, you know what? It's a great scene of him going pew pew. Pew pew. Well, there's quite a bit of plot armor involved when he's on that horse because he is yes, being chased is. down by yeah, about yeah, 12 people is. firing yeah. machine guns at yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. Despite how difficult it would be to shoot, there are a lot of people oh, shooting a lot of bullets. People. It's just a numbers game, it really. Is, uh, um, yeah. I don't know about well, this one. A little bit disappointing. We find out that Ilsa has gone there specifically to hide and hunker down, and all she's got is the sniper. And once that's gone, she's basically like. You know, close to death yeah, several like, times. Give me also a bit more credit. Yeah, I feel like she should have not only traps, like but trips, better yeah, defenses. Yeah. Like she should yeah, have like absolutely. a hidey hole or somewhere to hide. Yeah. She, she probably would have uh, lost. Yeah, if Ethan uh, Ethan saves her. Um, and it's like, give her a little bit of credit. Like, Ilsa is very competent. She's highly she's competent. lethal as fuck, too. With a. Yeah. Every time you see her in a fight, she's uh, she struggles with like, you know, big, burly assassin men and stuff, but she'll often outplay them. By doing a little grappling shit, or being mm -hmm. sneaky, but uh, yeah, she's you know that's kind of what you get there. And um, I did have one further question about this as well, which is that obviously the bounty hunters are after her. The bounty hunters have received a bounty, so that's communication. The bounty hunters don't know that the thing they're after is a key, which has something to do with an AI that basically owns the internet, and so is presumably monitoring all communications. How does the AI not already know where she is? Because of their own communications. So we're going to have a lot of talks like this throughout. I think this would be my best guess. I think the entity sent them. No, because I thought it's explained that, um, what's his name? CIA guy, Kit, Kitch. He put a bounty Kitch, on Kitch, her. Kitch. He didn't send the bounty hunters, right? Or did he? Did he say that? If he put oh, it, well, he does say, because when that meeting in the office we're going to come to, and he says, yeah, I put the bounty on her, and she's being chased by bounty hunters, so I would have thought the reasonable inference would be that he, like, he's the reason they are there. Well, but if that's true, then why, why send the bounty hunters at all? Why not just send Tom Cruise in to get the key and just explain to him the key is blah, 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 blah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, bounty hunters just, that's like sending two groups in to get the same thing, and then they kill each other. Yes. Um... <laughs> Uh, the, the thing about yeah. it, me assuming it was the entity, by the way, it doesn't make sense as well. Like, there's a lot of this, there's so much to pass through, it gets really complicated, but... Uh, yes, you're right, like, uh, Keytridge does admit that he's the one that put the bounty on her. Um, I can't remember if he s explicitly says that he's the one that sent the bounty hunters. But even if so, it's all very odd. Um, and the other question is, like, how does he, how did he know where she was? But at one point later in the film, it's uh, explained that all of Ilsa's communications with people who she was uh, sent to get the key by were electronic, therefore the entity knew about him. And so I was like, oh, so the entity knew where she was in the desert, and that's how it sent those people? And that those people were going to collect the bounty, slash get the key, question mark? I don't really... I think it would have just shot a missile from somewhere at her. We don't want to destroy the key. No, I guess you do want to destroy the key if you're the entity, right? I suppose so. Don't you? Yeah, the entity. Wait, no, it doesn't. Does no, the entity wants the key. Well, that's another thing that we can talk about at some point. What? Well, you know, what? it's fine. We'll 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 just keep on moving because <laughs> right, again. Sorry, so, so I actually kind of want to clarify. I thought that the goal of the entity was to get the key so that it could get the thing that's on the Sevastopol. The thing on the Sevastopol is, as far as we know from this movie, the capability to destroy or control the entity. I thought that there was a big ominous shot of, like, something in a storage, like, f container thing, isn't there? I thought that was, like, the big thing that they're after, like, some big super weapon. Didn't I just answer that question? I thought you, you said it was the to control the source code, right? So that is what that is on the Sevastopol. No, no, no. I thought that, because there's, like, the there's that big terminal on the Sevastopol, but then there was that big, like, uh, container thing. Is that meant to be, like, the source code? 
So what the Russians, Russians believe is that there's the state-of-the-art sonar system, but what we know is that the entity has infected it, and that's the one that got right, uploaded right, from okay, the Americans, okay. <laughs> which is the source code that they need to either destroy or control the entity. Hence why every government in the world wants this, which is why I was thinking, shouldn't the entity maybe want to destroy the keys? Because then nobody can get to it. Okay, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah, I got it. We'll, um, we'll talk more about it as we go as well. So, uh, then we get, and this, by the way, seems to be of the people who like this film. This is one of the bigger complaints um, that I've seen. Uh, I don't know how you guys are going to feel about it, but uh, Ilsa has a fake-out death here. Um, mm. I don't really care <laughs> myself. Uh, I got bigger issues with this film, but what, what do you guys think? I don't mind, I guess. Um, what, like, what, what exactly is the complaint? That it's that it's they're... like it's annoying to be like Ilsa died in this mission. There's like no, she's fine. Like, I, I guess it's for, for any reason, like any fake out death can be annoying. Like we were annoyed by the fake out deaths in Guardians Three, right? Um, yeah, but I feel like those are different. Um, I can't. The ones in I, I, a lot of the the issues that we had with the Guardians Three stuff was like the bizarre tone and um, like I, I think they they tried to commit more to it. This was. I don't know. I feel like this one didn't quite commit to the fake out in I mean, a way. Um, just... A partial de defense could be that you know he's selling that story to everyone that she did die, and then we find out that you know she's. But I mean, I'm not. I'm not unsympathetic to it. I just. Um, I don't know. I just don't think it's anywhere near as bad as. <laughs> There's a certain issue that happens in this that's similar to that, but uh, it goes a little bit further. You could say. Hmm. Um, she was obviously faking. Well, so for me, when I was watching, I think this is why it didn't bother me at all, was I was like, no way Ilsa fucking Faust dies in the opening prologue. That's not gonna happen. But, like, she's obviously getting back up, or it's a fake, or whatever. It's fine. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge, like, I've seen people complaining about it. The other complaint that I've seen from many people who very much think this film is great is that it's, uh, badly paced. What do you guys think about that? The scene or the film I... as a whole? The film as a whole. We're about oh. to get to the scene that I think is probably the worst paced one. Um, yeah, I, I'd say yes insofar as it, it, it has to rely far too heavily on these long expo dumps, which is usually a sign of a badly paced film. If it, if it can't properly place its own information, and so it has to give us like the preamble to this scene when you have all of the generic government people speaking like South Park villains uh, about <laughs> what the AI is, um, yes. And then it, it's just, it, and they all sound like they're the same character and that they're all reading yes. the same dialogue script and tree. Um, and that's just to try and fast forward you to the point where you have all the information you need to understand what the rest of the plot is. I think that's a pacing issue as well as, a, as an information. I was about to say, issue. what a hell of a yeah. fast How forward. It takes fucking ages. Yeah. All, the way that we receive the information could have been so. It, it goes, what do I say? What I was saying about like missed opportunities. The way that you tell this story. Um, could have been full of really cool reveals. Um, it was the entity all along, and you, we'll get to that stuff later. But the, can you hear that in the background? Someone is outside doing. So, it's fine, whatever. Um, there is a. But yeah, the, this the, it's, we just get dumps. That's just kind of like, okay, you're caught up. Let's go. Instead of you know, like the the government may be only telling Ethan certain things about the entity and not everything. Like also, they don't they they don't want to. There's a lot of scenes that I think take way too long, and there's a, a decent chunk of information that is uh, given to us twice. Sometimes it'll be shown and then explained, and it's like, oh, why'd you do that? Um, but the you know the film is what two hours forty is it? Two hours fifty? Something? It's uh, stronger. It is a big film, and um, some of it is something that we talked about on Open Bar. It's just like uh, so much shaving that could be done. Especially there's there's a particular thread that just shouldn't be in this at all. Let's get to it. So. It opens with saying, the entity can be a computer virus, it could be a botnet, it could be a tapeworm. Once it's infected the thing, any information on any source that's recorded, stored, or transmitted digitally, that's in relation to it, cannot be trusted as fact. It was primarily focused on social media, which was of a lot of use to us, but now it's gone much further. Uh, well, the th that was a... Oh, just on that, that line. line. So, <laughs> they said... 
so it, it wasn't that it they found it useful is that they didn't mind it spreading because yes. it often served their purposes which implies it was completely incidental they saw it happen and they said you know what we kind of like it so we're not going to be worried about yeah, like, this what? yet i don't understand that no it, i think that's a cringe meta line about how social media is mining information off us as people and they wanted to throw that in there and be like see look at those evil intelligence agencies being like at first it was just abusing social media which you know, we could make some use of that, actually, ourselves. But then it started going after our stuff, and it's like, that's so stupid. That's like <laughs> mustache twirly levels. Uh, yeah, and so they say all this shit about everything that it's taken control of, which, by the way, all of this is being delivered to the director of, I think, like, all American intelligence agents, the dire director of national intelligence. For some reason, this is the first he's hearing of all of I, this. Yeah, like this is the first time that he's hearing about it when apparently there's a significant amount of stuff that's already occurred. Yeah, they like, say three weeks ago happened. it uh, did the Saudi Arabia thing, I think, is what they say. It's like, how the fuck has it been three weeks and you haven't told him anything about this? You lost control right. of your entire national defense systems and your national intelligence director knows nothing about it until you tell him three yeah, weeks he, after the fact. He is utterly clueless. He doesn't know anything. This is the first time he's hearing about any of this seemingly. Um, and what's even more hilarious is all of them in the room know about it, and all of them in the room know what the IMF is, but he doesn't. He doesn't know, no. How does he, he not know. know about the IMF when the IMF was dissolved in the fifth movie? Like, it, it was defunct, it was, it was put through, like, an in-house court, and several agents from the CIA were made aware of it, and were talking, like, talking about whether or not it was, uh, viable as a service. And then it got reinstated. The director of intelligence doesn't know about it, but all these fucking cronies do. Why? It's such a weird choice to have the exposition delivered to somebody for the sake of the audience when that somebody is the one that should know all of it. It's the opposite. Yeah, it shouldn't work that way. Don't understand. Now, um... It's a weird decision as well because, they, as, as we'll shortly come on to, so this, this meeting gets infiltrated by... Tom Cruise, and so this this is nominally where he's also learning about all of this. Yeah, but why would you not have rearranged it so he's learning about it as the audience's receptor? Yeah, you have him do not the have... same thing he does, but then Kittredge explains it all to him in that scene. Why are they explaining it all to the fucking director? That doesn't make any sense. It would actually, by the way, justify because there's other problems with this scene as a result of that. If they, if it was that Cruise had to reach Kittredge, and this was the only way. That would be something, but um, there's some more questions. But before we get there, um, and among the, their explanation, right, they've said that it can get in and out without leaving a trace. It can even, like, self-detonate so that there's just no way to know it was ever there or something. Um, and that anything it touches in any way digitally cannot be trusted as fact. So that's a pretty interesting set of statements, right? Like, as soon as it's I, I involved... ready to commit to that. Yeah, as soon as it's involved in touching anything in any way, it can no longer be trusted, and we don't even know so what it can touch. Know. So it's over. It's, it's over. over. Yeah, everything is compromised. Now, exactly. of the things they listed, they say it came and went and left fingerprints letting us know, and then the guy says, I shall return, which I... Weird line, which, but fine. Yeah, and that's a huge leap, but, like, also, it could have also gone to places and not shown you. Yeah, they say... Yeah, if it has the ability to leave fingerprints deliberately, then it probably knows how to not leave fingerprints well, deliberately. It's, it's not that it probably doesn't know. They explicitly stated it well, can I was do being it. A and, bit, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's they, also on balance of probabilities. It's infiltrated every single system except for national intelligence. Well, well yeah, if I can, really, point like, to, before you go on, I'll just give you the context of the quotes, right? So they go on to say, the full force of the entity's energy is now focused on the world's intelligence networks, the very truth as we know it. The entire intelligence community is racing to archive hard copies of our fact-positive knowledge bases before our most secure data centers are breached and corrupted. It will know how to undermine our every strength, it'll know how to exploit our every weakness, it'll turn allies into enemies and enemies into aggressors. So... Go ahead. <laughs> that, that's just context for quotes, that's all. Fact, positive knowledge centers. Oof. Um, yeah. But no, balance of probabilities, it's infiltrated everything else except you and its left fingerprints. I would have assumed that it's too late to be backing up. It's, it's already got you and mm -hmm. you just don't know it yet. That's balance of probabilities. You would so. have to, you'd have to explain some reason why certain systems aren't affected yet. They use a special algorithm. They use a da da da. They use a backup da da da. They're not connected. You, you have to give me, yeah. You have to give me some reason why 
certain things can be trusted, but the rest of it can't be. Or else, That's I just think that you've that got a problem. You can't, you can't know when it's done it. If you can't know, you don't know. Yeah, yes. to try and simplify, it's just the best lock picker on Earth has to break open ten, and he put his little calling card next to five of them. We don't know how many he's unlocked. <laughs> It's yeah, like, it's already, yeah it's you have to say the only one he like like if we're gonna use like the lock picker example there who's really really good at using lock picks is like well the only ones he couldn't get into are the digital locks where lock picks don't do anything for that right but everything that was in a, a manual lock he got into so that's how we know some things are safe or we have justified reason yes you're to right if that, they'd said you know, those things are our new. most secure data is on analog systems it couldn't possibly have breached those it's like okay that's something but no they simply yeah. say I don't think it's it hasn't gotten in there yet, but everything else has a, 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 a you know a fingerprint. This stuff doesn't. Yeah, like they're in the um, process of making the analog backup, but they haven't made correct. it yet. So it's probably I'd say probably too late. It's also a big fat non sequitur. We're, it's going through like global intelligence systems, the very truth itself. So like, I don't know what version of history these people have read, but I don't usually conflate the CIA with truth telling or being in possession of <laughs> like it's... objective truth. Surely it already has control. It, it has social media. It has media generally. It has control of the entire internet. It has all of the means of corrupting the truth as relevant um, as it needs. Surely. I don't really understand what the objective of hacking global intelligence systems is when it has everything else already. I find it confusing that, like, what is the end point goal of doing this? Of getting everything from your digital stores of all intelligence networks into paper form? Like what 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 now what what happens going forward like surely you have to uproot and change every single system forever and are you planning on operating the cia like analog forever or is it only until you kill the entity which shouldn't even be possible and how do you know you've done it and how do you know it hasn't created other ones and like what exactly and even then are you not just concerned it's going to happen again if it's happened once why wouldn't it happen again and like just for instance you know they have some problem they need to solve and they need their info it's like what do they do now it's like they have to go to the enormous warehouse filled with trillions of papers the and, and try and narrow it down like in the form of an alphabetizing it i guess it just seems like it would be really impossible to do any wide-scale mass like logistical operations just think <laughs> of the amount of data that's all it's just <laughs> gonna be intense yeah. um you would so... think that this is the thing that you're trying to prevent with the movie not where you start out well, with in the movie what's wild too is the the they're explaining all of this even the concept of you know, creating analog copies of everything while it's happening below the director of national intelligence. It's like, so you guys have been well into it and he didn't even know what was happening? He was waiting for you guys to come and brief him, I guess? How weird does this sound? It's like, yeah, it's all in favor of just getting it explained to the audience. Because he then says, why not air gap the intelligence services? Just cut them off from the outside world. And it, it, it kind of annoys me how simple that suggestion is. It's like, basically turn off your router, right? Like, why not? They're, they're, they're like, yeah, we have. I'm just like, he's the fucking... Like, why haven't you talked to him before now? It's so weird. And uh, they then say, servers require humans, and humans are the weakest link in any security chain, especially when not dealing... Not today, they're not! <laughs> especially when dealing with a godless, stateless, amoral enemy. That one was... That one felt a bit out of play. That, that felt like a line that should have been... That was... That's from the 70s, you know? Yeah, it felt weird. Yeah, it's that felt a little yeah, it's bit It's entirely weird. out of place. It, having <laughs> just spent all of its time digging up the threat of this all-knowing, all-seeing AI controlling the internet, and then the hard pivot to the greatest threat is the individual man, without really connecting those two things at all, um, is uh, that's just such a weird leap. I don't yeah, know what they were thinking of. Don't explain how dangerous this AI is and say that, well, the real or the real weak link is humans. And I, no, not, not today. But also, no. that, that completely <laughs> yeah. undermines the whole plan they were talking about earlier. We've got people currently making hard copies of all of our fact-positive knowledge centers. Um, but if the real threat is individuals, then how can you trust those people? Because That's the crazy thing, man. could be stealing it. The implication, and we see this in the rest of the film, is that... You're the entity, right? So you've got control of everything digital. You just go to some mercenary's computer and say, like, I'm going to wire this much money f to you if you do this job for me. And he's like, what job? And it's like, well, pop a USB into computer. I'm going to load up something on it. And then I need you to get this USB to whatever server, blah, blah, blah. And then I can upload myself to, you know, blah, blah. Like, that, that's what they're talking about. Jobs being conducted in that way. Humans being manipulated or, you know, done for money. I mean, it might have... <laughs> The entity might have like devout followers that want to do its bidding, you know, but for some like existential reasons, I don't know. But 
Uh, that's what I oh, think they're referring cult. to. Techno cult. Do yeah. it. Do it. Do it. Within like no three weeks, it spawned an entire religion. It's, it's, like, it's just cult. started. Like I don't know if people are going to be worshiping it just yet. It's like no, they're, they're sure they're all. We can't be too careful. Like, oh, okay. Cyber well, Satan. Cyber Satan already has there. his messiah. He's already there. Just yeah. Just have it to be where yeah. This is years in the making. The AI in its current inception is the result of the techno cult. So, um, yeah, and then they finish out with saying, This enemy has been patiently listening, reading, watching, harvesting our deepest secrets for years, able to beguile, blackmail, bribe just about anyone at once, and to manipulate us all at will through our total dependence on a carefully constructed digital reality. Well, that was pretty I wonder cringe. how many times he rehearsed, he rehearsed that line. Yeah, it feels like something that got redrafted several times. They were like, This is going to hit so hard. <laughs> it's like, Oh my god, man. And then someone says, uh, an enemy that is everywhere and nowhere and has no center. But I thought you just established it does have a center and that's what you need to get to. Sevastopol. Source code. Uh. Okay. Wait, uh, dude, I'm getting confused. Oh. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just getting confused. Because remember how, like, there's the scene. Wow, well, that's, we're jumping way ahead. <laughs> So all of the people in this room understand that the source code is on the 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 submarine, right? Uh, Etridge does, thought... and the director of national intelligence director, does. Yeah, but apparently, does. the people in the room don't, because they all have to have the keys explained to them. Yeah. I don't okay. know. Uh, it's really <laughs> weird. Like I said, I, I don't know how much is kept. Because remember, when we find out the director of national intelligence is making a deal with the entity, it's treated as a huge reveal. And I was just sitting there like, oh. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do with that information. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes. Uh, they, they conclude they don't want to destroy the entity. They want to control it. And then someone says, how do we control it? And he's like, the whole world is focusing on acquiring a key that can allow the user control of the entity. It gives you global dominance. Now, um, for those who are paying attention, uh, I guess, <laughs> Springy, Rags, Platoon, if any Hello. three of you can answer this question, how do we know the key will give you access and control to the entity? This is why I'm getting lost. I, how, could, how would they know that? Well, they give a reason in this scene, but do you remember what it is? I no, I don't. I, is it that everyone already says like the British and the Indians and the Japanese all think that that's what it is, so it must be it? So that is true. That's almost there. There's one piece of information that then leads to that, and that's good enough for them. The implication I'm trying to go for is who knew it first. I do not recall. Um, it's the Russians. He literally just says the Russians believe this key does that, and now everyone does. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. That okay. is uh, oh. terrible. <laughs> like, the entire Russian plot line, all of the governments high. scrambling to get these two halves of a key is based on the fact that Russia said that it'll give you access to the entity. That's the only thing they know. But if the Russians Would the still... argument be that it has to be based on the notion that because it was their submarine, they understand that the source code is locked in the uh, in that have... submarine? But they surely they don't know what it was. Is uh, it's so confusing. This is the most untangled, uh, tangled up film I've ever had to untangle. Like, you have the submarine sinks, right? The submarine sinks. The keys are on the bodies of the sailors. The sailors make no transmission to the Russians to explain what's gone on. They don't understand what's gone on. They speak vaguely of a ghost in the machine. The keys make it to the surface somehow, going through the ice sheets. They're picked up by someone, presumably not the Russians, because it ends up in the hands of bounty hunters and the like. So the mm -hmm. Russians have never had access to the keys. And the submarine is still at the bottom of the ocean, presumably left untouched, because that's where we're vaguely aiming for in part two. So I don't know how the Russians could know that at all. Well, so that's, that's, the, that's the great question you end up asking yourself is, wait, how does anyone know what happened on the Sevastopol? How could anybody truly know? Yeah. Um, I guess the AI mm. must have told them. <laughs> like, why but else? Why would, do, why would, but why would the AI do that? Yeah, I, I don't know. One single vulnerability is on there, and it knows it. And so, hmm. obviously, the Russians would not know, but yet the Russians know they need to get those keys in order to get access to the entity. 
Because they must know that it's locked its source code on the Sevastopol. Why would they think that? But why would they think that, especially when, based on the information that is presently available, it shouldn't even be on there. It should be gone. It should be, it should have deleted itself or something. And then, of course, just the further down the line, why the fuck would any government think that that's valuable as, like, information? Oh, they're after these keys and they, they, they're pretty sure... And why do you even know that? Why do the Russians, why would they have told anybody what those keys are worth and why they want them? So I don't know if this would fix it, but I have a sneaky feeling it would. So the Ameri the keys go into the sonar thing. That's what activates the super secret sonar. The Americans know that that's where they put their AI. Yes. So if anything, the Russians should want the keys because they want their valuable piece of equipment, but they don't know it has anything to do with some world shattering AI. Whereas the Americans could maybe piece together that knowledge by saying, well, they want the key to the sonar thing. We put the AI in the sonar thing. So the key that the Russians want for the sonar thing will also get us to the AI. But um, that's not what the film it, says. That's yeah, just... I think Keatridge says that they believe it'll help them control the entity. Yeah, so they already know what that is. Yeah, that doesn't work. Which in and of itself, do they even... I mean, why would they even think that's possible anymore? I... <sighs> This is what I mean. It's, it's, this is, this is a tough it's one. It's like, oh, you got the source code. So now this thing that humanity's never dealt with before in terms of like a new form of consciousness, if you get that source code, then you're good. <laughs> like, as if, like, I, I don't understand why that, why that would be an assumption that they would make. I guess you got nothing else that you can do, that you can try, but like, yeah. If the, the, anything, this is almost making me think that this kind of enemy would, instead of what the film tells me, is happening there would be an unprecedented level of global cooperation never before seen to stop this existential threat to yeah it's the, well, end, it's the actual the apocalypse answer. like it'll humans are done but, if you're not careful uh, remember though that because the film tries to set up the point that essentially the country that gets control of the entity like wins that's it yeah for them. They i fucking hate that they I, win soon yeah. i don't like this idea we talked a bit about it on you know, Metals Forge yesterday, but this I because they sort of talk about it later. But this idea of oh yeah, like every country's out for themselves now, and it's a scramble to get this. And the country that gets it is gonna be like dominate all the other countries because you know all countries hate each other now. You know, there's no allies, there's no like defensive packs, there's no just like cultural connections between nations. Everyone's out for themselves now. Fuck alliances that are decades and generations long and deeply entrenched in our society. What if the Americans get it, they'll betray the British. If the British get it, they'll betray Rags, the Germans. Even, of the German even worse than that, there's a quote where he says about his own agency that there's a lot of old think that needs to be wiped out. Like, the director of National Intelligence of America says he hopes to kill a lot of Americans with this. Like, what? Like, I don't, I just, I don't believe you. Like, that's no, madness. No, I don't believe it either. He's a villain man, but it's like, why? These are, like, like, stop. This is not, like, you, this is not the kind of story that I will believe you when you say it to me. Quit. Stop. Well, it's just nuts, too, because uh, what that actually looks like is that a country would just take leverage over the entire world by saying, like, I will shut all of you down into the Stone Age and have you destroy yourselves if you don't do everything I say. Which is possible, I guess, with control of the entity, but there's no reason to think it would give you control of the entity. Um, and what they have to go on is the Russians said so. Uh, that, that's, by the way, you, you, we, what we were talking about earlier would have partial justification for Americans believing the keys might lead to the control of the entity, but that's still all flimsy. What about every other government? What have they got to- we're told that all of them want the key, and they're all- Or is it, is it just meant to be that there's like an amount of overlap, spies and other agencies and such- And all the word is spread, but it's there totally anyway. reliable, trust me, bro. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Um, and it's- we're like 10 minutes into the film, if that. Mm -hmm. Very hard yeah, to the... swallow. Mm -hmm. uh, so another line Keatridge has is, The only way to authenticate any one half of the key is to have the other half. Uh, this prevents counterfeits. Uh, no, it wouldn't. It's <laughs> made to work with itself. There's so much that would breach this. First of all, you can just copy the, the keys in terms of like, you know, the main structure, the color, blah, 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 even the material. Um, and then you just have your own guy fix it so that they light up when you put them together. That's all. That's all everyone has. They don't have anything more than that. Uh, Luther mentions that the key, a key they find later doesn't match the material of the one they currently have. They don't know. 
that it's supposed to be X material necessarily. They just know that the one they have is supposed to be the right one. So if they pick up one that doesn't have that material, it must be a fake. The irony being, of course, they might have the fake. They don't yeah. know. Nobody ever knows. But they say this as if that will erase any possibility of being confused about fakes, even though there are fakes in this movie. Um, <laughs> there should be way more of them, though. But you could also, theoretically, copy the key. There's no reason why you couldn't do that. And I have the sneaking suspicion that if you can make a prop for a movie, you can probably make an actual one in universe. Yeah, the people at the height of their agencies probably have the ability to do that since they make fake faces. They could probably make a you fake key. Think. And didn't the maybe, Russians maybe build the key like in the Arnold. first place to put the key into their super secret sonar project? So surely they would know the specs of the key and be able to make That's another true, one. That's true, yeah. They should be able uh, to make another yeah, key. Yeah. Wow. Which kind of blows open oh, the whole yeah. movie again. Uh, There's going to be a course, few of those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I bet a lot of stuff like that will be like just like the duh of course moment will just hit you because so much is happening. You can only process so much at one time. Yeah, as you're watching it. We will highlight as we go where the use of counterfeits or copies would be useful. <laughs> Don't you worry there, listener. Um, so yes, one half is, uh, was with Ilsa, presumably now with Ethan Hunt. This is Kittredge again. And uh, so he has to explain what the IMF is to the director of intelligence, which again, I find really awkward. It's like, we know what it is. He should know what it is. What are we doing? Explaining, and they're like, it's a mission, possible mission force. It's, it's they do the missions that we can't. And it's just like, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Has the IMF always stood for that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was just making sure, because that, that was always what it was for. This know? was already in the fucking Ethan intro scene, by the way. I, I'm just trying to remember that he's like, oh, impossible mission force, huh? Doesn't he do that? Yeah, like, it's not the only movie that they laugh at the idea, uh, the name. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, they're like, who is this guy? And one of them goes, it's classified. And he says, I'm the director of intelligence. What the fuck did I not know? And I, and I was sitting there listening, literally just like, what, what, what are you suggesting? That he can't know when people below his rank know? Like, not even, non-IMF people know what the IMF is, but the Director of Intelligence isn't allowed to know. It's so fucking weird. It's an odd one. Like I said, I, I thought it would have been way more public knowledge after they got dissolved as well, especially within intelligence communities, but... Yeah, turns oh. out that, yeah, that would come out and be a thing. You'd think. You'd think. Um, and it's 30 years it's been going for. And all of its controversies? I just, I don't think I buy it, but... Whatever you say, movie. Uh, sure, then... Man. Ethan, who is posing as a random guard man, knocks everyone out in the room with a big green gas. And, uh, uh, and it's worth noting that this room is like with glass windows that are seemingly visible from the ground floor. Yeah. That has like hundreds of people in it and nobody notices. That's like the introduction to this room. Doesn't it like zoom in from the yeah, glass exactly. or something? Yes. Overlook so, the... the it's a huge green sees. cloud fills the whole room. <laughs> Yeah, and nobody. Oh, noticed. the director is awfully gassy today. Oof, glad <laughs> oh my god! Got him down here at the typewriter. Oh, oh, that it was a big, a big fart. Oh. A big old fart. Taco Tuesday, am I right? Um, yeah, nobody noticed. It's just like, wow! If somebody comes up, like, holy shit! Somebody's gonna notice. Uh, so the to summarize this interaction, he wants to talk to Keatridge personally, and he gets uh, him to admit. He says, "I put the bounty on her head, but I didn't ask Ilsa to steal the key. She did that on her own." Um, and then Ethan says, I'm going to find the completed key, and then I'm going to kill the entity. And, uh, Keatridge says, the next world war will be a ballistic war for the last of our dwindling energy, drinkable water, breathable air. The concept of right and wrong can be clearly defined for centuries to come with the entity. And then Ethan's like, do you hear yourself? He says, the days of fighting for the greater good are over. And then Ethan says, I'll fight for what I've always fought for. And then Keatridge says, this mission will cost you dearly. And I couldn't help but think, man, what happened to the dialogue? What a cartoon. What's what a, going like, on? Like, are you just, like, evil? Are you the entity? Are it's... you an android? <laughs> like, what's going on here? Why are you so, like, why are you a cartoon villain? But that's edgy some... one, too. That's all that's really achieved? That's, that's the information exchange? And so then I was wondering, why did Ethan do this? Yeah, of all the places to have a one-on-one -on -one chat, just wait till he goes home or gets in his car. But well, so... why would you break into the office which is supposed to be highly secure, even though it isn't, because they know about the face masks, they don't have any sign, like technology to spot wow. them or anything, because that's bollocks. But um, why would you go to all the trouble of getting in here, except for the fact that the audience needs to overhear the exposition that precedes it? 
So the thing that I find interesting is that he learns everything about the key and the entity from having sat in this room and listened to all of them talk. Okay, fair. I'm, I'm going to give it to the movie. That, that's a, something that he'd like to know that was clearly kept from him by Keytridge, and this is a pretty good way to find it out. So why not leave now? And then you'd be fine. Theoretically, he would be fine. The problem is that he's knocked out the guy he's pretending to be, and uh, someone phones and says, you know, oh. Mr. Keytridge, uh, this man was found in his home 10 minutes ago, drugged. He seems to have entered the facility 15 minutes ago, though. And I was just thinking to myself, like, okay, what, what? So Ethan knew this guy was going to go to work. He knocks him out in his house, makes a mask of him, and goes in. And what, they just randomly searched his house? Or did he live with someone and Ethan didn't think about that? Like, this doesn't go good either way, well, is kind of my point. I don't, I don't know. I can't sit down. It's really bad. Really if they mean. found him, like, a minute, you know, like, two minutes earlier, that's just it for Ethan. <laughs> like, he's exactly. In so, that was pretty unsatisfying. Ethan but then, of course, his tracks way better than this. The reasonable plan should be Ethan uh, eavesdrops the whole thing, gets all the information he can, and then leaves. He doesn't yeah. need to talk to Keytridge. What does he learn from yes, Keytridge? He's played Nothing. Splinter Cell. Ghost gets you the most points. Exactly. Right. Most it was actually points. kind of annoying because the only thing he achieves by talking to Keytridge is finding out that he was the one that put the bounty on Ilsa, but he seemed to already know that. Like, that was the Keytridge is admitting to it. He's like, yeah, okay, fine. I did it. And it's like, what, what does it help you to know that anyway? It doesn't change anything. I really like the conversation for the trailer, though, to be fair. Yeah. Um,. Ethan's much smarter than that, and then you're thinking, he's so, big, now he's, for yeah. he's given himself away, and now they're gonna be hunting him down because he's fucking dishonored again, or, uh, what was the word again? Dis uh, dishonored too. <laughs> disavowed. Disavowed. Uh, this one, this is the earliest nice disavowal. Um, and, and, and you're like, okay, so how's he getting out of here? And then, the film thinks it's clever, because he puts on a new mask, and it's a Keytridge mask. And he, and then Keytridge's like, oh... You're going to pretend to be me. And then he gets knocked out, and then it's like, Mission Impossible, dun, 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 dun. And it's like, well, no. They, they, the whole reason they know that someone in the room isn't supposed to be who they say they are is because Dittridge they found him in his house. The, yeah, the phone call where they Therefore, talk to Keytridge. when they see Keytridge trying to leave, they'll be like, oh, sir, you're okay. You were just on the phone explaining to us that you were not okay. they would be like, yeah, no, I'm fine now. <laughs> Everything's fine. they be like, uh-huh. Yeah, let us just check your neck a second, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's over. Wow, it's it's offensive. such a fucking dumb way to be like, ah, I can get out because I can look like you. It's like, this three decades. You don't think the the fact that you got in with a fake mask has blown me away. You think you're getting out of it when you've just established that's what you're doing? No. You're going to be grabbing them next. So yeah, no way he gets out with just a face mask. Grab that was kind of lame. Necks. Could have been Yeah, it's a shame because else. it's a cute little like, oh, uh, you're getting away. Uh, he's like, but oh, none of it works. None of it, none of it works. Dun dun. Dun 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 dun. Wish it made sense though. Dun dun dun. Mm -hmm. So, um, not doing fantastic. Mm. Not great. But could be, could we could be only just hit the intro, be so plenty of time to improve. Um, we get a scene for the, I'm gonna go, this could be, they claim not to be IMF, but they work for Keytridge, so, CIA? I don't know, agents? I don't know, just some, some agent guys. Intelligence no? agents, we could just call them agents, I guess, but agents are chasing Ethan, and, uh, they just talk about how he's fucking hard to kill, and they're gonna be getting him. Now, information they have is that... This is something I forgot, I can forgot, and forgot to mention, but it annoys me, okay? So, uh, Ethan eavesdropped them saying there is a buyer who is looking to get one of the keys. He's moving through the Middle East. And then Ethan later says there's a buyer coming in in Amsterdam for a layover in which he wants to buy half the key. So he must have the legit other half in order to validate this one. Now... Where did anyone get that information from? Like, mm. I don't even understand, really. It's like there's... So there's a man who's looking to buy half a key, and he's just traveling. Ethan wants to intercept him in order to try and sell his key to this man. 
and then that man will lead Ethan to whoever wanted that key complete, which is someone who likely knows how to use the key to destroy the entity. That's his logic. Where did this even so, start? All right, so you had... Okay, so let me... Start, isn't it? Ilsa, <laughs> Ilsa stole half the key. Correct. From... Uh, so it doesn't necessarily matter, and I'm kind of okay with that. She's got half. The other half is currently with the White Widow. I don't mind okay. saying that in stone I right would now. Assume that, I would assume that the Russians have that in a very, very, very secure location somewhere. All right. I assume no, she they, stole it from Russians. That, we don't even know that they got it. Some, that's a mystery for the next film to solve, is someone got those keys off those bodies. So okay, those, all then right. One half goes to Ilsa, one half goes to White Widow. All right, so so they're gonna have to bridge who got the keys later and how those keys became available on the open market for purchase. Um. Well, so this is like, where everyone I'm confused. Knows about, everyone knows everyone about. Knows let's about just call him Mister X for now. Who's gonna be buying a key? They call him the buyer. He's buying a key. Who's he buying it from? I I don't actually know. Um. But Ethan's hoping to intercept him so that he can sell his half that he have, now has from Ilsa. And then they can follow him to whoever knows about the key. But why does anyone know about this buyer? And why does anyone think he's real? Like he's got, how does anyone know that his half is worth anything? And then why does Ethan think that him having both parts of the key would lead to anything when so far all of the people who want the key and have the key don't know what the key does? Yeah, why do I want this key? Why would I buy it? Why, why would I buy this key? So... And it, well, yeah, even if we, yeah, exactly. Yeah, even if we grant like that, it's out there and it's for sale. Why would you buy it? Is... I love buying keys to things I don't know what they unlock. There yeah. is um, viability to the idea that someone hires you to do it, you know, and they're like, "I'll pay you if you get me this key." It doesn't really matter what the key is to those people. For example, Grace, but um, like he is arranging for all of these people to buy it or want it. Well, different Indiv parties, perhaps. But right? my whole issue is that. Ethan, for some reason, believes that whoever's trying to buy it will know what it's for. Why would you think that? I guess you would assume that people who buy a key would have a reason to want the key? Everyone who wants the key that Ethan's aware of, which is almost ten people at this point, none of them know what the key does. Does Ethan know that they don't know? So Ethan knows that he doesn't know. Ethan knows that Ilsa didn't know. He'll know if you talk to her, but for some reason she only tells him this halfway through the film. She should have told him at the time. All of MI6 don't know exactly what it does or how to use it. The, the point here is more so where does the key go and what does it do when you put it into the lock or whatever. Because a lot of people speculate that it can help you control or destroy. But, you know, that's, that's only an assumption. That's what Ethan's trying to find out is where does it go and how does it work. Remember, at the end of the film, he finds out where to go. That's the setup for part two. So what I'm getting at is that the only person that really has the information he wants is actually the director of intelligence who gives it to Gabriel and uh, Paris, I think her name is, and then Paris gives it to Ethan. We'll get into all of that and how that works, but my point is just that this is a pretty awful plan, but we'll, we'll get more into it as time goes on for now. Everyone knows about this buyer, including intelligence agencies, and now Ethan, because he overheard what they were talking about. Which means our first set piece is being set up. It's an airport. Um, guy is going to come in, and Ethan's explaining to Luther and Benji that he needs to get to him and to do the deal so that he gets the key off Ethan, and then he will take the key to someone, and Ethan will track him, and that someone will then hopefully explain what the key does. How it works. Hmm. Well, that's mm. enough. That's enough to follow for now. And um, he's walking around in the airport without wait, a mask. Wait, 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 wait. We haven't <laughs> gone anywhere near that yet. So uh, I thought every, he was in the airport already. Every no, I've just I've just told us the like that's the start of the location. We haven't even talked about like their plan yet. So uh, Benji says every government in the world will kill us just to get their hands on this key. Do we see any other government in this film that's after the key other than American? I no. Yeah, that's what I thought. We just um, have the agent guys, and then you have... Which aren't uh, even after the key, they're after men. Ethan. Yeah, and then you have the evil man who's after it, and then you have Ethan. I thought At one point strange. later, certain people end up in the hands of the Italian government, and the Italian <laughs> government notably is not in, involved yeah, in the Yeah, they don't, they the don't even know about time. the key, yeah, they're just they there to get a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, they went to yeah, Grace, yeah. It was really weird that they make this point several times. The whole world will come down on you if you have these keys, and then they just don't. And it's like, okay, 
Uh, the world doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how cool would it have been? It's a completely different movie. But what about a movie where Ethan and his team are being hunted because they start with both keys, they need to find someone who can explain them, meanwhile the entire world's government's best assassins are all after them? I mean, the yeah, the movie could start with someone giving it to Ethan. Yeah, and being like, this key is, you know, but they, they get in the key, but they aren't able to explain what it does. But, you know, that that's how he sort of uh, start the movie, right? Some guy. You're the only one I trust, Ethan. Uh, your own government, even M I M F, even everyone. Don't trust anybody. Don't trust anything. Da, 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 da. I've Stop traveled anything. too far and seen too much to ignore the evil in the galaxy. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So that yeah, that he basically explains that they're also um, the the fact that they had this conversation is an act of treason. So they're against their own government too. It's just like you know, they even make a joke about how this is so normal at this point. It's like. Um, so, Ethan knows that all of the intelligence agencies know that this buyer is coming with half a key. Now, we don't know whether or not it's real yet, but we do know that they believe it is. And so Ethan knows that in this airport will be intelligence agencies, including, of course, the American ones, potentially more. He knows right now that he's one of the most wanted men on Earth for the American intelligence agencies. Therefore... Springy, what should he do? He should probably put on a mask. Yes. Um, for some reason, he doesn't. Now, we all know that the reason he doesn't is the same reason is that they reason take off their masks account. all the time in Marvel. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, gotta show the actor's face off. That's why he doesn't really wear masks at all in any of these anymore, um, which is kind of lame. But I guess that's just modern filmmaking for you. Mm. Um. So anyway, that that's going to come up in a second more so, but it's already just a really weird choice that would be made, but for some reason isn't being made here. Um, their plan, like I said, is to sell their key, their real key, to the buyer, who may or may not have a real key, to then tra trace him to, to whoever he's going to give it to. Why not make a copy so that you can give him one that doesn't actually work? The is only it? thing that I can think of is that you would have to you would have to set the story up in a way that they would be unable to make a fake, be it a time constraint or some element of the key that prohibits them from doing it. Um, or you'd have to say that they have a way to verify the key. Um, you'd, have, you'd have to come up with something and then explain it to me. I think the best well, thing I'm... you can do is set out of some super duper ultra rare element. I think we got because the buyer will know it's a fake. Uh, no, the buyer has a fake key. Yeah, that doesn't work. Kind of, yeah, it kind of, it's kind of the problem. It's like it's... Um, the best faith I can go with is that if the buyer had a real one and they gave him a fake one, it wouldn't connect. But nobody in the fucking world will know whose one is real and whose is fake. If you have they one. Actually, use the thing. Like, if I had like two that. fakes that verify each other, and Fringy had a real one and Rags had a real one, I would be like, "Well, mine are real. Um, let me test it with Rags. Oh, yours is fake, Rags. It doesn't react, but my two do. Let me test with yours, Fringy. Oh, yours is fake too. And it's like, well, no, those two have the real one, but how is anyone going to know? Just, you just all they're basing it on is putting two together, and they light up, and they have Except a radioactive signature or something. But you can do, you can fake all of this. We already said you can repeat exactly. all of it. Which then just means that the only way that you could ever know is to go to the Sevastopol and use it. Yeah. That's the only way to actually know which one's real. So, um... The, 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 somewhere in the Sevastopol there's this huge queue of people all with their keys and they just walk <laughs> yeah. in. One after another. Yes, I've got it. Oh, damn. It's the wrong one. Step Next. right up. Do you believe you have the real keys? Let's test them out. Oh, <laughs> hard luck. Because the, the fact is, if, next time. if they are worried about the scenario where they give their key to this buyer, their fake one, and he goes, wait a second, this isn't the real one, then of course you could give him the real one so that he verifies it, and then you just take the two real ones off him. You subvert it, steal it, whatever. Because the last thing you want to do is let anyone have the two actual keys. Right, this is going to move into a different criticism, but uh, we're about to get to a point where they actually realize it's he has the fake one, so they could easily give him a fake one. Wouldn't that um, be a great callback to Ghost Protocol? Yeah, good. And where it's like, you know, I, I, like remember the last time we tried to, you know, give someone the real thing and it didn't work out. Yeah, you know, 
Now, you might think, well, but doesn't that destroy the whole intention of tracing him back to the person who would know? And it's like, um, you could interrogate him. You could give him truth serum, which is a thing that exists in this universe, in the fifth film. It was really effective, by the way. The people will admit their deepest secrets to you in just instantly. So you could just do that and then find out who he works for to then move to the next thing. Or you could actually steal it from him and then just trace him back to his fucking boss anyway. He's gonna probably go back to him. And that's that. Or again, switch out the real two for the fake two. Um, apparently Tom Cruise is very adept at pickpocketing and putpocketing in this film. He knows how to do it. He's got a good sleight of hand. So all of these options are on the table, but they're never entertained before the plan starts. They're simply going to give him the real key and then follow it. Uh, not as effective IMO compared to you either take the plutonium away or you uh, save your friends and the bad guys get the plutonium. Like that, that to me seems a lot more straightforward and a good reason for why the bad guys end up with the plutonium being the story in Fallout versus this where you're giving away the fake key for no real reason at all. And there's so many different ways you could back it up, subvert it. You have one of the real ones. So whatever the system is for verification, you can copy. They have the technology. Got all of the technology. <sighs> anyway, uh, that's, you know, moving on. They, they, they just discuss that that's the plan, and they start it up. Uh, we see the agents are searching for Ethan, and their plan is to have someone hack into the cameras and look for Ethan's face. Oh, God. These Wish. are people who are aware of IMF and what it does for the past 30 years, and yet they think that they will find him with just his also face. Also, they're aware, aren't they, of the entity and what that does to the viability of data and online information. So uh, any technological <laughs> system should be massively distrusted, and they rely on it uh, consistently. It takes a little while before them to realize that, though, to be fair. It's not like they were explicitly told what it is and what it does. At the well, and it's also not like they could just infer these kinds of things from, like, uh, like come on. <laughs> but no, well, that's their plan. But uh, So you've got agents who are being sent out by people who do know all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's quite important that they know all of this because it completely undermines whatever strategies they might usually deploy. Are they not going to pass down any information to the agents they've sent after Ethan that actually, yeah, maybe don't rely too much on technology because it's not to be trusted because not only is your enemy good at manipulating this, but there's another thing which makes it completely untrustworthy. Uh, the unfortunate fact is that they are comic relief. That, that yeah. is their role in the film. Very limited, and they're just for funnies. Which is kind of sad, because a lot of them get killed. And they're mm. just people trying yeah. to do their job. Yeah, it is sad to see that. Uh, not really get any... You know, because they're not the bad guys. So no. it's... You know, it's really sad to... Yeah, I mean, one of the, those are agents, right? I thought we cared about, like, agents and things. And when they die, it's, you know, sad, and it's a big deal. And because yeah, all they know is uh. that Ethan's betrayed the country. He's reasonless piece of shit who's gonna subvert you know, intelligence agencies, blah blah blah, and so they've been sent to bring him in, and their leader says that that's all he does, he always does it. That's the one conversation you get in this whole movie between those two, is one of them says, what if Ethan's doing all of this for a reason? I thought it was so fucking embarrassing that that's all we get. That's it. That's where this conversation what starts and ends pretty much. And then it ends, like, about ten seconds later. It's, it's better to say it's a conversation is a little bit charitable. They have a whole movie, those two, and that's all we got. What if he has a good reason? <laughs> um, so, yeah, they are using the most inept way to search for Ethan, considering not only the history of this entire franchise and everything they know about Ethan, but also with the entity in play as well. Yeah. So stupid. And then you find out Luther is making it so that they can't detect real Ethan on the cameras, because he is using his normal face, and he's instead putting his face onto other people so that they think other people are Ethan, and then they run up to him, they're like, hey, you, you're Ethan, and the guy's like, what? No, I'm not. And he's like, wait a minute. And their the tech mm -hmm. is being subverted. And yeah, all I was thinking with that is just like, man, Luther, you already know about the entity now. Ethan knows that it's in all digital technology and that it doesn't and want you to do certain it. things. If you can, yeah. And, and you can, yeah, you can do that. So imagine what the entity can do. Especially, this mm -hmm. is like 2020, I assume this film's set in 2022 or three, right? Uh, fucking figure. modern. It looks so modern, yeah. Just, uh, and that's not considered, not considered at all. We have to wait until like the hour and 10 minute mark before uh, Team Ethan realized that the entity can do things. Pretty annoying. Um, 
So, yeah, they uh, they send him, and the agent, Luther, sends him to the other side of the airport, is what he says. Um, I haven't checked the size of the airport, but I'm sure it's pretty big. This will come up again a little bit later. But the funny thing I thought was Probably. that the first person they send the team to is, like, right next to Ethan. He's, like, uh, just above them in some kind of walkway. And it's like, damn, dude, Luther, playing a bit close there. Send him to the other side, you know? Yeah, and then a he glance. sends him to the That's, other side. Remember, just... you don't have a mask. One random glance. Oh, but, especially if they're looking for you. Oh, there he is. Why not um, have someone who's heading outside into, like, a taxi look like Ethan? So then they have to chase the taxi, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then there ha yeah, there has to be the get the cars, the sirens, there's a big deal that causes a bunch of commotion out there, slows things down. Oh, oh yeah, there are way yeah, better ways it, to know. do the job they want to do, but they don't even do the best job with what they're doing. A little bit disappointing. And so we introduce Grace. Picks the pocket of the man who has the key that Ethan wants, and he's got a detector in his glasses so he can see that she does it. And then uh, he grabs her to get that back out. But before we get on with that, uh, Benji asks Luther to mute their communications. Like, why, why, why are you doing that? And he says, because there's a bag that he's detected that's been put on the conveyor belt to go to on a, on a plane that could very well have a bomb in it. Um, why mute? Why not tell why Ethan about that? Tell Ethan... Yeah, why, I don't get why... The, I, I, the idea that they... <laughs> well, the, he's there. He's within the bomb So the eventual reason radius. we get is that he had a lot going on. That's what Benji says. He had a <laughs> lot going off. on. Fuck off. Now, I just, I'd love to be able to speak to Benji, because I'd be like, okay, so you understand that everything that Ethan's doing is irrelevant if a bomb goes off in the whole airport, right? Like, whatever pockets are being picked or keys are being moved around, if everyone dies... <laughs> and this... Well, what they're doing, they're... The, this is an unprecedented amount of stress for Ethan. He just wouldn't be able to handle this kind of stress. Knowing that there's a bomb, oh, that that's just that's, that's never happened in far. every single Mission Impossible. It's not movies. like if in the in the prime movie he had to deal with the exact same situation while piloting a helicopter to chase after a guy, a highly trained agent with a detonator that had to be like synchronized with them deactivating the bombs in the giant like village. Or so his um, wife in it. And then uh, uh, a little bit later, Luther, I think, says, what if the... No, I think it's either, it's either Luther or Benji. One of them says, what if the entity wants us to think it's a bomb? And I was thinking to myself, like, so you do know... Yeah, and, and, then, and then I thought, like, of course they do. They had the whole explanation from Ethan earlier, but for some reason now they're only considering this one element of the entity. Like, what if it's tricking us into thinking that's a bomb? It's like, what if it's infected your laptops entirely and it's making you do everything at once? Well, why haven't we talked about this yet? They talk about it way later. It's so fucking weird, but... Um, yeah, why isn't Ethan involved in that conversation? He's the one that actually knows about all this stuff. They don't. He was there for the explanation. They should probably be like, Ethan, we've got a bomb notification on our laptops. Do you believe that's the entity trying to throw us off the key? Or do you believe it's real? And of course Ethan would be like, we're going to have to check it out. And he, he likely would have said, we're going to have to abort the key stuff with the cello, just keep his fake one or whatever, and go to the bomb. The bomb is the priority. Yeah. But they don't tell him, so he doesn't get to make any decisions related to that, and he's just mad at them for doing it later, because, it would yeah, be why did they do that? Just also, on its face, wouldn't it? Because I, I, I've never worked in an airport, but I'm pretty sure there's something around there that can detect if a bag happens to have a nuclear bomb in it. In this post-9-11 world? Well, you can argue the entity would have manipulated all the technology to let yeah. it pass. I... Sorry, I had to look away for a moment. Did we, uh, did you mention, like, if you're not going to tell Ethan, do you think that the idea needs to occur to you to, like, alert the authorities in the airport for the sake of um, all the lives? If you even think there's a chance it's a bomb, I think that's, that's ethical reason enough to call an ev emergency evacuation. Yeah. yeah, like, we have to completely shift the focus of this mission entirely onto this bomb. Um, and if that's not a feasible thing that we could do, there needs to be, like, someone needs to say, we need to call the bomb squad, we need to evacuate the airport immediately, because it's an airport full of people, and this is a nuclear device or something, but even, even no, that, you know, being said, you, right, it's just... Already got the counters coming up, but we've gotta, gotta get this, the, 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 all Let's they know it. is it might be a bomb. That's what it's they know true. right now. Might they bomb. don't know the time yeah. limit. They don't know the range on it. Now, to compare to a different film, one called Mission Impossible Fallout, 
They're in a car right. heading toward the two bombs. They know the exact yield of the bombs because they're familiar with the plutonium and the nature of the bomb's construction because they actually captured Niels Delbruck is the one that made them. And he's captured in the beginning. They have all of his plans. They know the range on these bombs. And as they're driving in, I think Benji says, shouldn't we call an evacuation? And then it says, no way they'd get out of range in time. So we've just got to try and defuse them. That's not applicable here. They don't know the range on this bomb. They don't know the time on this bomb. You call the evacuation. It's an airport. You, you, you do it immediately. That's what you should do, but they don't. And they don't acknowledge that that's something they should do either. So it's, um... Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, definitely a wah, wah. Kind so, of, uh, yeah, so much for Fallout's themes. Ethan uh, 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 pickpockets Grace and then does sleight of hand magic in front of her for a while, which fucking blew my mind. I was like, what the hell are you doing? Get on with the fucking mission. Um, and then he basically explains to her that he wants her to take the, the key back and put pocket it into the guy so that he can continue his mission and that if she does it correctly, he will allow her to keep the, I think it was like 50... Thousand in crypto or something on a flash drive. It's um, like five million, isn't it? It's something big. I, I couldn't remember. It's a big. It's a large amount of money. And so she eventually agrees. And I was just thinking to myself, like, man, we haven't entertained any of the other options here. Being that, if only he did have a fake that he could put into that guy's pocket, ready, so that she could, you know, drop in a fake one. But then again, he's holding a fake one, so I guess that doesn't really matter. So at this point. You know, you just, just what, like, but they don't know that yet. They don't actually verify it's a fake key yet. But you might be holding the real two. And I was just thinking, like, how does it not occur to you that you're holding, like, the most important thing in the universe right now? Like, those two keys. And that if any of the wrong people, like, Ethan's the best person on Earth. <laughs> Ethan's the best person on Earth to have those keys right now. If ever they fell into any other hands, it could mean the end of the world for everyone other than that person slash power. So... It's just, it's just weird. The gravity of the situation is not appreciated at all by Ethan. And he's playing with them in front of her, and then he's suggesting that we throw one back into the guy's pocket. I just, I found that hard to watch. Mm. Didn't feel like they were being respected, those keys. Um, in, in terms of all the other options you have. But, oh well. Uh, she says, yeah, okay, I agree. And Ethan's running this all on the idea that she's, I guess, not going to try and subvert him. That she'll just do everything that he wants her to do. And that everything's going to go fine. Um, things do not work out. Kind of where I'm, uh, I'm, I'm edging toward there. And a hint, you know, give it the old hint to Rue. Um, you oh, also got to wow. hope the buyer doesn't notice that he's lost his key now. The whole time that they haven't put it back yet. Oh, that might be an issue throughout the movie. Which, people not. You got to wonder, right? <laughs> like, if, if that guy would just be like occasionally checking his pockets all the time, just like, oh, yep, you know, you yeah, know what I mean? Like, like the, the kind of way that you do when it's like, oh, is my phone? Yeah, my phone's there. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, like mm -hmm. if, if you know that you have something of this insane value on it, you would be very paranoid about constantly checking to make sure that it's there, just out of just a I wouldn't good be surprised habit to make sure it's there. If people stored them in like little lock boxes that were actually like yeah. chained to them, why wouldn't you? What would this... they have done if that was the case? It'd just be it'd if it was a fun. yeah suitcase with the handcuffs yeah, like they do exactly. in the movie. Yeah, you'd be fucked. <laughs> the whole mission would be fucked yeah. in so many you'd ways without the case. It would you'd have to yeah, you'd have to come up with oh, how do we pick the lock on the thing without him not noticing or how do we you know yeah, like that would be like a well, well, you know you never know, right? That would be like well, a thing yeah, to do in the movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like exactly. You'd have to sit down and think. That's the that's the chink that happens in their plan, right? That's where they go, or the kink. A chink is an armor. A kink is in a plan, right? The kink in the plan is that they're trying to do the pickpocket, and then they notice he's got the briefcase, and then he's got the handcuffs tied to it, and he's like, oh, uh-oh. And everyone's like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? They try to come up with a distraction, or they try to come up with, you know, something. That's the little, like, oh, we got to improvise. That would be more interesting. Um... But yeah, he says, uh, who are you working for anyway? And then Grace says, oh, I don't work with anybody. He says, okay, well, now you got a partner. And I thought it was really weird that he does believe her on that. Just He just believes that she is working alone, that she wants the, the key just to presumably sell it or whatever, and she just happens to know what it's worth. And think to for him to ask her how she knows what the key is or what it's worth at all. Well... Well, just move on. Mahler, I, I, think, I think you're forgetting one very... Actually, two very important things. Uh, she is charming and hot, so... Hmm. Uh. 
Anyway, uh, he says, I know you're going to put this key back in his pocket because you want the money, and he holds up the flash drive. And I was just thinking to myself, like, that key is worth so much more than the flash drive, if it were real, but he doesn't know. It's, it's fine. It's, it's totally fine. Um, so then we hear Luther in the background say, I sure hope you know what you're doing about Ethan. I was thinking to myself, like, Luther, why don't, you, why don't you elaborate? It sounds like you're not fully on board. Maybe there are way better ways to do this plan. Maybe there are way better things you could do. Tell Ethan. You're let a smart him know. Because apparently he doesn't know. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, uh, Luther then scans the key and he says it's counterfeit. So only theirs is real. The one that the buyer had was fake. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't have checked that immediately. That seems like the first thing you need to do straight away. It's super important. Changes everything whether or not that key is real. And then uh, Tom Cruise says, that changes nothing. I thought that was an interesting comment. Because, <laughs> like, if you had both mm. keys, I feel like that changes everything. But a bit. apparently not. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's something to think about if the buyer himself had the fake key. One, he couldn't verify any keys, because he's got a fake one, at least by their own logic. And two, if he has a fake key, believing he has a real one, what do you expect he knows about the keys or what they do? Surely you'd expect his information to actually be the most lacking out of everybody's if he can't even tell if he's got a real one. And also, this is like the confirmation that fakes of these keys exist, they can be made, and knowledge of the keys is prevalent enough to allow for fakes being made. Yes. Which is going to put huge um, kinks in your plan. So this you guys is been like talking a big about that variable. goddamn key for hours. This whole film is about two keys. The whole it's, thing. It's about, yeah, this is like, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of important. Well, this is like us talking movie. about Infinity Stones or something. Well, it's kind of a... We're talking about the movie. That's what's happening. <laughs> There's yeah. keys in it. The keys are sent, the keys are the, the semi-MacGuffin yeah. sort of things of the, of the movie. They're very, the very important. I mean, they're the central, yeah, it's like Mola yeah. said, they're the central plot elements of the film. So yes, we're going to be talking about the keys. We're talking yeah. about the movie and trying to figure out, you know, where yeah. it sits. Um, we're just doing the EFAP thing. The <laughs> agents are then frustrated because they keep bumping into fake Ethans, and so then they're like, he's jerking our chains, let's spread out. I was just thinking to myself, like, why didn't you do that? Do they actually the say place? jerking our chains? Yeah. Why wouldn't they okay. have spread out? Why would they all... Yeah, it's like, let's all out. of us go together to get this one guy. Yeah, Especially Ethan, after... Ethan's dangerous. Uh, what Especially that lady should have told them time. was, wow, he was Ethan on my screen, and then it glitched, and then he wasn't. I think my tech is compromised. Like, that should have yeah, been said I, straight it's, away. It's kind of crazy that they didn't instantly go, hmm, you know what? Mm. I think we're being screwed <laughs> with here. Mm. Let's, uh... I mean, we well, are the, the, highly trained, like, secret, serv like, super-duper agent people. Do you figure really that we have some familiarity? With these but countermeasures. The agent's information is, we want the keys. Like, the, the intelligence agencies. Ethan wants the key, too, because he's going to destroy it. We have to stop Ethan. That's what they've been sent in to do. Why haven't they sent in a team to get the buyer? The intelligence agency is the reason that Ethan knows the buyer is even a thing. And the buyer has yeah, half a think, key. Because if you're with the buyer, I mean, it's... if if. If, if Ethan wants to go find the buyer, then just go with the buyer, and then you find Ethan. He'll come to you. Well, there's that, but there's also the fact that they, he has a, they want the key. They know they the buyer's coming in. Oh, God. It's a trap, or I guess oh. it isn't a trap, actually. So oh, they should have oh. a team on him anyway, and then, yeah, they would yeah. likely be led, well, you know what they would be led to? They'd be led to fucking would Mantis. They, to? they would be led to Mantis, that's right. Who? <laughs> yeah, would, that's they, right. would they even get that far, though, if they already know the buyer has the key? They don't have to wait for him to get to this one. No, you're right. They could just take it from lounge. him, and that would fuck yeah, everything exactly. up for everyone else. And that would ruin. That would just change the whole movie. The whole movie would end straight away. Yeah, because everyone would assume that one is real. Because yeah, <laughs> it's just like yeah, everyone does. Like I said, this, that's why I brought up the whole. How does anyone know it's real? It's like Bruh. it just is. Yeah. It's like okay, so anyone who claims they have one is just good, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, but the, the, the good key will verify the good key. It's like, if you have two fucking fake keys to verify each other, then everyone will be convinced those are the real keys. That sounds really yeah. stupid. Go down to the Sevastopol and it's like, all right, here we go. And then it won't work. It'll be like when Thanos snaps and you can notice <laughs> the, in the thing. <laughs> so, um, and then Benji... It's impossible. <laughs> Put the, the keys together. 
Anyway, Benji's down there with the bomb. He is. He's got the bag, and he says uh, there is a device in here. And it annoys me that he's now confirmed there's a device, like evac, evac, evac. And he's like, I yeah, am now evac, removing so the device. Bomb. No, Look why would you and even like, touch it? Why I would feel you like, yeah, I, I feel like it's got to be protocol for any bomb defusal squad. It's like, don't fucking touch it right don't now. Don't fucking touch you know, it. You know the worst I wish thing? I, the worst thing about it Locker. is uh, you can actually see, and you, it shows the Benji can see it. There is a timer that's frozen on it. As yep. in it's five minutes and it hasn't set up yet. So it should be like, okay, the timer is here. It's not moving. This is clearly yeah. meant to be on an airplane. So we may have enough time to get everyone out. Evac now. Like yeah. hopefully the timer so doesn't Something start. has to happen to it before the timer starts. So at the very least, I'm not going to touch it in case it happens to be activated by that. Oh, Except oh. that that's what he does. And then he says, oh, well, I seem to have activated it. Yeah, he, well, he puts it on the table done. and it activates. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, fucking whoops. He's like a bomb defusal expert. Dude. Why would it? Yeah, what? Yeah. He knows better. He's the tech guy. He is the tech yeah, and guy. And he's talking to Luther, who's also a tech expert, who, who would tell him guy. not to fucking yeah. fiddle with it. But we need it for some drama, so Benji's mm. gonna momentarily be way more incompetent than he actually is. And then Benji's like... Oh god, how do I defuse this? And then Luther's like, use your tools. He's like, I don't have any tools. Oh, and just bear in mind, again, this is all happening while they're muted, so Ethan doesn't know any of this is happening. He's busy doing... And he should, but own. they just won't let that happen. Um, It's too stressful, Mahler. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, you realize that Benji went to this bag, specifically from the little command center that they had, because he believed it might be a bomb, but he didn't take his tools with him. Um, I That's mean, pretty smart. why would you well, not do that? Like, because it'll like, probably be okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> all right then. Yeah. Oh. Um. So yeah. Uh. He has. He says we have five minutes, and it appears to be nuclear, which he only knows because it shows a little nuclear symbol on the digital pad. Yeah. Which. That's it. You might want to entertain the idea again about the entity, which is not. like, yeah, fair. I mean, safe to assume it's. Well, I guess you don't lose anything by assuming, but we should always assume the worst. I just find it interesting guess, that they yeah. never discuss the potential. Like they say it once earlier. Like, what if the entity wants us to believe this is a bomb? Then they never say it again. Wait. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, yeah. No, don't worry. It's, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's no, mind, it's, all it's, we can it's, do. It's just, I'm trying to. It's yeah. Let's keep going. <laughs> and uh, good old uh, uh, Luther says, "How big is the bomb?" And then uh, Benji says, "Big enough to take out everyone in this airport, I suspect." But I just thought that was funny because it's like, but it was meant to go on an airplane. Like, we we actually have no clue. There's no real way to guess how big this bomb is. And I assume that might have been the throwaway line to say it's too late to evacuate now. But it's still not, because there's still people on the edges of the fucking airport that if they were to run directly opposite it right now, they might make it, but they're just never entertained. I'm surprised there wasn't even a throwaway line saying that it's too late. They usually do that mm. in these movies. Oh, well, they did it in Fallout. They did it in Fallout, in a, and it was justified in Fallout. Because uh, they knew exactly what the bomb was and how big it was, but they don't know in this one. Um... Yeah. Anyway, the thing opens up, and there's uh, it's a cylindrical device with a bunch of wheels, and they have a bunch of letters on them. And I think uh, Luther says that means there's 1.5 billion combinations for unlocking it. That that that's like the nature of it. Is it could be uh, diffused if you can crack it, and it spells out "You are done," spelled D-U-N-N, which is how you spell Benji's surname. So uh, camera tightens up on him, and he says, "It's my last name." And the music is playing very creepy, and I was kind of into it. And this was an said, interesting. This this would be like an interesting. I th I think one of the good keys about this kind of villain is the slow reveal about what it knows, what it can do, and what it has been doing the entire time. And this is one of those things where I'm like, oh, this is like interesting. Like it even knows who it is, you know. But you know, it's surrounded by everything that it's surrounded by. But now this is one of those little things about wow, this movie could have been really, really cool. The uh, the creepy angle for me was a little bit damaged by the fact that you see, you are done. I already knew that was his last name, so I thought that was kind of cool. It says it's my last name, which I think is like, all right, everyone's got it now. And then it zooms in further, and then he goes, "It knows who I am." I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why did you have to say that? First time, and also the second time. 
yeah. third time. I don't know why. The film isn't as confident this time around. A little more subtle in the other one. Which is strange. Yeah, like, if you really need it again, then why isn't he, like, almost, like, semi-panicking, saying, how does it know my name? Or something. Like, how did it figure that out? How does it know who I am? Something well, how did it know that, that, that I so... would come down here? How did it yeah. know? And then, and then at that point, you should it should realize, like, oh, shit, I got lured here. Yeah. Oh, even if he just said it lured me here, that would have been good because it means that he figured it out all on his own, you know, like he quickly figured out that that's what was happening. Um, so, by the way, he announces it. It's a cylinder cipher and there are eight wheels. Now, do you know how many questions he answers? Oh, he doesn't answer, right? He it's answers like five. Five? Yeah. Why, I mean, I don't, why, why do that? The additionally really fucking weird thing is uh, when he answers question, I think it's four, um, it shows a wheel spinning and it's the third wheel uh, in from the left. That's, I, wow, really? Yeah, I, I was Interesting. getting a good look at it and I don't know what the fuck is going on with that thing. Um, I assume it's because uh, they probably did the full scene and then they cut it down uh, and mm -hmm. that we're supposed to fill in the blanks between cuts which you can benefit from, I'm relatively I okay guess. with that, but probably would have liked to see the whole thing, I guess, but with well, what it each is... each of the questions was relevant and important to, which, you know, each of the questions is significant. Yeah, um, first from question is... Standpoint. Well, I say it's, it's riddles, right? I speak without a mouth, I fly on the air without wings. Does uh, Echo, I think Luther does, or Benji, I can't remember, but... First wheel spins. Now, uh, Mel highlighted this uh, to me, and I just think it's just so obvious that sometimes you want to fucking kill yourself. You're just like, yeah, they have Google. You can just type all these into Google, and you'll get the answer straight away. In fact, you'll probably get more than one that would work. So it, was, uh, it would be funny if they tried, well, not funny, but if they tried to Google it, and the entity stopped it from loading yeah. Oh, you know what would be really great is if they do that and it shows uh, Dennis Nedry, and he goes, ah, 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 <laughs> you didn't say the magic word, ah, ah, ah. That would be, they, they'd probably get what, away with that. I mean, if they literally Googled the answer and then the Google return was no cheating, that would be yeah. creepy. I'd be creepy as fuck. Um, the entity yeah. does not allow cheating. They don't even try. <laughs> they don't even try. That's a thing. That's a miss. That's a good point, Rags. That's a huge missed opportunity. How oh. cool would it have been if they looked it up and then, yeah, the computer said no. Because this is, this is <laughs> like, kind of like the first sort of like hint of an idea that the entity has like a personality or curiosity or something that it wants to know these answers from done right which is like that is a legitimately really interesting thing that this entity potentially has a personality and it's almost like like a thanos in a way it's not just a villain trying to do a thing but it's like a, a thinking creature uh it's an agent now um yeah i, I guess in the you know other sense so, but, but this just doesn't really go anywhere, which is, like, really fucking lame that this kind of just gets dropped. Absolutely. Which, in retrospect, makes this aspect of the riddles just seem out of place. Oh, there's so much to say about this. This is why... Is it slightly undermined from the beginning as well, in that why, has, why doesn't it already know everything it really needs to know about him? I thought that was the premise of the well, threat that give... it poses, is that it's been harvesting all of this information already. I'll give you a few more quotes, and then we'll go back to that, right? So the second thing is, are you afraid of death? And then Benji's like, what the hell? And then Luther says, it's a psychometric test. The more you answer, the more it learns about you. Which if it'll like, disarm the bomb, I'll give it my autobiography. Well, as uh, I Platoon's, care. I assume, trying to highlight, uh, Benji says no to the question of, are you afraid of death? And then the machine says, like, eh, eh. and it's like, wait. So it's asking these questions it to learn about you, but it knows that you're lying. It already knows. So... <laughs> what do you mean? What is it learning? And uh, I think that's one of the two questions it actually asks about Benji. And apparently, already yeah, knows those the answer. Yeah, those are just to, like so... basic bitch riddles. Well, what is it? What are the answers? Are you afraid of death? Yes or no? Tell you about a person compared to just scanning their entire social media history, which it can do with Benji if it wanted to. Yeah, which is presumably already has done. In fact, mm -hmm. in fact, that's probably how it knows whether or not he's lying about these questions. So why that line from Luther is bizarre? He's like psychometric test. The more you answer Benji, the more it learns. It's like that could be creepy, but you don't do anything with that, and but the questions see, don't tell the us thing. that at all. But that's just like normal behavior. The more people answer your questions when you ask that, that's just developing a relationship <laughs> with anybody. Yeah, I mean, it's well the. When he says, like, the more you answer, the more you know, and the next thing is what's always approaching but never arrives, and then he gets the answer from Grace, 
What does that tell you about Benji? That he has friends that he relies on for answers to questions? What is there being... First off, it's, obviously it's tomorrow. Super easy, basic riddle. Not impressive whatsoever. Um, we can do way better than that. This oh, is yeah. just way... You know what like, we could this do, This is like elementary, is, right? We can not only have better riddles, but ones that relate to the story. Yeah, or, that you know, cool. we don't even... There's a bit later in the film when it mimics his voice. Yeah, that's about the coolest two thing they ever do. And it's... But is this its way of... No, it's a, it's a complete headcanon, but like, could you tie it forward to that one? Like, it's it's basically asking him to give it his... Well, give it his voice, basically. And that's the, the thing that it uses later on to mimic it the voice. It already has their voices. From the answers. Well, yeah, yeah. Doesn't need this for that. No. I'm just uh, trying to make it have I some know, kind of point to the plot, but it doesn't. It doesn't have any. Or just skip the riddles and have all the questions be like personal questions. and like 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 Benji well, has to disarm the bomb by just answering honestly. It all feels like missed opportunities, right? Because the next one is, uh, uh, who or what is the most important thing to you? And you and you, he he says my friends. He does it in quite a like sincere way, and then it like gets closer and he goes, "You bastard." I was like, why'd you, why'd you do that? No, I, I quite liked the fact that he felt a little like embarrassed to say it, but that it's just ultimately true and he needs to do this to disarm the bomb. I enjoyed that piece, and then they're like, also like, isn't this funny? And it's like, no, that's the point. It's not funny. This is, he's trying to it's save everyone's scary. lives by giving honest answers about how he feels. And then I was thinking, oh shit. Imagine it said like, what do you truly think about Ethan Hunt? And, 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 you know, Luther's like, come on. And he's just like, well, you know, and he says he's like, he's an amazing person. He does amazing things. He saved so many lives, done so many things. And, you know, dot, dot, dot. And the machine's not ticking yet. And then he's like, but maybe, maybe he's uh, a bit out of control. He goes too far. He takes too many risks. He's out yeah. of control. He, you know, stuff like and that. And maybe you some know, people doesn't... would be alive where they aren't anymore, if not for him. And then it dings. Like, how fucking meaningful would that be? And Luther knows, but Ethan was muted. You know, it would be even play with in, more interesting if you had like him answer like that, and then there's the pause as if the machine is thinking if that's satisfactory, and then it opens up. There's so much you could do with the this you know this entity and how it interacts with human beings and what it wants to know and what it's you know what what its you know quote unquote personality is. That's just it's a huge missed opportunity for this concept of a villain. Yep. Uh... So, uh, I'll, well, I mean, funnily enough, the last riddle is what gets bigger the more you take away. And, uh, oh, for those of us who, uh, you know, have, have played a certain video game, it's like, man, who just talking about how much they wasted with this? Jeez. Meanwhile, oh, yeah, you're fucking right. Oh, my God. Jeez. Isn't it just, like... I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> so... Wow. How, uh, in a, in a little video game that we fully recommend called God of War Ragnarok, there are characters who, as part of the flavor dialogue of moving through the world, start telling each other riddles. And this dialogue triggers throughout the whole game after certain events until it is a part of one of the biggest payoffs in the whole game. And it's incredibly meaningful. And it's something that you never would have expected because there's so much flavor dialogue. It's just, you know, you, you don't think that one's going to become so fucking important. But it is specifically that quote as well. And then in this film, it's just thrown in there. I don't know. <laughs> and, and Luther just goes, oh, a hole. And they go, yep, that's it. Like, okay. Oh, man. You're that's giving that. me those, you're giving me the, the flashbacks of that, that, uh, that story. Man. Oh, boy. Yeah. Ragnarok. Talk about, oh. Good time. Good um, times. And so, seven out of eight wheels are complete, and then Benji starts to panic because there are no more questions. What do I do? There's one more wheel. And legit, in the cinema, I was sitting there and I was like, oh, they'll realize that there's only one more wheel, so you can just spin it. You can just click it until you get the correct answer. Because that you might have overthought it for a moment, waiting for another question. But you'll obviously conclude that uh, he does not, nor does Luther, and nor does Ethan when he gets told about this. None and this is the moment they decide to tell him with like 45 yes. seconds left when he can't possibly do anything. As though that's not even more stressful than being told about it when you had time to stop it. Yeah, which he seems to express, but it never comes up again. I actually would have liked a scene where he says, never fucking do that ever again, you idiots. Like, Jesus Christ, I trust you. We're you're a team, to trust we have me. to trust each other. We've been through all of this and you're keeping secrets. Like, come on. 
For all he knew, randomly turning the letters could activate the bomb right away. So why does he do it? I can't really make that argument if he's going to do it anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, uh, incredibly stupid from basically everybody involved, not using any of the obvious strategies, and then... There's more to this bomb, but we'll talk about it once we know more about the person who set it up, I suppose. Um, Ethan's side of things, he and Grace realize that the buyer is dead. Uh, good old Mantis has killed him. And why? That's going to be what we talk about next. Oh. Why did that happen? Hmm. Um, yeah, so let me help it, you out. It's all part we, of the prediction. <laughs> he works for Gabriel. Gabriel works for the entity. The entity must have thought he had the key and sent Gabriel to get it from him. And then he sent pa Paris slash Mantis, whatever, to get it. And so she went up to him, shot him, killed him, and then realized he didn't have the key, which means the entity was tricked by... A fake. Uh, I guess a fake, yeah, but like, why... How did any of that happen? All of this has been over digital communication. The fucking Ethan team confirmed it's a fake before that even happened. And the entity's listening to everything. How did this happen? Well, Why did the entity get tricked by this? The entity is the only conceivable entity um, that could actually have a complete and unbroken chain of evidence to know which the original key was, because yeah. it's the only one that knows the precise location of where the submarine went down. So it would be the only thing that could tell which keys emerged from roughly the place where the submarine went down, and so which keys which emerged later in Saudi Arabia happened to have come from that place, and so on and so forward until we get to this point. The entity shouldn't be able to be tricked by this, but the fact it shouldn't be able to be tricked by it means that none of this should happen anyway, because it should already have found a way to get the keys. Do you know what makes it even funnier? Is that Grace is the reason all this is kind of fucking up, and Grace was sent by the White Widow, who is the broker between the entity and people who have the keys. As in, the White Widow technically works for the Entity, and she's accidentally subverted the Entity. Good plan. Pretty funny, especially with the Entity knows all of this and somehow fucks this up. The Entity should be dominating, and it's falling apart. I don't know what's going on. It's really weird. Um, so, anyway, Ethan just puts the key, and they show us very deliberately that he puts the key into his pocket. And again, it's just like, man, I really wish that had some more security in some way. Just then, uh, instead just of right it. in the pocket, especially when especially you, you're walking yeah. around with a pickpocket who's excellent at her job. Yeah, I don't know. I it almost you you must think that oh, a pickpocket is going to pick my pocket. I should not put important things um, in my pocket. But yeah, Benji eventually looks around the bomb and he spots that the word "good luck" has been spelled out without the K, and so then he spins the wheel to match the K, and it's just. It hurts. And it's like hidden it's like hidden on the bottom too, which I feel is like a little like that's Well it's weird, weird because like, uh, had he not done it in time, nothing would have happened. There was nothing in the bomb. So That was a cool five seconds of tension though. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> uh well, you know what was funny sorry, something I missed to say is when they have that fifty ish seconds of figuring out what to do with the last wheel, um Luther says, This must be your final test. What the hell is he talking about? The final test is looking lower on the cylinder. But, like, it's the most useless thing to say to someone ever. It's like, I've been given, presumably, we didn't see them, but seven questions to spin several wheels, and now we've got one wheel left. How do I spin it? And you just go, that's your final test. <laughs> You're like, thanks, thanks Luther. We've got 50 seconds left. <laughs> Why are you wasting my time? Say something useful. Uh... So yeah, as Rags mentioned, it's just so fucking screwed up that they tell Ethan when he literally can't do anything. You may as well just let it blow up without him knowing so that he could at least enjoy those last few seconds of his life not knowing what the fuck's going on. Uh, and yeah, they say we didn't want to bother you. You had a lot going on. Is the quote. Yeah, you know. You know, you gotta, mm. just, you gotta manage those stress levels with your secret agents. You don't want them... I mean, like, you know, I don't know, uh, I feel like I'd want to know, and I'm not even a secret agent guy, and, you know, I, I get stressed out, as we all do, but I feel like I'd, I'd rather know. Uh, they, their interruption, by the way, is to try and picture this, Ethan can't do anything, like, he just has to listen and hope the bomb doesn't go off, 
and he doesn't realize he gets pickpocketed and Grace leaves his area completely. He, he wasn't hanging on to her, he wasn't holding her arm or anything. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Luther cannot do anything other than look at his laptop screen, which right now is fixated on Ethan and, and uh, Grace. He misses that she not only steals the key, but walks away. He's got no alerts for that, he doesn't see any of it, it just, it just done. And it's not the entity subverting him, because they show us that Grace is on there, and then he like looks at the screen and goes, oh, Grace is gone. It's like, what were you looking at? What was there to look at? You guys had one oh, job. One I job. understand that it's stressful, because a bomb might go off at any moment. But I mean, hello? <laughs> like, but yes, Grace is gone now, and she's got the real key. Uh, so this is quite a catastrophe. Which does happen in a lot of the uh, Mission Impossible movies. They often end up giving the fucking important thing to the bad guys. Unfortunately. Uh, what a shame. So, uh... What a shame. That's, that's almost it for the, uh... Oh yeah, sorry. After that happens, Ethan looks through, like, a little area in the wall that's just visible, and he spots the agent people who look at him, he looks at them, and then he starts running. And he's just like, what are the odds of that? And then... Oh, oh no. That I was just thinking, him. wouldn't it have been a possible fix that if he was wearing a mask and then he looks at the agents and then like sort of does a shock and then turns around and starts moving away, that would actually give him away even though he's wearing a mask? You could actually play it that way. But it's, it's just not going to wear a mask anyway, so yeah. They've, you could, they've... of course, try to come up with something to where the agents are like really like, good at their job trying to catch him, and they and they do something that's actually really like clever or interesting that makes them, you know, especially from that point forward, being like, oh, like they might actually catch Ethan and crew if they're not, you know, at their A game, you know? They, these guys, these agents that are sent to capture him, they're pretty good. Um, they were looking for him. Yes. That's something that we uh, established when talking about this scene. There are, I think, eight agents, something like that, in an airport, spread out completely looking for him. And he happens to, right after Grace steals his key, to directly look at one of them in the face by accident. That seems As likely. Someone who, uh, someone who's recently in airports, uh, big airports, that's, uh, that's quite a coincidence. Airports are really big sometimes. And uh, Ethan, someone you might call experienced, maybe. Some of this before once or twice maybe that is these goons functional role in the plot though they just turn up to excuse the scene transition or to excuse the plot moving towards something else that's that they arrive very conveniently in exactly the right place at exactly the moment the plot needs them to do in order to send us off to the next scene they're always just about five seconds behind where they need to be but they're never more than five seconds behind where they need to be and they're never less than that either they just turn up when the film needs something new to happen oh look the comic relief duo have arrived time for the next thing yeah it's like a bit of extra stress and uh, I don't know, tension for free thrown on. Uh, this isn't even the first film that does that. We uh, we discovered it with yeah. the Ghost Protocol, right? It was a, a team of, was it Russian agents that just keep catching up Russian, with him? Yeah. 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 Keep, yeah, catching up and, and foiling his plans at the worst possible moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. So Gray starts getting on the plane with their real key. And I was just like, oh, so... If you're the entity right now, then you know that. You know all of this, because they're on the comms and all the different pieces of digital, all the cameras. You know everything. You know all of this. And so all the can... plane stuff is absolutely part of, like, networks. Absolutely. So airports use, what we yeah. see next of the entity is that they, he tries to use Gabriel to get to Grace when she's caught by the Italian police. Therefore, we can conclude Gabriel wants to get to Grace to get to the key. He says that explicitly with the Italian police. But why does the entity let that plane leave? Yeah, just like ground it, stop it. Yeah, like because I can off. I can teach the entity how to do this stuff because clearly it doesn't know how. What you need to do is just technologically just stop the airplane, just cut out all the power, whatever you want to do. You can just have it have errors, failures. Uh, then you send Gabriel in and you give him all the fake ID to make him the highest authority that could ever be in this airport for whatever reason. And then you can say that this woman is a known terrorist and I'm arresting her. And the you, power of Hacker Man. And then the you get the key, is, again, and then you drop her and go. That's it. Remember, the, the entity is presented as, like, capable of, like, quintillions of calculations. Hacker God. Hack end. It's yeah. just, like, in, immensely powerful and knowledgeable. The idea that it couldn't see that that was a better option. It's the only reason that that's not the case is because I wanted a set piece in Rome. 
It's, um, that's it. Yeah, that, that, that's that, the reason that's why it cool. happened. It's not because of any like actual sound plotting. Um, so it's bad enough on the entity side, but then you have the uh, the IMF side, and it's like, can they not hack the plane slash stuff to just give it errors so that it doesn't work, Hacks and then the get world. Ethan over there? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, all the because you have your pre-flight checks and your refueling and all that stuff. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. A and lot if, of things like, what if a fire alarm just goes I, off? In the I airport? was just about to say, what if Benji pulls the fire alarm? They have to get everyone out. They wouldn't launch the plane then, right? I mean, if you need to, just shoot a gun into the air. You uh, know, just no phone in fire alarm. Anonymous, just pull the fire alarm. anonymous <laughs> bomb threat. Phone in a bomb threat. That too. That would also. Mola, how do you account for the fact that the entity wanted Grace to go to uh to Venice? Why? Because it wanted. Because remember the choice. <laughs> Why? Remember? What? What does that have to do with anything? Why? Well, don't ask me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Because the answer to that question is the... Do not the ask the asker. I swear to God, if, you, if we're going to do the whole, yes, but the entity wanted everything to happen the way that it happened in this... Trust me, bro. Sources told me. Um, he uh, He's going to collect the key off her when she arrives in Italy. What difference would it have made if he had collected it off her before she arrived in Italy? Why does that need to happen? Mm -hmm. And if then he anything, fails that, by the way. Wouldn't the logical inference be, in terms of like the way that it all lined up, was that that was it changing its parameters and changing its goals we, and objectives? This, we do not see an, a Gabriel and a uh, everyone else who's aligned with the entity operating in the whole film as though everything's going to plan. We have the explicit and very cringeworthy Ethan, where he's really mad because Ethan has foiled his plans, which never should have happened. But we'll get to that. That's way later. But right yeah, now. He wanted to get the. He wanted uh, Mantis to get the key in the airport. She failed. That was the entity's goal. It fucked up, and it fucked up because of Grace, but, who was actually sent here by White Widow, who was in cahoots with the entity. So all of that is hilarious and stupid, and the entity should have known. And then the entity wants to get the key off her in Italy when she's under the police uh, custody. But sorry, what, am I am I fucking? Th it is it, it Italian police that's with her, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so hey, I could get a pizza. he comes in and he's like, you just took in a woman and did you get her inventory? Was there a key? That's what he asks him. He fails because right. she's already gone. Right. And what I'm saying right. is like, if that was, if the entity keeps fucking this up, because pa Mantis fucks up again in the car chase, why didn't the entity just do the easy things? We've, we've labeled several of them, but well, one of them is just the thing, stopping though. the airplane. Have you considered that the entity and villain man are trying to mess with Ethan and that that's their goal. You can't keep making these points when we see the entity fail. It wanted to get the key off the buyer, but it was taken already by Grace. Why would it send Mantis to do that unless it wanted the key? Well, and... remember, the entity knows everything that's going to happen, so it planned everything out what, meticulously what, what... <laughs> to play out in this way. Who, who is assisted including... by killing... That random buyer who is assisted by Gabriel randomly threatening, killing a, sec no, a secretary the, and threatening uh, the head of Italian police. What, what does that assist? It's the entity. He sees more than you do. Okay, he uh -huh. knows all. He sees uh -huh. all. He knows he's, all got sees grad, all. he's got a grand plan. That's you see, I think something together. that you forget about Mahler is that the entity works in mysterious ways. The entity's a fucking moron. He, he should have grounded that plane, was... taken the key, and he would have won really early because the White Widow had the other one. He could have gone straight to her, and it would be over. And I mean, of course, you know, if the whole goal is to mess with Ethan, the entity can, you know, like you don't need the keys to do that. <laughs> Well, it can succeed in protecting itself permanently and then mess with Ethan. Yeah. Why would you take the chance when you're vulnerable? Well, also, it's a hyper hyper intelligent AI entity. It can do two things at once. It can mess with him in a completely disconnected way by, say, magicking the appearance of a key in the pocket of some random who flies to Japan. And off Ethan goes chasing the complete wrong key at the same time as the entity solves its actual key problem by making the right decisions and I mean, locking yeah. up thief woman in the airport. So... It's, it's like, even if you assume that it is completely planned out from the beginning by the entity, the entity has made the worst conceivable decisions for something of its vast intellects that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't say... The, 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 the White Widow is a broker for the entity. The, the two buyers on offer at the time we get to here are actually Ethan and the entity. I don't know why, but they don't tell us about any more of them. There would be loads. That's the, that's the choice she has to make when we get to her, but we're not on her yet. 
Um, and yeah, I don't know how you're going to contextualize uh, Gabriel shouting like an anime villain as the entity wanted that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the CIA people are like, oh, he's got to be here somewhere. Oh, shucks, we lost him. Because all he does is run in a straight direction and he gets rid of him. Um, again, they Especially really feel in pointless. A, the, layout of a, the layout of an airport is such that it's not... You know, it's not like super open. There's generally like terminals and pathways well, to follow. The fact so is, right? They of... have someone on the cameras, so all they need to do is tell her the guy we are currently chasing. He may not look like Ethan on your cameras, but he is. Tag him. Tell us where he is. That would have been it. He wouldn't be able to escape because she would have him. I like Thinks you, about any stuff like that. <sighs> also, uh, Mantis killing that guy would be on camera. It's gonna be, there's just going to be a guy who was murdered in the airport and they can trace her on camera. Um, how many kills does Mantis get away with in this film? <laughs> like, no one gives uh, a shit about her. Stain character. And don't give me the entity bullshit. Eyes see her. People see her kill people. Police. And they don't seem to chase her or do anything about it. That's how good she is. That's how good They also she take is. the time to explain with Gabriel that the entity is erasing his presence in real time, but I don't think they ever establish that he's doing the same thing for her. You kind of have to assume that that's what's happening, except that she leaves a very visible trace that she has been there, as mentioned, because she's actually killing people. And that's without the fact that later on she goes on a much more publicly destructive rampage, yes. which you can't really erase from existence, no matter how much you try. She oh. hacked the world. We cut over to the old intelligence agencies, generally. I'm not sure if they're several or all, but they've made this big room that is running strictly analog and away from the entity. They're using shortwave radio, magnetic audio recording, cathode grade 2 monitors, Corona spy satellites from the Cold War. Kind of fun. Can you, can you have a completely analog don't system know. of exchange with a satellite? Is it just one huge wire? <laughs> no, it can be like radio waves or something, right? Yeah, it's there's so much we, I don't know about the difference between digital and analog that I'm willing to trust that they wouldn't reference these things unless they yeah, were considered like, analog technologies. Yeah, I, I assume it works. Yeah, before things were digital, we had ways of like communicating with. So yeah, like I, I assume it checks out mm -hmm. scientifically. I assume so. And they say, "Will this help us find Ethan?" And he says, "No, no one's going to be able to find him, but it will help us find this woman, and it's Grace." They're saying that uh, they're on her because they saw her talking to him, and they're hoping it'll lead them to Ethan, which I'm fine with. I think all that makes sense. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Are you sure? Yeah, that they're going to oh, find Ethan right. because they're hoping to find him through Grace. There you go, a scene that I liked. All right. Well, all right. So, Grace is collected by the police, and her multiple aliases from her passports are all exposed, and uh, the guy says, You've been sent here because Italian police received an anonymous tip matching your description telling us you'd be arriving on the afternoon flight from Abu Dhabi with multiple passports that all have crimes connected to other countries. So that means the entity did that. It dobbed her in, and it got her collected, so it's going to send Gabriel to pick her up then. Unfortunately, Gabriel is too late. Again, just a fail from the entity, which I don't know how it happens, but it does. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the airplane thing came up again, but you know, all right. Anyway, uh, Ethan then turns up posing as her lawyer, while the CIA FBI agent people also turn up to collect her from that scene we just mentioned. So everyone is here again, and uh, Mantis is also there because she's working for Gabriel, who works for the entity. So it's it's just everyone's here, and they've all got their ways again here. It all makes sense. Is um, it worth pointing out that, that Ethan is here, but at least if they followed his very clear instructions in the previous scene, Benji and his friend are not there because he specifically said that there is no rendezvous. They yes. have to separate. The mission is a failure. So they shouldn't be here. But they are. But they are. They will turn up in a minute. And they don't contact him. They just stumble into him. Very odd. Uh, it's a really small place, Italy. It happens all I the time. I guess they followed the carnage, but still, the carnage wasn't isolated, and Ethan was actually in secret by the time they bumped into him. You put the car in carnage. So, um, Gabriel turns up, and he says, I need to inventory the items uh, of, of Grace as a time of arrest. Which I thought was strange. I, I would have thought that would all be recorded by now, but um, it doesn't matter anyway, because she didn't have the key. Something we're about to find out. 
Uh, anyway, Gabriel says she left with a key, and then the the Italian police guy goes, "There was no key." And then uh, he's like, "Who are you?" And he's like, "I'm Interpol." And uh, the guy eventually says, "Like you're not Interpol." And, and Gabriel says, "I can if I want to be." I was just like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> "That's not how this works." <laughs> He says such cringe things, and he should be saying awesome yeah. things. You, well, it, w wouldn't it be just the, the, the notion that, like, every single thing that he's saying may well be, like, specifically curated uh, to, like, mess with any given person would be interesting to see how different his temperament is depending on who he's talking to, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, what does he even look like as a person if with one person he adopts one strategy and then with another person he adopts an into? You know, like in um, you remember in Rick and Morty the uh the the crystal that like predicts the future, and then uh and then when Morty just starts making all those weird sounds, like yeah. just go like ah, oh, like to try and make sure that he's going towards the right future, future yeah, to be like that, except not like quite like that. <laughs> well, well, that um, would be interesting, wouldn't it? To be fair, Gabriel should just be saying, where is she right now? And then the guy will be like, oh, yeah. uh, she's in that other room. And you'll be like, cool, and go straight in there, kill Ethan, take yeah. her, interrogate her until he gets the key. But, no, you know, but he, whatever. Needs to be, he needs to be cringe villain, man. Well, okay? so this is kind of his intro scene. So um, he says, we both know you've stolen things before. Now, to be fair, this is Gabriel to the Italian police commissioner guy. And he says, so I'm going to have to search you. His assumption, Gabriel, is from the algorithm, I guess, that this guy stole the key. Like, that's what the algorithm has concluded, so Gabriel's gonna have to search him physically, because obviously the entity can't do that. And so, the guy goes to call for help, and Gabriel stabs him in his hand, and says, your secretary is no longer with us. <laughs> and I again, like, yeah. why? What is with why'd this stupid dialogue, why'd man? Kill, why'd you kill the secretary? Also, why did you kill- did the entity not predict, like, hey, killing the secretary is probably a bad well, idea? No, he, no, yeah, it predicted that attention. that was what he needed to do. This is what that I mean. Was, oh, I, I okay. hate this kind of writing, where it's just like every stupid decision is like, actually, no. <laughs> like, it's the best <laughs> thing ever. Because like, actually, this is this is why I think it would make sense for him to go up to the secretary and be like, I am Interpol. Check the fucking computer. And then the entity goes, <laughs> and she's like, oh my god, you are Interpol. Go right ahead, sir. <laughs> Oh, you think that the way that it should work is, you know, it's kind of like, you well, know, like if... in Terminator 2, the T-1000 is able to maneuver through the world a hell of a lot easier than Arnie can. It feels like it should be like that, that it should be effortless for him to... Yeah, that he that's takes on the appearance difficult... of a police officer, which instantly oh, well... makes it easier for him to do that. Well, so that's in Terminator 2. Yeah, there's that. And then obviously all the disguises. I imagine that the thing here would be that because Ethan is like disavowed, he's like in trouble. It's It should be really hard for him. And it should be like effortless for uh, Gabriel. He should be able to like easily maneuver through the environment. He should know with, like, exactly well, what is required to say to the smallest exactly. and most efficient amount. Yeah, he, Not he only that, but, but doesn't it doesn't have the ability. It, it, can, it can really fuck up Tom Cruise's life immensely by fabricating an arrest record and publishing his face and his details and yeah. telling everyone to be on the lookout for him. So if yeah. he's walking around without a mask, then he's in real trouble because all the law enforcement agencies don't necessarily know who he is, but they know that he's got a fabricated uh, arrest warrant out for him. So they all want to try and catch him. And that's at the same time as the entity itself is posing as law enforcement, so it has no equivalent problems. And you solve all of this nonsense needing random blonde French people to go around driving Humvees through the streets of Italy destroying the police because you've been much more subtle and artful and careful about how you're going about things. And also, yeah, uh, if the entity uh, is able to plan all this stuff in advance, then he should have all of the fake IDs that he will need in the future already on him, ready to go. Uh, I'm just saying, now you are forgetting again, Gabriel is not a robot under the control of the entity. The entity needs him and he plays sick games. So like, so here, here's the problem, though. Like, when you present, like, a computer that is this intelligent, the computer should know how to manipulate him in a way that's advantageous to his goals. Not only it was that, kind of a, but... It was a thought I was having throughout the film, was like, well, let's put it this way. If we've got an entity that understands you better than you know yourself, it's a super-duper computer algorithm that has access to all the information it could ever need about you, and it can develop, like, a really accurate profile of you that is better than one that you could create for yourself, the entity should know the things that it could say to the people that it's got under its control, to manipulate them to... It's the problem when you present something this powerful. Yeah, it shouldn't it even should be using... Be uh, first, it shouldn't it be shouldn't using be... Gabriel if this is an actual problem. It, it, Second, it, yeah, pro uh, exactly. the film doesn't support this. Gabriel uh, seems to actually have a real-time assessment of uh, determinism. Yep. We see that happen exactly. once, which yep. throws everything out of whack, because it means, like, wait, is Gabriel the entity? Is he an android? What the fuck? But we'll have to find out in part two what the hell they're doing with that. 
Um, we will get messages beamed into him via a coffin. Maybe. I think I remember that. Yeah. Happening. Well, an earpiece, maybe the entity is like, by the way, this is happening. Do this. This is happening. Do this. We don't know yet. Maybe they'll give us the answer in part two. We'll uh, talk more about that when we get to the scene that it regards. Thirdly, if Gabriel were just a crazy person doing all this stuff, it's still not wise to do what he did. Like, I don't believe he would want to do that. He doesn't even well, want to I mean, stab the, the fucking police commissioner. Well, yeah, he only does if, it because he goes if, to try and get for help. He says he just wants to search to him. That's all. If the motivation is to mess with Ethan, why does he want to fuck with all these random people he's never going to meet again? Like, well, and if, the, if the motive is that he wants to fuck with people in general, cause suffering, he just loves to do it, then like, wouldn't we see way more of that? Why are we seeing exactly. so little of that? The reality is it's inconsistent and bad. Yeah, like, <laughs> I know you don't want to have to deal with this, but, like, the film fucked itself over with the Entity. The Entity is too powerful, um, and it's like the film doesn't fully grasp what it's created in, in this, uh, computer. It's the same, it's, again, it's like the problem with Ultron, the same, similar problems with Ultron, not quite the same. Where it's just like, dude, it's too smart. It's like a hyper, super duper, ultra, like the amount of information that this thing has at its disposal is like astounding that it could be making such simple mistakes. Well, he's also a moron with the, the police guy, right? Because what he's coming in there to do is find out if this guy pocketed the key. That's all mm -hmm. he wants to do, which sounds like it just sounds goofy anyway. But the police guy says, like, there was no key. And so Gabriel's like, yes, but according to the algorithm, you'd be the kind of man to steal the key because you've stolen stuff before, so i got to check your pockets. How fucking stupid does that sound? Like, okay. <laughs> but the police commissioner guy's like, you're insane, and I'm calling for help. And then he stabs him. That's why he stabs him. He's like, I'm going to check your pockets one way or another, mister. This is like, this is so silly. But Is Gabriel the only, Gabriel's not... Like, what if Gabriel came in there with, like, some other people who were dressed as, like, Interpol uniformed people, and so it looked a bit more official and more important, and it wasn't just this one guy coming in claiming to be Interpol? The guy asked for if ID. Did it, like, if he had his if the, faked ID, If he gave the he ID, get, and then... he had people with him, then it'd be like, oh shit, this is actually Interpol, and I might, the jig might be up, I need to give back what I took. Yeah, but I still, the funny thing is, he didn't take the key, because there was no key, because the fucking algorithm managed to account for this guy possibly pickpocketing it, but not Grace put-pocketing it. You know what I mean? Like, you can't explain that. Uh. That whole sequence is actually completely unrelated to Ethan. It is just a failure on the part of the entity. Why? I think the entity isn't too powerful because Ethan does point out that it's afraid. The entity is just a more human with more additional info than the rest of the human populace. The problem is, like, if it's got this much access to information that can sort it that quickly, it's not a human. Also, it's afraid because of one of the possible outcomes is that it loses. Yeah, which, you know, like, I guess that's valid. The idea that it's like a human, though, it's also, I not. find this, I find this hilarious. It's People are like, it's not a god, time, guys. So. It can't predict to that level. It's like, we were just the shown film... that it can, and we will be shown. There is a quote, and this is, again, something Metal highlighted, and I found it so fucking bad when he did. Gabriel says, at one point in this film, I don't have to worry about the keys, because tomorrow it will be laid at my feet. And then, sure enough, the day after, the key is laid at his feet. Do you guys remember yeah. how that happens? The entity predicted all of that through the, determinism. The, whole, the, something that's super, the film makes it pretty clear that that's the way the entity works. It's just yeah. making predictions about the future and that those yeah, predictions like, are really accurate because of the amount of information that it has access to. Up to the point, up to like the routes, yeah, that people will take through a city as they're the running. The whole film is about this. It's all pre it's predicting yeah. everyone's behaviors. Mm -hmm. Why? Like, I'm surprised There's everyone's pulling the card of like, it ain't God. It's like, it predicted that one of either girls would die. Yeah, and it's then it better. got, like, exactly right. Yeah, and, and so now gets, we're highlighting the, there's times where it gets it completely course, wrong, where it absolutely shouldn't. It's just being a moron. And then there's, of course, this is all putting to one side, not only the predictive power, but just the abilities that it has to influence the world through its use of technology, because we see the way that it can, in real time, like, alter security camera footage, Spoil it later on in real time, imitating different people, um, manipulating like technology, hacking into things, disrupting yep. things. Like it's incredibly powerful. It's mm -hmm. immensely powerful. 
and it's, it's the, the marriage of those one. two things the marriage of those two things really doesn't work because it's one thing to say it has immense predictive ability but no ability to influence the world and therefore engineer a particular course of action but that's not what the entity is the entity is meddling in the world the entity has immense agency the entity can close off all avenues for predictions it doesn't like via the actions it takes within the world itself meaning exactly. that really if the entity is as powerful as we're told it is and as we're shown it being repeatedly there is absolutely no reason it should end up in a position where it's afraid of a failure point because it should have precluded the possibility of that failure point already true but it didn't because then we wouldn't have a film um we find out that Grace doesn't have the key because while she was on the airplane, she put pocketed it into a random guy, and she exchanged numbers with this guy and said that, that they will meet in a particular place later, which is relatively clever in any other film. The problem in this one is that she is digitally connected with this guy, and the microphones would have been on in their phones, meaning the deal she made with him to meet him is now something all the, the entity knows all of that. Doesn't act on it, though. Uh, the entity yeah. should know about that guy already and it should uh, consider him a person of interest that she went onto this airplane spoke to him and said I need to meet you specifically later and then she doesn't have the key I wonder where the key is hmm but maybe they had their phones on airplane mode <laughs> <laughs> um so I yeah I don't know that's the thing I suppose that the entity couldn't yeah. figure that one out either uh so Ethan then starts talking to Grace about her sort of history and what he thinks about her and what he thinks that she should do next, which I thought was kind of interesting considering she's been caught. Police could come in at any moment and he's most wanted by the American intelligence agencies and who knows how many other people at this point. He needs to get out. To go. But he wants to talk to her extensively first. She even suggests that they get out and he's like, oh, I'll get you out once you tell me where the key is. Like, you should go, man. It's gonna get bad. And then she says, by the way, your friends are here. And he's like, oh, why did you tell me about them? And I was even thinking the same as her. It's like, she doesn't even know if she is on your team. And if they're against you, I don't know, that might be helpful. It's just like, you should have just got her out. It's kind of where I'm going. It's okay. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, get her out. Bad place to be. You got people coming after you. Um, that list is growing. So she explains how she got onto the key. Says the contact with her client, that'll be the, the White Widow, was almost entirely encrypted texts, except a drop that was given with a ticket to Abu Dhabi and a picture of Ethan. Meaning, everything she knew about the, the guy that she was going to be uh, pickpocketing, I guess, and the drop and where it was going to be happening was, dis or at least the job was discussed in texts, which the entity would have had access to, even if they are encrypted. Doesn't matter, it gets everything that's digital. And so that must be... Like, like, what did the entity learn from that? Like, surely it would have been able to trace that it was the White Widow that was organizing Grace. And thus, Grace is the one that gets in the way of Mantis in the airport. Feels just completely off. I don't know if if anyone remembers. I, think, I, don't, I can never tell the difference between them forgetting who knows what or who's working for who, or just how much the entity would know when they tell us it's, like, worldwide spanning and access to all networks of everything. Yeah, it's a bit messy, and they're a bit inconsistent with it, so... One of those, like, is this in universe or is it just bad writing? I don't know. But of course, this is where we find out that the only reason Grace was able to pickpocket the guy is because she was told to chase the guy that Ethan was chasing. And therefore, if Ethan had worn a mask, Grace wouldn't be able to do anything. She wouldn't even be in the plot. Out. Another awkward bit, because there's every reason to wear a mask and he just didn't for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, also, the drive was empty. The crypto uh, money. I don't. Th this is very casually said, and I don't know what we're supposed to gain from it. Like she was the, promised that he'd have a drive that she could steal, and it would or... have a payment on there, but it had nothing on there. Is it? Are they implying that the entity took the money so she couldn't use it? I don't know. The, the weird part is that uh, it's the entity is what's being brokered with with the White Widow, so I don't know why that would help the entity rather than hinder it. Uh, because it's a funny meme. Okay. Oh, well. See, because then enough. she gets it and it's like, oh, damn, there's no money. And the entity is like, ha 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 ha, gotcha. Um, a lot to think about, you know. The funny meme would be like, I will pay you with an NFT. 
and then <laughs> lo and behold, it's worthless. Oh no! But no, I don't. Th- I don't really understand why it would have removed all of the money, given that we were told right at the beginning of the film that it's in control of the stock exchange and the global financial system. It's not exactly short for cash, um, and it would get her off of its. Like sh- she would then become a much more predictable asset, wouldn't she? Like she completes the entire purpose that was set out for her, is paid off, is then for all intents and purposes, out of calculations. There's no point continuing to accommodate her because she's done her job and she's moved on and she's got what she wanted and that's it. So they leave. Gets her out of there. But Grace, very cleverly, uh, says, I can't remember what she says, but she implies to a bunch of men around them that he, Tom Cruise is, is being abusive to her. And so they all protect her. I thought this was fucking stupid as hell. They're in a criminal justice building, and he is acting as her lawyer, and she was just arrested. Like, why would that work instead of just him being why like, she's a fucking go? criminal, I'm her lawyer. You guys, like, you're all trying to be white knights? Like, seriously? And It's so bizarre. Like, she, why wasn't she in cuffs? Like, why would Ethan have released her from the cuffs? She was, I'm pretty sure she was in them. I guess he got the keys and then uncuffed her? Because they took out a bunch of uh, police. We Paper find that clip, out once the... Right? Sorry? Or was that? Wait, wait, when does the paperclip thing come in? That comes in. Oh, later, that does right? come in. But I, you know, what I'm at, at that point, she is in Ethan's custody, but doesn't have cuffs on. If she took them off herself, he would obviously put them back on and be like, "What the fuck did you?" You know what I mean? Like he wants to keep her in cuffs. She, she's can't be trusted right now. But then the fact that she isn't, she's able to sell immediately that he's just a, a guy trying to abuse her, and so they get separated. I thought it was so fucking out of nowhere. It's just like, how are you doing this in this building? Do these guys not? know anything? Does, and Ethan doesn't even try to say he's her lawyer, or that she's a criminal. Uh, does not. he say that? I think he does say that he's her lawyer, right? He does yeah, try I that, think but they don't care. Well, if he does, care, none of them care about it. Either he yeah, doesn't say it, or they don't give a shit. Which... No, I, I, I'm pretty sure he does say it, and they block him. They don't care that he said it, yeah. But why? <laughs> well, now we know how the Italians think about law and order, I guess. That's so much worse. I was kind of hoping that he didn't say it. Anyway, because uh, you'd think that all of them would be related to criminal justice. They wouldn't just be random civilians. It's the police building, correct? Uh, I mean, I uh, guess... Would you say that the I think they're still be, in there, yeah. I mean, regardless of whether he says that she's her lawyer, if she, if she wants to get away from her lawyer, you know, that doesn't really change anything, right? Well, I guess then he should have said she's a criminal. I, that probably would have been a better... That would have been a better line to go with, I would say. But also, I mean, there's still... Uh, why, yeah, yeah, sorry. I guess I'm just turned around. I should be saying he he needs to appeal to why she shouldn't be able to escape, which is that Pretty she's much. a criminal. Yeah, rather than... Because he lawyer, still could be a Harvey Weinstein lawyer. <laughs> he could still That could still be true. I guess it could well, still be yeah, true even if she's a criminal, but like that's not something that any of them entertain. They just Well, the, the thing is, is that he should be pointing to more urgency in terms of, like, her and, and her being a criminal, rather than directing more attention to himself. That's, a, like... Th- like him but she should a, also it, be it in cuffs, right? Anything. Uh... Yeah, I mean, be, yeah, probably. Because yeah. this would that would solve a hell of a lot of these problems. Of course, yeah. Because at that point, it would just lend a lot of legitimacy to Ethan saying, like, oh, yeah, don't let her get away. Um... Yeah, all right. Uh, action ensues. We got our, we got our action. Uh, action. There's both a car ready to steal and a motorbike ready to steal. So she gets in the car nice. and gets on that. Uh, They're just laying around. Th- that is often the case in all these movies. There's always just a car ready to go. Um, it's Maybe usually... the real world is really like that, and I just don't think about it because I don't think about stealing cars. Yeah, yeah, that could be it. I haven't stolen any. Cars I haven't in stolen my life. a car. I I don't think so. I don't think I've stolen a car. But maybe it's because I just don't think about it, and I'm not a car thief, that I don't go around the world with that kind of lens on, you know, noticing all of the cars that would be so easy to steal. Uh, he tries to get her attention, and I think he tries to wind up her window, and because she's doing that, she's not focusing on the road, and she actually gets, uh, I think, T-boned. Um, gets spun there, around. There's a few bits in, in this chase which are again slightly tricky if if you want to run with the idea that the entity predicts absolutely everything up until the point of their meeting because the more times there's a very very near miss or someone gets hit by a car but survives because of luck by definition the less predictable that thing is 
So if, if that car had rammed into her at a slightly different angle or at slightly higher speed and she died or become badly concussed or something, or if he hadn't jimmied his way out of the, the uh, handcuffs later on before he gets smacked by a train, like there's all of these little variables that come in that make it virtually impossible to predict the outcome except by recourse to luck. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And a lot of people are saying, like, aren't these in every Mission Impossible? It's like, and they'll be mentioned every time. There's films that don't do it, and they get more credit than the films that do. That's how it goes. Um, a lot of action films will rely on crazy contrivances in the middle of action scenes. And I like to point out when the action's awesome, and when the action's not as awesome. Yeah, not all action scenes are created equal. Consider so why. Uh, you have Mantis arrives with three goons. Uh, Tom Cruise takes out two goons with his bike and uh, like rams the third goon's head into the window to knock him out. But then the agents arrive, and there's four of them. And then Mantis, uh, oh, the the sorry Italian police arrive, and I believe there are three of them, maybe two. Feels like there should be a hell of a lot more. I don't know why only one car for the po Italian police shows up. And then mm -hmm. Mantis takes uh, the gun off one of them after she beats them up, kills another one, and then kills two of the agents. She's, she's, she's going killing. What she do? And uh, then there's like a shootout until uh, Tom Cruise and Grace escape. -y. It was just a, kind of a fun moment of so many different factions competing so hard that it gives our heroes an opportunity to escape. That kind of scenario. So, I don't know. It's just... A little awkward, like, like uh, Mantis has some severe plot armor. People kind of avoid taking her out a lot of the time, especially in that moment. Uh, or they're just not good enough to take her out when, if she got tagged like once, she's an incredibly annoying problem throughout this whole film for our main characters and just and manages to get away. this is the most away. prominent, uh, and, and I think from this point out, the only people working for the entity are Mantis and... Uh... Mantis and um, Gabriel. Gabriel? Is that it? There's no more? Do we ever see another henchman? I I guess we assume one's driving the tractor later at the train thing, but is that it? There's no um, more goons? No more There's no another more goon in the alley when they have that alley fight. Oh, yeah. I think, that, right. I think that's the last oh, and, one, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But we well, never really get a sense of how big this cyber death cult really is. It's just, do I we need a more goons? They seem to work, yes. I'm guessing it's like meant to be part two is maybe we'll yeah. get more of a reason as to why Gabriel's doing this, which, again, there could be like an actual interesting motivation there, but I'm, I don't know, based on what we've seen now, I feel like it's going to be lame, whereas it could be interesting if he's like, <sighs> dude, like, this AI is really cool, man. Like, he's going to be in charge and he will take over and... And he sees all, knows all, he has all the information, he can make all the... You could go for, like, the sort of deus ex route, like the machine god that knows all people's so well that it can take into account all of their interests, their wants and their dislikes, and uh, form conclusions based on that. But I feel like, based on what we've been presented here in terms of an exploration of AI, I think it's going to be lame. It's also an exploration <laughs> of villain motives. Mantis is, is a good warning against expecting too much of part two, because... For her most part in this film, she's just generic blonde psycho killer, and she drives huge cars through piles of cars and causes massive destruction while laughing, and that's basically all there is to her, right up until the point when she decides she's now good, and that's and the reasoning behind that is just laughable, uh -huh. and then we never really get anything from her again, from what I recall anyway. So like she is never really going to be properly explained, be and then back. that, uh, yeah, but then. Yeah, if if one of your principal agents for the for the entity is this unformed throughout the entire film, you never really get a sense of well, also, like she's so susceptible to be changed, as we find out later. Then how reliable is his plan of relying on his cyber death cult? Given that apparently they their motives are only to cause destruction and death until they decide they don't want to do that anymore. Hmm. Uh, well, we could talk a bit more about her before it goes on, but you are correct. As of this selection of scenes. She's laughing, like cackling as she's killing everybody in certain moments. Uh, she, she seems, the way the film's going is that she's crazy. Uh, seems like she's in this for a lot more than the entity winning. She enjoys doing the whole killing people thing. Um, it's like Crumbopulous Michael, Crumbopulous Mantis. He seems to operate a little more respectfully than she does. I yeah, he's, he's more chill. He doesn't cackle and laugh as he does it. Just... <laughs> No, no, Crumbophilus Michael, he was just there for like two minutes, and then he died. The best he character. made such an impression in those two minutes. <laughs> um, 
So they uh, their car is kind of compromised. They they want to get another one, and uh, Ethan has an app on his phone to find him a good vehicle that you know, like th this one was tough to understand. I didn't know if this meant that it was a spy car that the wow, app takes you to a spy like car. If it's an IMF card, like, would he even have access to those kinds of things anymore? You think that there's, there's, there's so many, like... Well, would the AI have access to the phone? Well, so the, access the main concern is the a, entity. It's an analog uh, phone. Well, yeah, so it's, it's um, because it's something that happens later in the film, but it's probably worth touching on now. When you got, like, self-driving cars or cars that have some kind of remote control or self-driving capabilities, with surely Ethan technology. would have a thought in the back of his mind of, oh shit, what if like, it hacks they into do, this and though. clouds me off a cliff? They make a joke about it, and it's so fucking painful. May as well bring that up now, there's no reason not to, it's not like it's prompted mm -hmm. by anything, it's kind of isolated, but there's a point in this film where Benji's driving, but he needs to use his laptop, so he moves to the passenger yeah. seat and turns on autopilot. He looks at the autopilot, and the, like, we look at it, and then he goes, and puts on his seatbelt. The implication being, ooh, what if the entity killed me by driving Which, this into uh, a wall? And it's like, you can't, that's not funny. That's the drama no, that's of the whole like fucking a, film. A legitimate point. As soon as he did that, all I thought was like, wait, are you gonna, like, get killed here? <laughs> like, is that what's about well, to happen? Well, how lame would that be? If the entity just spud the wheel and he went off a cliff, we'd be like, oh. oh I mean, it would, it would be incredibly lame for Benji, the tech guy, to give his self-driving car and then it gets taken over by the entity and it, it plows him into a wall. Well, they'd, they'd never, like, kill some kind of legacy character so arbitrarily, I don't think. That's true. No, I, I don't do. think they would do that. That would be baffling. That would be a strange decision for them to do that. Especially if you'd only had like five lines up to that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that'd be... Yeah. But yeah, um, of course, first thought with using an app on his phone was just like, so the entity's just not going to let you find anything. But it does. It's like, okay. But then, as, as Free just mentioned, like, if this is an IMF related thing, like, should the IMF be alerted th to this? Like, oh, he's using this, but then maybe they won't be because they're not using their digital stuff anymore. I don't know what the fuck's going on. He gets a car. And then they have jokes about how he can't quite start it up because he's not familiar with this uh, set of controls. And a little bit of bonding for him and Grace, which I feel like I should have done a little bit more effort into saying that her performance has been great so far. Um, uh, and, hell yeah, well. And the. The brief moments of they've taken some advantage of characterizing her during these scenes. It's not like it's not just I don't know robotic. She's uh, she is quite a like she's obviously lived a life where she's not trusted a single person. Doesn't believe what he's doing is. Uh, but she's uh, she's quite unique in this slate of Mission Impossible characters. Never quite had anybody quite like her. Which is kind of funny to say because her backstory is exactly the same as the girl from the second movie. Uh, yeah, it is, but her What's temperament her name, Molly? is different. <laughs> well, yeah, we. I, mean, I don't know if that's worth mentioning right now, but for those who don't remember, which is pretty much everybody, um, Tandy Newton in the second Mission Impossible is a like world class thief that uh, he incorporates into the IMF because he's told to because she has a connection with the villain. And but he, you know, those skills come in handy, blah blah blah. And uh, he nearly gets her killed, and the film becomes about how he needs to make sure he saves her because it can't be that like it's all because of him dragging this girl into this whole fight and then having her die. So weird that none of that gets referenced in this film when that's what this film's about. And it, I haven't even mentioned weird. it's legitimately strange. I haven't even mentioned Mission Impossible 3 <laughs> with that. That happens in the opening a girl who's brought in specifically by Ethan. Trained by Ethan, recommended for field work by Ethan, and he fails to save her because he runs out of time. None of that's mentioned either. Really strange. I wonder if Macquarie has rewatched those movies in recent times, because I can understand people forgetting that that's what happens in them. I think people forget what happens in all the Mission Impossibles, if I'm being completely honest with you. Yeah. Anyone remember the name of the tech guy in Mission Impossible 1? <laughs> How about the helicopter pilot in Mission Impossible 2? How about the what field the agents the in Mission Impossible in Mission... 3? And what was the name of the villain in 4? <laughs> Nobody knows that, Fringy. Why would you ask that? Yeah, it's just... Yeah. So anyway, they get in the car. They start uh, they start driving off. Um, it's, it's just, the car chase itself is entertaining. It's a tiny car and they've... they've you know, fucked up with having their hands connected by uh, cuffs because Ethan doesn't want to lose her. But of course, she has pocketed yeah, a yeah. paper clip earlier. We saw it too. So, how long is that gonna last? Who knows? I don't know. It's a fun car chase for the most part. 
going around. Look at the little Fiat. That's cute and fun. It was a funny little joke when they're, they're they're going for the car, right? And there's a supercar next to it. And, and it then it's out. the little yellow Fiat that comes out. Like, that was fun. Uh, Mantis gets back on their trail because they are tagged by a, a camera that recognizes, I think, Ethan's face. And then that's sent to the police. And then she overhears that on her police radio that's inside the truck she stole. Which was confusing me because I would have thought the entity would have been able to tell her where they are. Or Gabriel. I assume they have communications of some kind. Why wouldn't they? Um, and the, he's got a phone, so the entity will know where Ethan is at all times. I, you know, I just, but I don't know yeah, if they've, well, it's fine, I guess. Um, when they're driving, Ethan has to avoid a, a baby carriage, and so he does swerve hard and it rolls the whole car over. And I've seen uh, a couple people complain about this, this part particularly, that they switch places when falling. What did, what did you guys think about it? I was kind of, kind of like, ah, ah. Hmm. That's all I got for you. It's kind of like, yeah. oh, eh. I saw someone very angry at it. <laughs> oh, I, I, okay. I don't know if it's worth getting, like, very angry at. No. That's how I felt. I was like, I mean, you know, it's whatever. The fact is, there's probably... reasons to be pissed off by this film. That is probably not <laughs> Slow in my the top list, yeah. 50. Yeah, don't worry about it. Sorry. Um, no, then... I have a little fun, might not. Because uh, 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 Grace is now driving again and she's panicking, she um, starts to do donuts essentially, and she sees the smoke coming and she assumes that's from the car and so panics even more, like uh, assumes the car is on fire, she says. And then Ethan's like, no, 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 it's the tires and he's trying to fix her up, but she keeps spinning in circles. Mantis can't fuck them up because her car stalls, which I thought was a little lame. It's like, oh, okay. But it gives you At a comedic payoff. At least it payoff. happened after it went down the big stair bump and she makes a big jump, right? She makes a big jump down the stairs. And it's it something for sure, but of course it's, it's still like something. the one time yeah, it's not, they yeah, couldn't escape it's not. her is the one time she stalls. Um, yeah, it would be, yeah. It, you know, you could still have it a comedic beat if they both stalled and they're both looking at each other while they're both like putting next the keys to each other, in. Trying to get yeah. Their, yeah, yeah, trying to get the, their cars started. Yeah, that, that would be kind of funny. Um, Especially because this is, yeah, again, right after they both, you know, careen off the stairs. Which, mm -hmm. by the way, in the credits, at the very end of the credits, they have a special note about how they actually didn't fuck up the actual Roman stairs. <laughs> they, they, they built a replica of it, you know, for the stunts and everything. <laughs> Don't worry, we didn't actually fuck up the famous Roman stairway. <laughs> which, I thought was, which I thought was you know, actually abusing in the credits. Um... So they end up driving down one area and then back another, and they look like they're stuck, but Ethan reverses and turns into, like, this narrow alleyway, and uh, they come out the other end on a train track. Um, the weird part is that we don't see anyone catch up to him uh, for the whole time Ethan's there, even though they very clearly went that direction, you know what I mean? Like, any cops getting out of their cars and running down there would eventually catch up to him pretty easily, especially if they know that that just leads to a train track, so they ain't going anywhere, you know, the, the car will be stuck, is what I'm saying. You'd think they would have been followed, but nobody comes in after them on that way. Um, however, uh, unfortunately, she has, uh, you know, lo pick, picked the lock on the cuffs and attached it to the wheel of the car now. So she's free, and Ethan's stuck. Um, this did get talked about in Open Bar. The, some people see it as a, a knock against her character that she practically leaves him for dead and doesn't care. I'm willing, I think, to say that she did not realize the train was coming. She probably wouldn't have cuffed him to the wheel if she thought that was... She She throws the paperclip at him. I think she assumes he can get himself out pretty easily. Yeah, just um, like to buy yourself more time. Buy some time. I don't know. I think, yes, against that, though, you're stuck and you're on a train track and it's reasonable to assume that there might one day be a train that's coming past well, so and you don't know how far away that is. I think the best um, counter argument is she would have known when she was leaving, she would have heard it. So she should have been like, oh fuck, oh god, if, if he can't get it and like turned around and felt guilty and maybe come back to make sure he's out. You don't get any of that, you just, she leaves. So it's still, it's, it's murky, it's not great. Because uh, he's done nothing but essentially look after her at this point. He's he's never he's not like sabotaged her. He's sabotaged him several times. So the idea that she would kill him seems a bit harsh. Um, I don't think that was her goal at all. I don't think that's what we're meant to conclude her goal was. No, um, I the I most think that you could conclude was that it was reckless. That would be that would be what I'd say. No, the most that's you can conclude is she chose to leave him for dead. Oh, uh, okay. 
not that she was wanting to kill him, that she was like, if he dies, he dies, which is still pretty Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. I, I got you. I got you. Mm, yeah, his oh, death, yeah, while, while handcuffed to a, a steering wheel on a train track, his death is a reasonably foreseeable consequence for that. Now, she, she can say, well, he is quick-witted and talented, and probably he can get out, but the fact is she doesn't know for sure he can get out in time, so at least is willing to brook his death as a possible consequence. Well, and the fact is, he should have died. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the way that it's shot, it looks like he's still in the car when I guess, uh... Um, it is fucking weird. I, I had to check it a couple times, so I wasn't entirely sure, but yeah. He goes to try and pick the lock, he can't do it, so he tries to lift the wheel off, and he can't do it. Then he looks at the train, the train's about, give or take, eight meters away, and then it cuts to the train smashing the car, and he jumped to the side with the wheel off. So we're supposed to believe he did pull off the wheel, which didn't like look like he was able to pull that off when we to saw be him fair, doing it. Like to you... be fair, it is a Fiat. Yeah, but isn't it like a super duper, like IMF awesome Fiat? Still, some you know, it's <laughs> still, still a Fiat. There's, what, it's still a Fiat. A, a Fiat. That we, to you could just like yank poor, the parts right off. A you Fiat just... known to be of like poor quality. Is that like a known thing or a meme? I think they I, used to be known for breaking so. down all the time. Yeah, but... I think they have. They have a jokey reputation. I don't think it's like a serious one, but it's like a little joke sort of thing. You know. It's like a Simpsons reference. Do you remember? Right? And it's self-driving, so it's relevant. I'm serious. Oh. You remember that joke of the Simpsons where like Homer was going past it, it didn't look like anybody was driving the car, and then what was it? Lenny's like, oh look, he's got a self-driving car, and then it crashes it's like, yeah, an American self-driving <laughs> car. <Yeah. laughs> well, when he That's drives the electric car into water, he says, Don't worry, it's an electric car. Like that that would make it work <laughs> underwater. You remember the uh the, when they were all going to, uh, it was a, it's, it's a Wonderful Life, right? The reference, that guy, what's the matter with your kid? You told me this stream was shallow. Yeah. You remember that guy in the car? Why, I ought to, then he just keeps rambling as he sinks below the water and Bart just waves at him. And the final go, got... important reference is the yeah. electric car that they ride. It, pulls, it says oh. that if you ride me, you'll think people will think you're gay. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that was the uh, 1950s inspired, like the version of the future. Yeah. Hello, I'm an electric car. Your <laughs> shitty lame voice, and it says it can't go very fast or far. I can't go very fast or very far. There you go, everybody. There's all the Simpsons car references. Yeah, that's, all right. that'll be now. Oh, and then there was that car that Homer built. Remember the one oh, for yes. his brother, Homer Mobile, or whatever it was called. It was in uh, Simpsons Hit and Run, and that was really It was, there was, was a really decent cool. car in that. I think it was one of the better cars in the game. Um, anyway, yeah, and by the way, this to... is when Benji and Luther just drive past Ethan and go, Hey, Ethan. And he's like, Oh, hey. Yeah, and... just drive, bump into him in Rome, <laughs> the biggest city in Italy. They literally could have called him. He had his phone. Yeah, but oh well. Yeah. But it's not no, the biggest country in Italy. And then, uh, and this. Oh. This uh, oh, oh, seriously oh, oh, caught me oh, off guard. Oh, oh, oh. He's in the truck, sees Luther, camera pans, sees Benji, camera pans, there's Ilsa. Yep. And she smiles. And I remember thinking at this point, like, fuck yeah, where the hell have you been? Yeah, where have you been? There's been a You're whole like... movie, where the fuck? Like, damn. Where were you? <laughs> She's like the what second part? main character of this series. And... What part of No Rendezvous do you not understand? You're not supposed to be together, and also, you're definitely not supposed to be together that's here. That's true, yeah. That, that conversation doesn't happen. He doesn't say, no. what the fuck, guys? He just goes, hmm. And it's like, if you're gonna let them anyway, then why didn't you just work with them? And From the get-go, yeah. Um, so, they know from what she Grace told Ethan earlier that she's heading to the... It's like a building for... Uh, brokering things, and then they find out it's organized by the White Widow, and so she's likely the buyer. And, uh, then, um, Ilsa says, didn't she put a price on your head? Which, by the way, is in reference to Fallout, where he had a deal with the Widow, and he welched on it hardcore to complete his own mission. We never saw the Fallout of that, and now oh. Ilsa's telling us that apparently a price got put on his head, which makes a lot of sense. And then she says, she and Ethan worked it out. He never told me how. All right, then. This is like, well, problem okay. solved. <laughs> I guess that's better than nothing. <laughs> like, Carry on. Um, also, Benji says, does she still think you're John Locke? And then uh, his response is, maybe I am. Or something like that. And it's like, okay, but does she? 
<laughs> like, I mean, that's like a serious point, that, but okay. There's really good reason to believe that she wouldn't think that anymore after everything that happened in Fallout. It's such a... It's, like, there's so much of that in this film where they'll like make a joke out of a thing, but it's like clearly like, oh, but I actually need the answer to that. We actually need to make sure that... Okay, that's fine. We're doing funnies. Mm. Um, so they say we still need to find someone who knows what the key unlocks. And then uh, they presume like, well, you know, the bomb that got put in, into the airport by somebody, that somebody must work for the entity. And so uh, they start to figure out who that was as a sort of lead. And uh, Luther says he compares the feeds from the security cameras in the airport to the feed on Ethan's glasses, and he notices that there's inconsistencies, and they sort of arrive to create this optical illusion. I thought that was, like, really fucked up in terms of, like, damn, the entity sucks. Like, uh, Luther managed to see that you've, you've done a very bad job of trying to Photoshop someone out of, of a sequence of events, you know? You can see, like, all the remains of the artifacts and stuff. I was like, it's the fucking entity, man. I'm pretty sure it would know, and it would be able to do it pretty good. It did it in real time with uh, Ethan. Like, and it was perfect when we saw it, but when you see it on Luther's laptop, it's, like, really obvious. Like, okay. Range. And then uh, Luther points out that we can see him in the reflection, because the entity didn't see that coming. It didn't realize that you could, uh, it, it would have to scrub him from more than just him. It would also need to scrub his reflections. Does that sound like some of the mistake the entity would make? No. Really? It is no. the only potentially mitigating factor the fact that it, like, in real time, it's very impressive to be able to do any of this. Obviously, after the fact, it could have completed the job on, say, the CCTV cameras at the airport, but maybe not on the recordings they have. I mean, that's that's about, again, very multi quintillion calculations in milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, of all the other things it's done, it can, you know, override them or something. Um, and by the way, it's not like he's seen as glitchy and sort of see-through in the uh, reflection as though it, it tried but like couldn't quite get it right. It's that there's no attempt to clear him up from reflections. Like the entity doesn't know how reflections work, which I just don't buy or that. Or is it leaving its fingerprints? So <sighs> no, that's, that's the last it defense knows. someone tries. Actually, that was all on purpose. It's like, okay. How many to... times are we going to play that card? It was all on purpose, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh -huh. Oh, it's boring. <laughs> uh, so they're like, "Who is this guy?" And then Ethan says, "It's someone I thought died a long time ago in another life, before the IMF, before I was offered the choice. In a real sense, he made me who I am today." And it feels kind of odd because just... surely the movies are why you are who you are. We and it's something they don't bank well, on, which really annoys me. In Mission Impossible One. He loses yeah. his whole team at the beginning. His whole team loses. That's the big. That's the opening. That's the beginning of that story. That's he loses perfect. his team. He gets disavowed, and then the whole plot plays out from there. Why not? Re why not leverage uh, history that already exists in your franchise rather than creating brand new history? Because that's what Fallout did. Like Fallout, more so than any other uh, uh, any of the other films, like actually deals with the events of prior films. It yeah. makes them consequential and bakes them into the plot. Right, it's like the fallout of the prior, you know, films. Say, hey, isn't that cute? But yeah. it does. Why not leverage the? Uh, there's so much history in this series. It's six movies well, and the, and now. Seven. It's generally the implication I get. But had they not said this, I'd have been like, we got to see why Ethan is the man that he is because he lost all of his team, and he could, it could have been prevented had he been better, faster, stronger, that sort of thing. And the, as the movies go on, he loses people here and there and stuff, and so you know, Fallout making it about, like, you've nearly caused the end of the world by protecting your own team, and, like, he does absolutely everything he can, push to his limits to make up for that choice. It feels like Dead Reckoning should be about how he really, this time, actually has to choose, you know, like, a, a real and imminent threat or the sacrifice one of his friends. Like, that feels like the next step. Um, but instead, they do something else, and we'll get there. Uh, we, yeah, I... and, Oh. Someone in chat's point out something that I was thinking about as well. The weird thing about the recent Mission Impossible movies is that it loves to reference the earlier films with, like, the train and everything, but it doesn't want to reference the movie's plot or its influence. Like, because it feels like the train fight scene at the end of the film, yeah, like, that does feel like it's trying to be reminiscent of one. It's like, yeah, but what about the what about the story in one? I mean, you brought back uh, Kittredge as well. Yep. 
So it's like they're aware of that history. It's not like they don't know what it is, but I, I, I just find it strange that they've... M that you would invent new history instead of leveraging the immense amount of history that you have at your disposal. It also, it leaves itself an immense amount of work to do to make it seem anything other than contrived. That this guy yeah. who plays a pivotal role in Tom Cruise's very distant past also just happens to be the guy that this AI entity has chosen to be its like yeah. dark attire well, of cyber Someone would say to you, of course, the that reason exactly, it shows him is yep. because of that history. But that's just up for the second film again. to really make that make sense, because holy fuck. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. it's all... And then Ilsa gives us that huge expo dump where she says oh. that the um the entity makes sure that there's no history on Gabriel available, except for all of this stuff that I know about him, like the fact that he's a true believer and he considers himself the Darth Messiah, oh. and that he thinks death is a friend, and all that sort of cringe stuff. So, it's very and, cringe. and that's, that's all been told to her by her friends at MI6, so they already know who he is. That's None true, of that yeah. makes any sense, but it's still... The, the contrivance point is like he must surely believe in the pseudo religious aspect of the entity in order to play the character he's playing in this one. But how is that going to be squared with just the random act that he presumably committed in the past? Uh, this might be a because now it's come to when Muller and I were rewatching a uh, Fallout, a thought that we had was like, dude, they should have brought back Henry Cavill as like the villain, they shouldn't have killed him in that movie. Have him be the disfigured, you know, disgruntled, is hyper motivated by revenge and reincorporate him into this film, and then have him work with the entity. And so then you've got more of that real history that we got to see play out, rather than having us rely on history that we never saw, that we just have to infer with very minimal references or material. You can actually feed in the, uh, the goals of the syndicate were to create a, a peace, right? He could, you could easily get Walker to believe in the entity that the entity will bring about peace fully. It'll stop everyone from fucking fighting. It'll bring everything to a calm, and it'll uh, give humans exactly what they want. You, you could probably get it so that you have that angle, but then also how much he wants revenge on Ethan, and that the entity's promised him that. Uh, if yeah, the, can... the entity is manipulating him, playing on that angle. And then you so, can uh, use this film to start referencing all the people who've died in the other Mission Impossibles and how Ethan has just fucking walked on their corpses to get to what he wants, that sort of thing. Which, of course, is something that the film can then challenge in terms of referencing how how relentlessly Ethan tries to save people throughout the films. Well, yeah, and uh, we were talking about it earlier, I think you may have been uh, muted, but you know the bomb section? We were talking about how the questions could have been a lot more personal and interesting. If it had asked Benji, what does he truly think of Ethan? As a yeah. person, and we can get out of Benji the actual concerns he has about him being like, yeah, kind of yeah. crazy, kind of reckless, kind of unhinged. Well, kind of the same as like, um, because we got a brief glimpse of that right with Luther in uh, Fallout, where he's talking to Ilsa and sort of explaining, like, you know, the reason why all of this happened is because uh, Ethan, uh, essentially he wanted to save my life over, uh, like that was more important to him than the uh, getting the plutonium. And then, and then, like, sort of delving into the consequences of that, and that, uh, and then he, you know, he went on to say, like, you know, you should not be a part of this, also. You should, like, it, it, like that you could, we know that these guys, even though they obviously have an immense amount of respect for Ethan and they're super loyal to him, they obviously, to some extent, are going to have disagreements with the way that he goes about things and doubt. And then it just gives us more of an opportunity to give Luther and Benji something because they are underutilized. They're part of these films, but like, we don't. We haven't gotten nearly as much character for them over the course of several films as we got for Ilsa in two. Yeah. <sighs> so, uh, and as mm. for what I um, was just talking about, like, so the, he says there's no knowing him. He has no recorded past. The Entity made sure of that. He's a dark messiah, the Entity's chosen messenger. He sees death as a gift he wants to share with the rest of the world. You know, Mola, you need to read these lines like you think that they're good. <laughs> <laughs> you need to read them all like that. No. <laughs> before, before, you must. As they we're are, performers. Don't, we're here to I don't, I don't these remember good how people. it's delivered exactly, but like I can't help but look at these words and be just ugh. I feel like thinking read... thinking these lines are good should disqualify you from writing <laughs> them to begin with. Um Yeah, so then and some people in chat are already talking about this, like don't worry, we're we're there. So Ilsa, Ilsa says, I still have a few friends in MI6, people who want to keep Britain from gaining control of the entity. Now, oh, the first right. question, of course, is how would they know, as uh, Little Platoon's brought up? And it's like, whenever you ask these questions, this is the examples of, like, it bleeds. Why hasn't Ilsa asked these questions? 
Ilsa contacts these people strictly by electronic digital shit. And she's, con she's sure that they're the ones that told her all this stuff, even though they're the ones that have informed her what the entity does, which is manipulate all of digital technology. How does someone not have that moment of thought, like, hmm, mm. that's what I'm using right now. How about that? Mm. Um, and then, of course, you start thinking, wait a minute. So all this information she's just given about the MI6, putting her on this mission, is what got her into the desert with the key. But why haven't you told Ethan any of this? And Ethan says this? Why the hell didn't you tell me any of this? And then she says, I'm telling you now. I love how they just hand wave that away. <laughs> that is a that is a writer's handbook excuse. That one I've heard that in so many fucking movies. It drives me nuts. They, I'm telling you now. It's like that. I know that. I'm asking you why you didn't tell me earlier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, uh, it just makes people feel like, oh, okay. But it's like, no, no. She should have told him. And I don't know why he didn't ask her. Did he just say like, oh, this key, I need it. I've been told to get it. Do you know what it does? And she's like, no. Nah. Okay. All right. Well, move on. Moving on. Um. He says they knew he was on his way to Istanbul to acquire half a key, and we beat him to it, and then hid in the desert uh, from the bounty, but somehow the bounty hunters found you anyway. That's what uh, Tom Cruise says. And I thought that at this point they were implying something. And then they continue. They Some uh, say the key leads the source code, and it's like, uh, you know, all, the, all, all this stuff, all this information I, I've gotten... Electron uh, electr bleh, electronically. Uh, electronomagically. And then they all have that realization. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh my gosh, this is an... Uh, wow, is this so, AI like a hacker man? All of what Ilsa got in terms of information may have come from the entity and not MI6. The entity may have been the one that got it to go to Istanbul and subvert whoever had the key at the time to get it herself, because I guess it may have calculated that she's like the greatest person ever to get the key. And that's why it knew she would also go to the desert, My, I'm guessing, and that's why it, it was the one that sent the... Because they have this line where they're like, somehow it found you in the desert. And it's like, is that is the implication supposed to be that through determinism again, like scanning your profiles, it knew that she would go to the desert? Or something? And it sent those bounty hunters? I don't know. Um, it's, it's too hard to figure out, and of course... The entity's decisions are all over the place. Um, but it led to her actually getting the key. But I guess <laughs> I was about to say, you could justify every entity decision because it ends up with Gabriel getting the key. <laughs> Only it doesn't actually end up that way. But that's fine. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. <laughs> yeah, um, but so I got really annoyed hearing Ilsa basically realize how fucking retarded she is. She was like, Wow, this thing manipulates all of technology, and I've been using nothing but technology to talk to the people that gave me all this information. Hmm. Yeah, like, I could have thought on. of this before. And then they come have on. the conversation, the cringe one, yep. where you go, we can't be sure that was the entity. And then someone else goes, we can't be sure it wasn't the entity. And then uh, I think Ethan says that we can't be sure anything is real outside of this conversation. Like, where was this? At the beginning of the film. Of the movie, yes. Hello? Where was this in this your first long? briefing? Like, like, come on, guys. You should know embarrassing. better than that. Embarrassing. The entity's yeah. fucking with their, like, equipment since the get-go. They've told, like, th in theory they told that. And it's only now that they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, and, and and then it's, it's the funny part is, by the way, mild spoiler, they, the entity subsequently messes with the equipment that they use for They their continue to trust mission. their digital equipment. This yeah, is true. they keep using it. But the fact that they hadn't even considered that that was something yeah. that it could do is laughable. Like, what they should know better than that. Is... Normies know this, and they're like super duper secret agent guys. Um, and then, and then he says he he knows he knows the best way to get to me is through all of you. There's a reason he wants me here. It he wants all of us here. You all have to go. And then again, it feels like it's written by a kid. That Luther goes, but what if it wants us to leave? It's just like what? <laughs> like what, you guys have never thought about any of this yet. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of you think that they would have had the conversation sooner. But it's making pretty. Because that's, that, why wouldn't they think that that's what the, the thing is doing? It's making predictions, and you need to try and figure out ways to subvert those predictions. And it's like, what does that even mean to subvert those predictions? You need to behave in a way that is so fundamentally different from the way that you normally act. That and it they actually, like, 
they go the opposite way, don't they? Because doesn't Luther say if you want to beat it, you have to start thinking like it, which I would have thought is is kind of the opposite of the thing you want yeah, to do because I was it is an too. incredibly We're... predictable thing and it works on prediction. So you need yeah. to be the opposite We're... of it, not like if like anything. It. Wouldn't it be like you could? You need to find ways to uh, basically introduce chance. The unpredictable, into, yeah. Uh, yeah, you need to introduce chance into your equation. You could save a villain's life and she could randomly decide that she likes you after all. That's introducing chance to the equation. <laughs> you can't predict that. Yeah. It's kind of because now I'm just thinking, like, what if you just like what if with some parameters you just use like some dice? You just like had some dice and then you you did some random things based on what the that dice told you to do. Like if like if he's just walking through and he's like, I'm gonna roll the dice and I have like an idea on my head of some. Oh, that would make for a really fun film. Do. That would make well, I think that, yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's a because there's a there's a book right called the Dice Man that's about a guy who just starts using dice to like make decisions throughout his life. I think Harvey Dent. And that, the whole like, <laughs> no, no, well, like coin. <laughs> I mean, well, <laughs> that, then again, you could even do that, right? If you flip a coin, even that, like, as as just a binary sort yeah. of choice that's presented to him, like all of these things would just introduce it unpredicted. Just think, it's you know, it's like chaos theory, right? Try to find ways to. Like Joker said, introduce a little anarchy and so that you know, just fuck around. Like that that seems like a way that you could try to beat the system. If but, uh, you could have a scene like they're running yeah. running away from X and it's like there's two hallways, flip the fucking coin, go, 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 little left, and then it's like, oh we got shit, we got three. We'll go with the just you know, pick it random like, like you could have comedy and drama mixed in, but then you have like serious ones where you're about to get into a fight with Gabriel and it's like, what weapon do you use? And he actually has to just roll the fucking dice, and if it ends up with like, you know, one is knife, two is gun, three is rifle, that sort of thing, and it rolls a one, and you're just like, Alright. You're just you're basing it off entirely a chance to run away with it. We actually tried to talk about this with the uh, Taskmaster. We brought it up when we were talking about Black Widow. Yeah, it's, yeah um, we did. That That's theoretical right. movie that will never happen because they didn't have the balls, which is the Black Widow prequel movie with Hawkeye, and then Taskmaster is just the mercenary they have to defeat in that film. Not even kill, bring him back, it would be fun. But the, he's dominating against Hawkeye, he's dominating against Black Widow, but they've gotten to know each other so well in their aims to kill each other, that they can actually reflect each other's fighting styles, and then they start switching in the middle of the fight continuously, and Taskmaster can't account for it. It's too confusing, and then they fuck him up. That would be fun. Like, this is the juice. This is the this is the storytelling juice that you're looking for, right? Like this is you you've set up a scenario. Now have now get creative with it. Find have fun with it. Experiment. I it, it just seems like there's so many missed opportunities with this premise. Because even though the because the entity as a premise is really hard to account for, but if you accounted for it, you can end up with something awesome as a story. What, what does it look like when you need human beings to subvert something that relies on human predictability? It's like, well, I don't know, find ways to be unpredictable. Find as, creative uh, ways to be unpredictable. Platoon just said, they do the complete fucking opposite. It's like Luther's like, we need to start thinking carefully. And it's like, why wouldn't that be the most predictable thing? Yeah, it se like it seems like what you need to do. It's like it's like uh, I think you said a platoon, right? Why would you say we need to think like it does? No, you need to think in a way that it does. Think like a clown. Yeah, pretty much. You need to think like a crazy man. You need to be more unpredictable. And it would just be so much fun to have like several scenarios where there's an easy, obvious option, and then they roll the dice, and they're like, "Oh shit, we gotta, I gotta come in through yeah. the roof now." You're like, "Just do it." Yeah, exactly. Just do it. Yeah, and that and that's cool, right? Because it means that in order for them to win, they have to get really uncomfortable. They need to like embrace uh, uncertainty to a degree that they're not used to. And then wouldn't that be oh, uh, oh, now wasted? Getting... Oh. Wasted. <laughs> because yes, this this conversation start and end is the entity could be everywhere and know everything. It also might not be. Well. We don't know what's real, but we also don't know that things are not real. It's like, well, should we all leave? No, because that might be what the entity wants. All right. Okay, let's go together like we would have anyway. <laughs> They don't make a plan. They talk about it, but then they don't make any plans to subvert the AI at all. They just don't. Okay. Move on. Uh, yeah, they say that if the key grants control of the entity, if that's what it does, Gabriel is the last person who should have it, because he's a big meanie. So, um, I, I mean, it, it seems at this point he's gone beyond being a man. He seems like he's more... He's like, well, you so know... I mean, throughout the film, I was actually genuinely yeah. wondering, it's like, are you like a robot? <laughs> I thought they might reveal he's a Terminator of some kind, yeah. Yeah. 
and and I think for a while I was like, nah, come on, not for Mission Impossible, nah. But then it's like, yeah, but even the entity is kind of like beyond the scope of what they typically do in these films. Yeah, in terms of like science fiction. So yeah, and he was in that weird coffin. I don't know, <laughs> the Robo coffin. Uh, we'll we'll <laughs> no see what that is at some point. So then, uh, yeah, then they're like, all right, let's do this. And then there's this moment where they, we go up to the rooftop and Ethan and Ilsa are there. And she's like, I've never been here before. And he's like, I haven't either. And then they smile at each other. And it's like... I got a little concerned for this. People are sus like, on that one. Oh, wait, hold on. Nah. nah Ilsa's only on. been in the film for like three minutes. <laughs> That's like, you know, yeah. what's going on? Um... So yeah, uh, we're we're at the party. It starts up, and immediately uh, you see the imagery of the eye. And so I don't know if they wanted that to be a surprise for the audience, but I mean, if it wasn't a surprise, paying any basic <laughs> attention, you should be like, okay, that's the entity. Right, then. The entity, yeah. He's um, here with his big eye graphic. No, if you look at me, up. everybody. You remember this? This all gets fucked up again. So Grace has been hired by the White Widow to deliver the key and get paid. Grace is here to deliver. But Gabriel heads her off and basically tries to get her to give the key to him when he is waiting to be operated as through the broker that is the White Widow to get his key. Yeah. Why are you fucking all of this up? Why I did just he don't do get that? It. Yeah. Why did he? Oh my god. Why did he do that? And then he says, I'm not here for the key. Let me tell you a story how your story no. ends. Let me buy you a drink and maybe we can change it. Like, what is this? <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> Even as you like accepting that this is the thing he chooses to do, which he shouldn't because it's stupid, but let's assume that this is the kind of tactic he wants to pull. You can find a way of, of justifying that. He already knows the broker has one half of the key, right? So the, the, like that's accounted for. You can kill her at some point in the future, whatever, get the key. But if he's going to try and subvert um, uh, Captain Carter, I keep getting a bloody name, um, Grace, that's the one. Grace. If you're going to try and subvert her, why haven't you done this already? Because you already know all of this stuff and you've had plenty of opportunities to capture her and do it already. And then you could have got the key from her way before now. You could have maybe staged another meet with the broker. You could have got the key a different way. All of this could have been done at any other time in the film. And it's not been done because they just didn't think of that yet. So, so was that he's planting the idea of not trusting Ethan, right? Well, it backfires completely. And then do you say like, ah, but that was the intention. I mean, how many times are you going to say <laughs> that was the intention before you consider the more plausible option, which is I feel is like you can't. Up. You just can't because of how this story ends. He's screaming Ethan to the yeah. camera. No, but, but see, the entity with his floopy eye has gone, good, good. Yes, actually, I <laughs> wanted you to scream Ethan. <laughs> um, so. Unless it's all a bit to trick Ethan into going to the entity and at the end of part two the entity is like the emperor and he tries to convert ethan to the dark side Ooh. and he will be the new <laughs> apprentice well and then when he says i'll never join you he starts shooting electricity out of the motherboard yeah yeah like, <laughs> it, it just zaps <laughs> ethan don't you see you don't want anyone to die and that's what and i gabriel, offer gabriel is looking back and forth between ethan and the motherboard <laughs> no and then he, yeah. <laughs> Turns out Gabriel is uh, Ethan's dad. It's actually a big reveal for the second <laughs> film. Oh, wow. I can't believe it. This timeline, yeah. So, Ethan's going there to find out if he can get access to the information regarding what the key does. Whether or not they'll be able to get the key off Grace, get Grace out, get the other half of the key. This is all up in the air. They don't know yet. So, Ethan's going in as Ethan to do that. Why is Ilsa going in with him as Ilsa? Why? I don't know. He because... literally only ends up as leverage. Bad leverage yep. like for the bad guy. So why not go in as a masked person? The films keep forgetting. The masks are like masks so are really amazing. If she went They're in incredible. undercover, she could then subvert anything that they try to do at any point. Instead, she just yep. becomes a target and she has to get out. Yep. That's so right. annoying. And the security camera's above the door and they're really obvious. And Yeah, they get caught straight away. Yeah. What was the plan? Just walk in and yeah, hope. That was it. And yeah, hope. It was literally that, was it. that. And it sucks. They usually plan out everything well far ahead and then things go wrong and they have to react. That's the way the Mission well, Impossible films usually remember, do. It. Remember how in Mission Impossible 1, 
how much time is spent on the plan uh yeah. just to get into the uh into the that party get into the security area like how much effort was put into a relatively like compared That's... to the crazy stakes in these films like a relatively like normal sort of situation for spies and it's just, it's good to see that planning and, and those conversations. Yeah, that's but like part of the fun. That's a lot of the fun is seeing these old plans get, you know, enacted and stuff in situations that I can actually sort of understand and have really sort of almost relate, not like relatable stakes, but like believable stakes. Stakes that aren't absurd. Well, mm. well uh, I thought like there's so many options in terms of plans is there even a point in going through them or should we just acknowledge the fact that they didn't give a fuck like whatever because the fact is they could try they're still using their digital tech could they hack into the the room could they just the send point. ethan in and get him to put trackers on people or to listen into conversations to do anything to figure out anything because they don't even find out the widow has the key until they're in there right and it's like maybe you could have found a different way to get access to information like that by anything subversive and spy-like. Your spy movie. Mm. But okay. Do it. Um, he starts talking to Grace and he says, You're not unique. There was a woman 30 years ago. Her name was Marie. Uh, the first of many women who... I think it was Maria or Marie. I can't remember actually. But the first of many women who trusted our friend and had something he wanted... Women in over their heads, or so he tells them. And then Grace is like, what happened to her? He says, same thing that happens to all the women he uses. Same thing for anyone who touches that key. He doesn't care whether people live or die. He only cares about his objective. The only thing standing in his way is you. <gasps> bah, 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 bah. It's such a like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I get he could be lying, but like, why is he trying this avenue? It's so absurd. You, you, like, why is he trying to offer the his angles better when all he's done is kill loads of people and try to fuck her up the whole movie? Like, it's one of those weird moments where it's just like, yeah, I guess you're trying to convince me not to trust Ethan, a man who has actually uh, tried to help her several times. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. And then on a meta level, it's like, did you want us to believe this even vaguely? And unfortunately, it's something that Ethan begins to think about all the women that have died as a result of him. Um, I kind of want to just jump ahead to that quick moment because in isolation is connected to this. Ethan does have a have a, a brief moment when he's thinking about the mission, and it flashes on screen. Lady from thirty years ago, we know nothing about. Someone else. We'll get to that in a minute. And uh, then uh, Grace, because he's worried about what'll happen to her. This film basically arguing that uh, Ethan does actually think that he gets women killed by bringing them in into like the IMF or missions and stuff and it's like wow first of all not true second you didn't mention mm. the girl from the second or the third movie you didn't you didn't throw in the wife I know that she didn't Even die in the universe they're afraid to reference the second movie as having happened he, he thought he watched his wife die as a result of being connected to him that was a huge event in the third movie then there's the girl Carrie Russell who did die and then there's the one from Mission Impossible 2 that nearly died from like a blood cancer that he brought her in to deal with, but none of them get a get a little little mention there. Hmm. Bit lame. The only ones that are shown are all from this movie. Kind of strange. Oh well. Um, and then uh, 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 he says nothing anyone says is true, and his promises to protect you aren't true either. So. Um... I guess, yeah, he's just trying to make Ethan seem untrustworthy from Grace's POV. It does absolutely nothing to affect that, though. Either he failed, or it was always meant to have the reverse effect, because 5D chess is being played, all right? Uh, and then, again, like, I've been trying to highlight this, because, man, I don't know what happened with the dialogue in this film. And some people have been saying that all Mission Impossible films have bad dialogue. No! Bad wrong um, well it might be true that there may be a bad piece of dialogue in all of the films but or a lot of yeah if you yeah, there, the there's idea. plenty of yeah there's gonna be plenty of bad dialogue in like the franchise but there's also plenty of good dialogue in the franchise well uh, yeah well and and just this one is particularly bad um gabriel looks at ethan and says ah it's been a long time ethan that ethan goes you should have killed me when you had the chance <laughs> oh, I haven't heard that in a million movies before. So not only is that one of the most generic lines ever, 
What are you talking about, Ethan? I don't even know what you're talking about. There was a time where he could have killed you, I guess. You know, like, that doesn't work for us. We're just like, oh, sure, fine. And it's, it, it is absolutely from the book of, I have no dialogue for my character. What should I have them say? And it's like, this, this will work. I think they do, they it. slightly top it, though, in terms of cringe dialogue in the same scene when the reveal that the um the entity is, is present. It's like, the interested party arranged this party. Oh. In fact, you could say, this party is the interested party. Ooh. Right. <laughs> that is probably the worst line in the movie, because they say party like four times. They're party, very party, proud of party, themselves. we're gonna have a party. Um. So then Grace does a sort of signal with, with her eyes to Ethan, and uh, at the time, I had no idea what she wanted him to do. Turns out Ethan detected entirely what she, she wanted him to do. He needs to bump into one of the guards to then prompt the guards to attack him, so then it gives her an excuse to say no, and then that will prompt the White Widow's brother to grab her, so that then she can put pocket the key she currently has into his pocket for safekeeping. That's what she signaled by looking with her eyes. That whole thing. I, I, I didn't grasp that at all, but Ethan did apparently. Uh, so, sure. He's a clever guy. I guess he knew what she meant. But mm -hmm. just to be clear, the stakes of this exchange are such that I'm not sure this is the kind of thing you want to leave up to the interpretation of a glance. <laughs> but, That's you cool. know, I'm a spy. I am but, full um, of pee. I know that. When she does that, I was like, why aren't you just giving the key to the White Widow? She hired you. You want money. Does that change now? What's going on? What is? Well, I mean, I don't know. Evilman was kind of like but Evilman weird. and White Widow aren't on the same team, as far as she knows. Yeah, as far as yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, and she's so only here for money, right? Completely. She's still yeah. Miss Miss I want money person. So what's going on? Why is she doing that? I don't know. She, she should be when she sees the White Widow, and the White Widow says, "Of course, I hired you. I hired you personally." She'd be like, "Oh, fucking great! Here's the key. Can I have my money now?" I just yeah. want to go. I want out of this crazy nightmare. Um, yeah, and so then White Widow says, uh, as I have to remind you, I'm the broker. I connect a buyer and seller for money and sometimes information. I just want everyone to be happy. I thought that was interesting, because, uh, especially after rewatching Fallout, does uh, Ethan Hunt remember that she's got a direct connection with the CIA and she informs for them? Well, yeah, that's what he, he was told that. So the, like, the, and that doesn't that does come up in this movie, but not until way later. I was really surprised that he didn't seem to mention any of that when the CIA currently want him. That uh, seems like something you should probably keep in mind. But oh well. <laughs> that's the case of this movie forgetting the history of the movie before, like one movie ago. Like I said, they remember it later because when the Kittredge yeah. ha has conversation happens, he mentions it. But it's just like, wait, why was why wasn't Ethan mentioning any of this? Why was there no plans? Yeah, for a movie with so much exposition. Not much planning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, she says, the world is changing, truth is vanishing, and war is coming. <laughs> it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then she says, uh, Ilsa says, whoever you give the key to will be forever in your debt, but whoever you don't will forever be your enemy. But it was like, ooh, I like her. I thought it was weird. Because most of the time the I like them comments is usually from someone who's been in the show, so to speak, longer than the person they're saying it about. Sort of like reflect something of a of a preference for the audience. Like, you know, like we, we, the references of like um, Thor doing it with Captain Marvel, Han doing it with Finn. There's uh, other examples in these, but it's like, hey, White Widow, you haven't even been here anywhere near as long as Ilsa has. <laughs> it's like, it's just so weird. She should be saying she likes you, but... Nobody should like the White Widow because she's quite evil. Uh, admits she's doing this to keep herself safe and to make money. But um, she's cool, right? What is that? Well, it's just, you know, <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, they start trying to figure out who's working for who and who wants what and who has what. And uh, that's when the line comes in. And uh, I've got to make quotes now so I'm just to make sure everyone understands how great this is. They ask what the relationship is between White Widow and Gabriel. She says, Gabriel represents another interested party. In fact, this party was arranged by that interesting party. You could even say 
this party is that interested party. That is the full bit. And it, it just and then, because the AI has that weird little audio cue, yeah, it goes, where it goes, and so you know it's there, as though you didn't already know it was there because you had already seen the the blue eye. But anyway, like people weren't paying attention, I guess. It was just it's just hard to listen to some of these lines. It's like, did you really think that was a great line? You'd... Okay, that's fine. And uh, if that wasn't bad enough, it tops off with it cutting to her saying, and so the plot thickens. <laughs> what the hell's going on? <laughs> Why? Um, and then Is she says, so, do I hand the key to Gabriel or to Hunt? And it's just like... I mean, with everything we know about White Widow, I don't know why she would hand it to Ethan. I don't know. There's just no way. Uh, Gabriel's got all of the leverage. He's a works for a horrifying monster that can kill everybody. Um, I don't even know what what would the motive be to give it to Ethan. I think he presents it as I can kill the entity if you give me the key. So that's that's the choice. When they finally get to it, the sales pitch he makes is that uh, I think it's in this very moment he makes the realization himself when he starts saying that Gabriel's clearly afraid because he thinks he could lose. And that would be innately unbelievable because nothing about this setup would suggest that except for the fact that Gabriel overacts and you can tell that he actually is afraid because he does the whole trembly stare thing. Um, so you know, and presumably also the White Widow knows that he's genuinely afraid, which then means that Ethan has a point which should sway her in his direction, except that that isn't where they go with that because I don't actually remember why. Um, but as for killing it, he, yeah, his promise is to kill the entity, and therefore ensure that nothing else will happen, which, does that, I, I guess that would present as a reasonably attractive offer, because you're ending the prospects of world domination, and if the entity is dead, then it can't take vengeance on her anyway for killing it, because it is dead. I mean, the problem, of course, is the feasibility of it. It would be like if, you know, aliens were starting to blow up Earth, and I'm like, you should pick me, because I can destroy them. It's like, how? I'm back. And there's no reasonable how on Ethan's part. He's just saying it. Remember, he doesn't even know where the key goes. He's like, give me the key and I'll kill it. And it's like, but how? And so, of course, she's not going to side with him. He has nothing. But uh, he does condemn her for not doing so, which I thought was kind of funny, because she says to him, like, I mean, it's just going to kill me if I don't. So I don't know. I just don't know what Ethan expected. He's got nothing. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Gabriel says... I represent the power of thousands of quadrillions of computations per millisecond, subtly manipulating the minds of billions, passing every possible cause and effect, every scenario, however implausible, of the next possible, like, basically all actions. Um, and he says that with just a few changes to the present, the future is assured, or all but assured, I think he said. Um, and he says that all of this, that, that I will get the key and it'll happen on the Orient Express. And it's like, that, that is actually true. The, the, I guess the machine knew that. Did all the predictions. And he says, it's going to be laid at my feet. Which is also true. That does happen too. And he says, I'll get which, the key, yeah. provided either Grace or Ilsa die tonight. Which is strange. Uh, at which point, as soon as he said that, I got very worried. Yeah, because it kind of feels like... Uh... I don't know, uh, well, man. actually, like, to say that I got worried is wrong. I knew what was going to happen. Like, at that point, it's well, like, Well, there's just oh, a couple right. of facts to consider. Grace has been heavily featured in this film. Uh, yeah, yep. this is her uh, movie. In the trailers, she's got stuff on the train. Uh, and even without the trailers, it's just like, there's no way that it's a dead end, right, for, for her at this point. Conversely, we've had very little Elsa in this movie. And of the little we've had, it's been in the opening scene when uh, she tackles Ethan and he's like, it's me, it's me. They both share a longing look. And then when she's back, they both share a look and a smile. Like, and then they have the, the, the yeah, whole the pathos, the pathos scene on the balcony, which is only ever done if you're about to kill that person. Yeah, the, if you don't put that in a film and then she's going to It all points to die. Ilsa dying. It's like, but that, it's not going to happen, right? That'd be weird. Like, that would be, nah, come on. But was it? It was sort of presented as almost a a choice that he would have to make. And, and but if he did have agency, that. if he had agency in that choice, I don't really understand why Grace is the one. Spoiler alert: Who lives? Because um, they they've met each other a few times. She's kind of tried to fuck him over every single time. By contrast, Ilsa is someone with whom he has a long established relationship, and you know they're actually friends and they've worked together and they have a history. 
if you were given a choice between random new girl who, okay, fine, she's in an unfortunate situation, but I don't know her that well, and she's tried to maybe kill me once or twice, versus someone I actually know and like, there's only really one choice to make there, isn't there? Yeah, um, sorry, Grace. But that never happened. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't no. it? True. Never got it's to that point. Confusing, never even came close. It? Never even came close. Like, the um, idea that he had to decide or choose or whatever, and that just doesn't, like, ever manifest? Like, that's a strange thing that kind of got me in for a loop, and I'm confused, and I'm wondering what you meant by that. Yeah, Gabriel says that one of them has to die, and then the key will be his, and then he'll be gone, like smoke in a hurricane. But only after someone you care about dies, it is written. Uh -huh. That was pretty cringe, too. But it's okay, yeah. we'll move on. <laughs> And then, right. yeah, uh, Togger's like, he's afraid. It's afraid! Somehow it knows we're close. Why else would he be here? Help me complete the key and I will kill it. Which, again, I just, to me, it was like, cope. You, you don't even know what the key go, where it goes, what it does. Like, And White Widow should know that. That's, yeah, I can't, not anything. From, um, um, from her perspective, wouldn't it make most sense, given that she has armed guards with her, she has... The position of authority, she has one half of the key already, and this this club is, well, it's been arranged by the entity, but she seems to have most of the heavies there. If she wanted maximum leverage and protection against the entity, why doesn't she kill Gabriel, or have him shot, or her people shoot at him? Gabriel says, then, the thing about it knows every secret you've ever had, Alana, help him, and you'll die too. And it's a pretty credible threat if you oh, take no, but the I'm not talking about helping him, I'm talking about helping herself. Like, kill him, get, like, find the other half of the key, whatever, lock the place down. You've got your armed guards think... around you, you can theoretically do that. And then you've got one-to-one -one communication with the entity, basically saying, I've got the thing you want, I will give it to you if you leave me alone. There's viability to that. Um, I think the film wants us to think she's too terrified to fight the entity. She wants to submit, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, because she says that she feels like her life is on the line, I think that's what we're supposed to buy, is that she just wants to get out at this point. She's in over her head. Um, and, and you know, if you take the entity for what it's supposed to be, it is unstoppable and terrifying. There's no way to beat something like that, but they will beat it, and it'll probably be a lot easier than we'd expect. Um, but that's for the second film. Oh uh, boy. But I will say, uh, I don't really know why Gabriel is here. Uh, uh, by the time we hit the end of the scene, he's come to say, one of you two will die, and then he leaves. That's about it. Um, yeah, because the computer would have known whether or not they would have given him the key or anything right on well, the spot. And the widow doesn't so... give him the key. She ends up selling it to, uh, Eatridge. Yeah, so I suppose that doesn't... I, that was part of the plan? Well, so the only thing you can actually justify this one with is he needed to go there and say that in order to facilitate everything else to happen. With yes. weird cause and effect brains working the way that they do. That's all I got. But um, obviously the reason we do it for the film is to have that moment where you know, the villain and the hero get to be like, hey, fuck you. And he's like, hey, fuck you. Nah, fuck you. The one thing that was getting me a bit lost at this point in the film is how come nobody's acknowledging that like, if Gabriel gets it, it is the end of the world. Like, there's no reason to assume otherwise. The AI will take over everything. We will be slaves to its, its references. As opposed yeah, like to our... now, when it's only almost taken over absolutely everything and made you slaves to his preference. Like, I, it's already happened. I don't understand what the extra threat is. That's true. Are all the goons okay with this? Do they have any like sense of agency? They might be like, androids, oh, you don't like, know. A job's a job, but like, I don't want that world. That sounds bad. They're all faceless yeah. robots. They're bureaucrats. Back them. Um, so anyway, this, we're moving on, I guess. And so... Uh, Grace, this part's kind of strange. The 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 goons and and good old Gabriel leave, and his goons, I guess. But the widow's goons are still here, and it, it the implication is that she's got like Grace, Ilsa, and uh, Ethan sort of under arrest, or they they're captives now. Not really sure, and there's no dialogue to necessarily reflect it. Um, and so the 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 guards like. They all sort of, with nods, agree to attack the guards at the same time. Uh, Grace does sleight of hand in front of Widow's brother. He gets so confused, doesn't grab it, but then Ethan like hits him. And so Grace runs off with the key. Ilsa's already ran off with her dick that she has. 
this is just you know uh Fring, you watched the two other movies with ilsa you remember her stick his, his stick uh. sword for that because ilsa never really used any guns she wasn't a fan no she, nah she didn't like those made sure to bring her stick so that's gonna <laughs> worth mentioning um yeah, and so uh, she gets out, and, and uh, for, in order for the next thing to happen, we need there to be a lot of space between Grace and Ethan. He needs to catch up with her to get the key back. So she's ran off, and it's like, run right after her. But no, he stands up, he looks like to the left, and he sees some goons. He walks over, looks to the right, sees some more goons, looks like the mills, some extra goons, and they all start heading up the stairs. He like looks around, he's like, oh, jeez. And he looks at White Widow, and she looks at him as like a, what are you going to do, bud? And then he jumps off and like rolls, then runs out in a different direction. And that's why he's so far behind, when he could have just immediately ran after her. That was always an option. He just sort of does a big look around, because he has to, because he has to get separated from her for the rest of the scene to happen. There's a lot of that for what's about to happen. Because Grace <laughs> is just running, right? But... The entity knows exactly where she'll go because it knows everything because, about it. Yeah, 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 That's yeah. Just, just, it'll know. Yep. Is there another bit during that chase sequence where she tries to leave him in significantly more trouble than he yes. arrived in? He helps Cause... her with two guards and then she pushes one guard onto him to leave. Yeah, that was it. Kind of annoying, so, um... but like I said, she's, she just doesn't trust anybody, so it takes a lot to gain her over to his side, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she gets away pretty fast, and so it creates a big gap again. Uh, then, you know, it, it, uh, Hunt <laughs> starts asking good old Luther and uh, Benji where she is using their satellites with their digital tech. They, they <laughs> just, they've gone over how this is completely unreliable, and they're using it anyway. And then uh, he goes to tell him, and it gets scrambled. Like, oh no, the entity has disabled the satellite. Like, what? What's the entity doing, man? Like, just disable their fucking computers. Well, let's be frank. The satellites would be under its control on day one. That's one of the first things it would have done. It's, there's this cringy-ass line where Luther says, Oh god, it's taking control of the satellites faster than I can hack into them. Like, obviously? No yeah. shit. It's had full control Probably. of all satellites since it went live. Like, what do you mean? It's, I just don't get also, it. Also, you're a person who has to type on a keyboard. And it's so crazy. Also, like, you just recently had the conversation. Yeah, and, and as a result of this, they eventually go analog with communications. Had they done that, when they figured out that they needed to do that, what's about to then, happen wouldn't happen. Exactly. And what's about to happen is significant. Rather large, you might say. So yeah. It's annoying. Um, and they eventually realize that Benji is giving orders to Hunt as to where to go, but it ain't Benji. It's the it's the entity faking his voice. Oh, it's, a, it's an AI voice changer. Ah. Oh no. But, no they, but remember, it's it does it perfectly until it reveals itself and then it goes glitchy oh. and computery and floopy. <laughs> Which um, would work if you had established that this thing is so advanced it has a literal personality. It's an actual agent that has desires and, and, and wants to fuck around well, with shit, I which would the, be cool, but they the, haven't done that. Well, the thing, Rags, is the steel man argument is, yeah, they have. Oh, yeah, that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you toyed with the idea of that idea, but you haven't, you haven't done anything. Wait, so was it, if the entity is looking for which satellite is being used, if the entity took control of all satellites, the world and business as we know it would halt. It's implied in the movie that it didn't. No, 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 no. No, you could just have to... control of them, but allow them to yeah, carry it, on. It, it's in all of them. It's in everything. If it needs to do any particular thing at any particular time, like changing ones to zeros in any particular way, it can. However, it'll leave everything run. You know, the, the average, like, digital system somewhere in some shop isn't getting fucked with, nor with any of the satellites. Whenever Luther is trying... This is what I meant. Luther's trying to access satellites. Okay, you could knock off all the satellites he might try and use, or you just fucking disable his fucking laptop. That's all you have to do. Why are you fucking around with that? And then, of course, you, even if you were, you could do it way faster. Why is Luther surprised that the almighty AI that does quadrillions of calculations per millisecond is able to prevent him from hacking the satellites, but, well, it knocks them off before he can hack them? Duh. 
And he's fun like fact: AI it. voices did not exist when they wrote this. These AI things appeared after they started the movie, but before it ended. So just use your imagination. We had like, text to speech. Yeah. It's like, like come Wait, on, you don't think it could do a good text to speech? What, what well, are they suggesting? I think I think the point they're making is: oh, can you, how can you blame the filmmakers for not thinking that AI could do like voices? They do it in but the movies. Can... Uh, no, I, or, or rather, rather more so that the point is, yeah, how could you blame Ethan for not realizing that that was a possibility? They do it he, in the movies. What? And even if- I mean, That's and, right, and, they do it wait, in wait, the wait, movies. Wait, 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 just, just, right, just, just so stop. Destroying. I, need, I need to make sure everyone understands. They copy and paste people's voices in as early as in Mission Impossible 1. Yep, that's right. They've been Isn't... using the crazy voice. Uh, that's not an, a voice AI. That's voice synthesis. It doesn't matter because that could be the same One thing. It just means the they other. hack in. So, okay, let me explain if this when is did, so uh, hard when did to Oblivion, understand. When did take, Oblivion come out? Just take out Gabriel, all right? Gabriel Wait. puts on the voice changer and then the entity plugs him into Ethan's comms. There you go. That was always a possibility and Ethan and crew never considered it. And even if it wasn't, even if it had never been seen before, the fact that it can in real time remove people from video, and you've seen that, how is it not actually like a reasonable inference that it could imitate people? Like, you don't think it can change like waveforms if it can alter pixels? It, this is like a god machine. The idea that, oh, well, they made this film before like AI voices was like a thing that people were talking about in like mainstream circles. Also, Therefore, it's by the way, that like Ethan wouldn't know about it. The entity is capable of things that are beyond what current technology is capable of in our world. Like, I mean, the fact that it exists means it's beyond what we can do now. There's no such thing in real life right now. And this is the Mission <laughs> Impossible universe with all sorts of crazy tech. There's no excuse. It's, uh, yeah, exactly. It's insane. And they have the technology to subvert it, they just don't incorporate it yet. For some reason. They should have mm -hmm. had it from the get-go, but they don't- And remember, this was after Ilsa already pointed out that she had spoke- What the- Nah, yeah, whatever, yeah. This was after <laughs> she already pointed out that, that the AI was probably MS6. already- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what the fuck are you talking about? Well, it gets even right, funnier because on. Benji and Luther are like, Oh my god, and they both pick up their laptops and throw them to the ground? It's like, what are you guys doing? Thanks like, for catching up, tech experts. It's so, yeah. Yeah, but like that's like the retard's view of how to get it out. Like, oh no, destroy the laptop by throwing it to the ground. It's like, hard drives are fine. You even acknowledge that later. What do you think that achieves? Like, it doesn't. In fact, it's probably more beneficial to actually keep them open. You might be able to see something in terms of what the the entity might be or might not be doing. You, the idea, like throwing the ground is, is too late, guys. It's, it doesn't need your laptops to trick Ethan, you know what I mean? Like, them not having that makes no difference at all. And it doesn't destroy it anyway. The entity's still in those laptops, man. Like, He's still there. He's still there, waiting. <laughs> you just, you almost want it to be like, why did you throw me on the floor? <laughs> like, what, what? Ow. <laughs> it just types out in text on the screen, ouch. Um, so then this was funny. Uh... Benji starts running away, sort of, and then uh, Luther's like, what are you doing? He's like, listen, try to re-establish comms with Ethan while I meet up with him. And I was like, re-establish comms? You can't. That's the whole reason you're you leaving. You can't. It's a big problem. <laughs> what do you mean, try to re-establish comms? No the whole point is the entity stopping you. I thought we... Uh, it's fine. We'll just move on. So, Grace, running and running and running, she sees, facing back, like, he he's facing his... He's facing forward, she can see his back, Gabriel, at a bridge, and she decides to try and kill him. Why? So I don't know. I'll, what I'll do is I'll tell you guys what I would do if I was in Grace's situation. Do it. If I was running, running, and I saw on the bridge, there's Gabriel, and he's waiting there, and he's not even looking at me. He's, he's, not, he's not even facing the, that, that way. He's facing the other way. What I would do is I would turn around, and I would leave. Why would you do that? Because I don't want to get fucking kilt. Why would you assume you'd die? Oh. Well, I assume he's waiting for me. And he has, like, the, the machine god on his side. Mm. And he said that I might have to die tonight, specifically. And here we are, and he's waiting for me. What if you're a, what if you're a Korea thief though? 
oh, then I would steal this fucking opportunity to leave, and I'd turn <laughs> around and I'd, and I'd go. I'd be gone. So yeah, that I don't know what else there is to say about this. It's dumb as fuck. Grace tries to kill him. She has all the opportunities to run away, but for some reason she decides I'm gonna boss fight him. I'm gonna attack him because I have my knife. Probably the most out Even of character thing she does in the whole movie. Crazy super duper spy man, and she's thief. She runs. She often runs. She's talking about how scared she is. We see her terrified in all these scenarios. Why the fuck is she now going Rambo on him? What is that? This is the one fight this movie you do not take. No. Because, no. like, you would just assume he'd have a gun, right? You would just assume... You, you know you have a knife. You would assume he has a firearm. <sighs> He's crazy, though, so he wants to have a fight. And see, the entity had to bake that into his plans. Because he's such a crazy guy, hence why one of them has to die. Yeah, then they so, start fighting. It all makes sense. Going, pa -chow, yeah. pa -chang, pa -chang. Meanwhile, oh, Ethan wow. is going through an, an alleyway and he's like, now where do I go? And then Benji's like, it doesn't matter because you are done. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. he's oh, not, boy. though, not because the, cool entity, reveal, though. the entity didn't predict that Ethan could beat two people with two sticks for some reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so he's blocked on either end by one goon and one mantis. Uh, they both try to beat him up, they fail miserably. And he has a chance yeah. to kill mantis, he decides to spare her, which is an interesting choice. Um, I, I think it's perfectly in character for him, it's just that I would be curious to hear his point of view on it. I'd be like, this lady has done nothing but try to murder you and she's killed many innocent people already. Um... I don't know. It's almost as if he knows how useful she's going to be later. Mm, I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, like, like I said, know, I feel like it's in character. It's just that I kind of want an acknowledgement that it's like you understand by letting her go what's going to happen next, right? But maybe he knows what will actually happen next. Maybe. So, maybe. Grace is losing. She's losing the fight. She even has a chance to run away at one point again, but she doesn't take it. She keeps trying to fight him. And she gets beaten up. And Punched and thrown to the edge of the bridge. Oh, she, she's in trouble. And he picks up the the the. I think it's like a one of those spring knives. I forget what they're called. Um, switchblade. Switchblades. Is that are they all called switchblades or is it uh, like particular ones? Uh, as far as I know, they're all uh, switchblades. Some uh, it swings out, and some you know just sticks out the top. Mm -hmm. But I think they're all called switchblades. As far as I know, I. I guess I'm not certain, but that's what I think. Well, he's got it, and he's walking toward yeah. her. There it is. It's gonna end. It's all gonna be over. Oh, then man, I can't wait stops. to get into this knife fight with this guy. Stops, and he starts to turn. He realizes Ilsa's standing there, like two meters away, behind him, looking at him. He's like, oh, I hoped it would be you. And yes, uh, at this point, I was like, he's dead. <laughs> like, there's no way. But it makes no sense. This doesn't make any sense. Why is this happening? And uh, you, you want us like you could have probably stabbed him in the back there, actually, and it might be worthwhile considering the scenario and how like you don't. I don't think we're worried about honor at this point, you know. But, uh, or just shoot him. Why would you? What? Do you, what? what how a, do you? How do you shoot? What do you mean? Advantage anyway. She has. She has the advantage of a quite a long sword versus quite a That's short true. knife. She has no business getting no, in just, close enough to be disarmed by him. I just wanted to clarify. And if you pan out during the fight scene, there are plenty of opportunities where she all she has to do is lunge forward and he's dead. But um, yeah, she doesn't It's a do really that. lame fight. Watching I mean, him do the choreography on the bridge is like, oh, fuck off. He's dead. She would just stab him. You, you mentioned shoot. What, what is that? What, what are you referencing? Shooting is it's this thing where using a weapon known as a gun um, you fire a projectile, uh, and then that projectile hits a person. It's like it's sort an of arrow. Yeah, it's like a sophisticated arrow, except you can shoot a lot of them. We haven't seen uh, Ilsa with a bow and arrow before. I don't know why you'd assume she'd have that. And I mean, well, I, I'm fair, just I'm just trying to understand what Fringy means. To be, to be well, so, fair, yeah, guns guns are a relatively new creation. I, assume, um, I, I was going to say this film is about knives and swords. So like. I assume, like, arrows or darts, maybe? Like a crossbow? Well, this was set in, like we said, 2022, 23, something like that. So this gun you're talking about, like is that something that was relatively new? Yeah, or... I don't know if guns existed when they started shooting this film. <laughs> oh, okay. Because, um, yeah, that makes more film, sense. Yeah. With the little sophist... What... Why... Yeah, it's, 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 um... it's, it's this thing. It's like, yeah, it's a little, it's a little mechanical, like, contraption 
you point it at something, and when you, you pull this thing called a trigger, a uh, projectile, a little metal ball, well, they used to be metal balls, now they're more like metal, another shape. And then they okay. they fly and they it's it's a way it's it, you engage people at range essentially is what is what oh these things goodness. do. Oh my goodness, well that sounds really Instead useful. If someone has like a knife yeah. or something, you you want to get close to someone with a knife. Well, yeah, I mean you might. It. I imagine I imagine it's likely that there will be a euphemism about bringing a knife to a gunfight at some point oh, in the future. Yeah. Not right now, but in yeah, the future, to like indicate how foolish it would be for you to go in unprepared. You know, misunderstood a little bit. You'd have to throw a metal ball pretty hard for that to hurt anybody. You would, but these metal balls, the the mechanical device that projects them very quickly, they go like they go a cannonball. They they go. It's like a cannonball, but but like faster. It's so fast that it's imp it's basically impossible to react to it wow. as a human being. Oh my goodness. Well, okay. I know I mean, it's going to change the game. It's going to change like well, everything can, like, about. You can like stab people at a long distance with these. Essentially, is what you're doing, right? Yeah. Some. Well, yeah. Some like that. Like I want to stab someone. Over there. Yeah, that's right. right? And I, I want to, yeah, and I want to do it re multiple times fairly quickly uh, as well. Whoa, whoa, you can but, throw yeah. more this, this than one bullet like at a time. This seems like the hard counter that's right. to knives. Yeah, like, in fact, there are, there are some that you, you can do it 18 times before you need to reload, like, the crossbow. You know, like, 18 times or 30 times. Oh, like Van Helsing. Whoa. Yeah, like that. Wow, but Ilsa. But to be fair, Ilsa hasn't seen Van Helsing, so she oh, wouldn't have known. Well, she has a, isn't a sword Helsing. like a really slow gun or something. Um, what? what? I mean, I I guess you could imagine it as like a really small gun that you like uh, swing around, right? Like, like yeah, you could hit like people a, with a gun. It's it's like yeah, if we if we reverse engineer it, a a a, a long sword. I oh, it's a little bit too confusing, honestly, to sort of piece it's it like together. It's like a long bullet that you hold. Yeah, that's right, a long <laughs> bullet that you hold, and you run up a to somebody and then swing hold. that long bullet at them. Yeah. Okay. Well, but that's that's kind of what she chose to do. Was run up with a long bullet and the swing thing it. About and it she's is, still lost to the. Uh, we only really know that sport. she's extremely highly trained and specialized. Yes. And one of the has best hyper familiarity with close combat, apparently a sword, and plenty of like pistols, rifles, all kinds of things you'd expect, as well as having access to all of those things. I um so uh hmm. Uh this didn't make any sense at all. And this was probably no, her sixth minute on screen in this film, if that. Maybe. And then and then she dies. Uh yeah, she dies. Also fast. Arguably the second most developed character behind Ethan himself. And this is her end. It's uh, incredibly frustrating. It was the first thing me and Freaking talked about after seeing the film. It was the first yeah. topic we really wanted to discuss because both think, of us uh, were relatively familiar with Mission Impossible and Ilsa Faust is cool. Yeah, she is. And now she's gone. And it is lame. It's lame. It is. It's lame. She deserved better than this. Um, like as a character, she she deserved like more. She yeah, deserved and... more story. She deserved more respect. Some people are suggesting like, is it possible she faked it? Is it possible she's not actually dead? It's like I think that the film considers her death as part of the story. I... It's meaningful. Like it, it adds. I to think the, so. The art, I think so. so. Does, like that's what they want. Well, because they do give maybe like a minute uh, of time essentially for the characters to you know, like, a grieve, essentially. You get, like, a minute of time in the story of, like, okay, we're, we're focusing on Elsa. Now it's, now we're done. All right, back to, back to oh, the plot. Yes. Yes. It's a catalyst Very event. I mean, she, she has been reduced, essentially, to a tool to establish the conversion of, like, latest bird of the week to have more well, of a this... role in the plot. So she's been kind of reduced to that, which is a bit miserable. It's sad, yeah. Th th this is the closest I'll come to saying a character was fridged in a derogatory yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, actually. I mean, kind of... The tr well, the it, true it, problem it, is more so that, like, he dies in a nonsensical way. Like, that's that's my primary yeah, issue. In a disrespectful yeah, way, yeah. to be honest with you. But, like, that's it, less it, the it issue. It just seems it's... like it's, uh, well, we're focusing on Grace now, so who cares about Elsa? Yeah. It's kind of how it feels. Like, Grace is the new interesting person who cares about Elsa. And we need, we need some death for our, like, little, se for but, our um, second act low point and our big climactic, you know, like, fi finale of this whole series. Help of people understand, because yeah. um, yeah. I feel like some people, a lot of people will not remember the story of the previous films. 
we meet her as a potential syndicate like worker. She's working for Solomon Lane, but she releases Ethan Hunt when he's uh, captured. And she eventually explains that she worked for MI6. They sent her in undercover to work for Solomon for two years. And she's desperately trying to get out, but that'll involve bringing down the syndicate or at least proving its existence. That's what uh, Rogue Nation's about. And by the end of the film, they capture Solomon together, proof the syndicate, blah, 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 victory. And uh, it's her chance to get out. In Fallout, she's back in. And we're asked to figure out why. And it's because the MI6 won't let her sort of regain her uh, position and entry and stuff until she kills Solomon, specifically because they believe she might be a double agent still. They're not sure. Especially considering that whole film has got shit tons of double agents in it. It's kind of what the film's about. That's what the syndicate's about. Um, X agents and double agents. And so uh, she's like a, a, a shadow to Ethan that she's willing to do all these missions for all these different reasons that... Uh, she's trying to get her life back while he's the kind of person that gave up everything to do with his life in order to facilitate the mission. And so in the film, in Fallout, because Fallout's really fucking good, a lot of scenes are spent with her watching Ethan make different choices and realizing that she wants to be more like him eventually. She's pretty much inspired by him by the end of the film. And the end of the film kind of implies that she's going to be the, the, the not only a, a, a girl of interest in his life, possibly romantically, but that she's going to be a part of the team now. Like, they, they, they've come... Because basically, she's, a, she's an almost antagonist in the film because they need Solomon alive to deal, give him, perform a deal for him for the plutonium. But she's trying to kill him for her own reasons. They bring her in. She's joining the team. There's several good fight scenes, great action scenes, conflict with Ethan until it all gets resolved and they're happy at the end. And it's a really nice ending. Um, and... <laughs> And yeah. this film begins with and she's she... off on her own doing some crazy adventure. We see her for like five seconds, and then she's dead. Because Grace is the focus now. Right, Grace has replaced her, and it sucks. Yeah. Because I really like Grace, but what are you doing? You've destroyed one of your greatest characters to bring in a new one. It, it's strangely I... placed as well, because there is so much of the film left. They do basically have to sidle past the the morning period as quickly as possible in order to play out a huge amount of story without her being present and without many references even back to the moment of her death and so you don't really get the sense that this is any kind of finality i think if you're going to do this you have to do this toward the end of the film if not right at the end of the film no, and it present like a it as low point That's yeah like thing. a second of, yeah and it's, it's a noble sacrifice that you can you can keep the choice dynamic there if you want to but you can build her up more or bring her back into the plot more you can continue building grace up so it doesn't feel like she's just being like foisted into the scene in place of an established character and then uh, toward the end if not right at the end she gives up her life someone does die and it has that sense of finality to it it's a more serious moment because you don't then have to run off on billions of different chase sequences and fights on trains and parachuting off cliffs and all the rest of that stuff as though nothing had really happened well and imagine she and isn't dead really... some people say like she'll be back in part two and it's like could you have fucking imagined faking her death twice Two fake her <laughs> and death. bringing her back again. no one's ever truly gone Oof. And I, I really hate this aspect too of like the sacrifice that oh she died so that you could live. It's like no, you're both stupid. None of you should have <laughs> exactly. been there to fight. It never should have happened. It never like, needed to happen. This scenario should not have happened. Both of you should have exactly. been smart enough, and if not smart enough, just not wanting to die enough to just leave. Why would you get into this unnecessary fight with this guy when he specifically said that one of you would die tonight? And she and knows how fucking dangerous he is. He's, yes, he's horrifying. Like, come on. All the stories about him. Like this is it makes it makes it really difficult for me to sympathize with this idea that Grace is alive because Elsa died. And like I just no, I saw the movie. I was there. They could have just left. They could have turned around and left. Something that's weird as well is that uh it's like a sword. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah, we're doing a sword fight on a bridge now, I guess. Uh, yeah, you just like so she had all that time between leaving that place and having access to presumably like you know the Lutheran Benji in the car, the van, or whatever, or wherever she would have stored something. It's like you couldn't grab a gun when she believes people are chasing her to kill her. Really? But she could go get a sword. Well, apparently she had the sword with her the whole time. It's that stick. Oh, right. But like, okay. Yeah. But, but even then. <laughs> like, even then. I don't like to get why she couldn't get a fucking gun. It's insane. And, uh, and everyone's got guns in these movies all the time. And, and then, guns, you know, just everywhere. furthermore, she should have won that fight. Oh, yeah, that's kind yeah. of just... She has the sword. 
You she have has, to score. You got to. I, I think it's advantage. safe to assume that they're both about as good as each other because she's like really great fighter as well, and she's got a sword and he's got a knife. So yeah, knife he's so fucked fun. over. I imagine Shad lost his mind watching that shit. Well, I mean, most I mean, like, uh, it would. It, it's just. It just the parts don't work in a machine that ultimately shouldn't have been built. And, and it upset the, me because so... Ilsa deserves better. Yes. Yeah. She's really awesome, and they didn't respect what they had. Um, it makes her look like an idiot and incompetent. And then, what does it do for the story? It makes Ethan think, "Man, doesn't it suck that I get women killed?" Which is fucking weird. Yeah. Uh... <sighs> yeah. Died for no good different. reason, and she had barely any screen time. And it's so very clear that they didn't want her in this movie. It's weird, they just used her as a check to cash for something else, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I don't okay. understand, I don't get it. What what happened? Was it that... Was, Did you want to like, have your What happened? Did they... Better? Were they bored of her? Was Rebecca Ferguson, like, was she making another movie or something at the time? Was she, like, busy with Dune? So they couldn't have her in this? Yeah. What I happened? Mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. What happened? Uh, the story doesn't explain it, so we have to assume there's meta shit going on. Oh, um, moving on, I guess. Uh, Venice is lovely. Yeah, how about... Oh, yeah. So, they have one half real key. Widow has the other half. They want both, and they want to sell it to whoever the buyer is that she's being the courier for, I guess, and find out what the key does from that person. That's the hope. That's the plan. Now they know the White Widow is doing a deal on the Orient Express tomorrow, so their plan is to get Grace in as the Widow and wear a mask, and Ethan's going to go in with a mask pretending to be the bodyguard, the brother, they're going to knock out the two real ones, they're going to combine their key with the Widow's key, and then sell that to whoever the buyer will turn out to be on the train, and then presumably trace him, follow him, find out what the key does and how it works, hopefully get the key back, and then go to wherever it does the thing and kill the entity. That is the overall plan. However, there's a hitch, being that the mask-making machine shorts out after making one of the two masks. That's just such horseshit. Because I don't Pathetic. think it's even implied that it was like, fair enough if you can find some way of saying, oh, well, the entity got into I the system that. and blew it up. But I don't think that's in the film. I think that's just no. headcanon. It's not even My... good enough. Why would the entity allow them to make one mask? <laughs> and if it, if it knew that they were making that, why wouldn't it do more to stop them? Hi, Rags. I'll oh, see you, Rags. <laughs> like, if, yeah, it, no, it couldn't have been. It just was, it fucked up. That's got to be it. Because if the entity did it, then why wouldn't he work harder to subvert them? There we go. Prevent because, them from even getting on the Because everything it train. does for me is what it wants to do. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. What I... Can't, there's nothing, it's impossible for there to be anything wrong with it. That's the thing. That it, it predicted that if Tom Cruise didn't have a mask, he'd have to parachute <laughs> off and fly in through a window and knock out a guard and drop the key uh -huh. and it ends up at the feet of Gabriel. It's all part of the plan. To then lose oh, yeah. it to Ethan again. <laughs> and lose it. <laughs> I think what they could have done to make this interesting, instead of it just randomly breaking the mask maker, right, the mask machine, is that in order to make a mask, it has to connect to the face database of people, right? It has to connect to servers and stuff. And so Ving Rhames and... Simon Pegg, they say, all right, Ethan, we've got the mask maker, but once we, but once we plug it in to make it work, it has to connect to the database. We're only going to be able to make one mask before the AI like stops us or shuts it down or we can't use it anymore. Oh, so that yeah. means we can't make two masks. We can only make one. So one of you is going to have to go without a mask. And then there's it's that over. Bit in, um, in, there's that episode of Battlestar Galactica where they have to connect the network in order to... I can't remember what they're trying to do, but as the network is connected, they have like the visual representation of the Cylons hacking through the firewall, and they have to get the job done before it gets through the final firewall. And so like, you have an equivalent mechanic, the machine is on, it's connected to the network, 
but the entity is hacking through the defense systems really quickly and so it gets like it makes one and maybe gets halfway through making the second one and they have to shut it off because otherwise the entity has access to all the systems it already has access to i now realize that wouldn't work but you know something like that um uh, I like your idea, Rags, but if that was how it was in the film, I would be like, why is it letting them cook even the one mask? The entity would be in the device. Maybe it, it takes... Short, it maybe it, it maybe Ving, Rames, and Benji, like, we can work together to stall it for just a little bit, um, but once we connect, it'll know, and we can only get one mask worth out of it. Until you um, of... Yeah, but they say they can do something special because they're really Attack talented. The mainframe? Yeah, they're going to hack the mainframe, and then they're going to hit the enter key, and then they'll be in, and they'll, they'll, it'll be something special. It'll be like, you know, we, we've been able to, da, 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 we can do this, we can stall it for just a little bit, just enough to download the data for one mask, and then it'll be too late. We only get one mask worth out of it, instead of it just randomly breaking again. Yeah, because it did that it randomly, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, uh, so anyway, the, the, there's a thing from Grace where she's trying to figure out what she's supposed to do now because she feels she owes them because Ilsa died for her. So she says, like, I'll uh, I'll help you with this operation, but then I'm out. And then Ethan basically says, nah, you can't ever be out. The entity will want you. Governments will want you. You can't live your life basically anymore. And there's some wonderful dialogue again where Luther says, if you leave, your life won't be measured in years or even months. And you know exactly what he's saying. And then the camera pans over to Benji and he goes, it will be measured in hours. I was just like, that's, that's, that's what Luther meant, yeah, I got it. But it would be short, it's, what, it's fine. Um, and then Ethan says, I swear to you that your life will always matter more to me than my own. I quite like the line. That yeah, I like say, that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it gets boosted because the response from her is, you don't even know me. And she starts tearing up, and it's some just doing a good job in this film. Because she really is. She the impression I get is that she's overwhelmed by how much these people are willing to do for her when she spent her whole life not trusting anybody because of how much everyone's an asshole, basically. So, like, oh my god, I found people who aren't assholes. That's that's amazing. And then uh, Ethan says, "What difference does that make?" Which, yeah, that's that's Ethan. He doesn't really care. He just to make sure people are okay. Stuff. Thumb is up for that exchange. My thumb is up. So, uh, is up. Luther says, I've modified our comms to be analog and immune to the entity, and it makes you want to fucking kill yourself. You're like, why didn't you do this an hour ago when the movie started? Then you do this on the miss. <laughs> yeah, when the movie started. <laughs> yes. And then I thought it was this funny. This is one of those, yeah. He's like, I'm gonna, you do. I'm gonna take my hard drive that I'm pretty sure the entity's on, and I'm gonna go study it in my secluded basement to understand it. And I just love the fact that he, he's like, he, he, you won't see him again now, and he's gonna turn up in part two with, like, I've got a solution on how to kill the entity. Like, that's all that's gonna happen. We're just, he's gonna be gone for a while, then he'll come back. He's gonna, yeah. He's the gonna turn up is, with something important that they will need. The, uh, all the attack is still in there, so there's a good chance the entity's listening to him, but even if it isn't, it should have cameras, street things to keep track of everybody, recognize everybody. Luther's not putting on a fucking mask, because nobody does. And if it, like, tr he says, I need to go to a secluded area where no one can find me, and I'm just like, I feel like you're going to trigger something that can make someone track you. And at this point, the entity should probably have goons ready to, to follow any of them anyway. It's got, like, worldwide well, capabilities. I don't know. Build no more. Goons. <laughs> we only, there's only two left. But he's going to go do it in his basement. It's going to be great. So, he does say, though, Ethan, what is your objective? Kill the entity. What about killing Gabriel? He says, no, no, we don't kill him, because we need to know what it unlocks. And then he says, well, hey, think about it. One way, Gabriel kills you, the entity wins. The other way, you kill Gabriel, and the entity wins, because then you've killed the only person that knows what those keys do. And I was just thinking to myself, like, what? We could have killed Ethan a million times by now. I thought the whole point was he was trying to keep him alive. Is anyone uh, else confused by this? I was like, uh, huh? uh, hmm. I thought that everybody's impression was that the the entity wanted to torment Hunt. That's why it hasn't worked very hard to kill him. Oh, uh oh. But then oh, Luther's no. like, the entity clearly wants either you dead or, or Gabriel or. dead. 
Or is the correct read meant to be that Luther got this one wrong? Luther just doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Well, the thing is, I think because no, that... the plot the plot wants us to believe. I think that because you know, he's reminding Ethan that he can't kill Gabriel, even though he really wants to, presumably because you know Gabriel has killed someone who really matters to him. But for any of that to work, then that requires that it didn't want to always kill him. It does actually want him to to live. I would just, yeah, no, he has to. It has to want him to live, otherwise he would already be dead. It's so weird, though, because he's very explicit. He says, the machine worries that you could capture Gabriel and get the answers you want. Uh, it's relying on one of you two killing the other. What? Whichever one happens, that... the entity wins. And then Tom Cruise but says, then I think you're right. But then you'd have to conclude that when it set him up to have that fight with uh, Mantis, that it knew that he was going to win that fight, that it was only meant to delay him. But then it also means that the AI potentially didn't factor in that if uh, Ethan Ethan would spare Mantis, and then everything that would stem from that either. Like, yeah, it means it, that he would have got that me, one wrong. It'll factor some stuff in and know the future, but sometimes it just doesn't, and it fucks itself over yeah. completely. What if Mantis yeah. had brought a gun? Exactly. It was over. Yeah, exactly. I guess it knew that she wouldn't. It's like, what? And if your point what is if, just to delay like, Ethan, Ethan, why would you burn Paris for that? Or... Yeah, why why would you do that? Because she's like she seems to be a really valuable asset for you. Pretty OP. You're only using her to delay Ethan for a bit. And then not understanding or factoring in really like the potential consequences of something that you know Ethan might choose to do. It's not exactly out of character of sparing her. And then everything that stems from that, it's it's bullshit. And it's also just bullshit. I is this our um so I guess this is just, we all know that Gabriel knows the location of the sub. Why would Gabriel know the he location of the sub? doesn't. Oh, he just knows that it unlocks the sub. Yeah, I, this, is, this is what gets confusing about this film. We, as team heroes, assume the key will go into some kind of lock and it'll allow you to do something with the entity. Maybe control it, maybe kill it. That's what we want to do. We want to kill it, but we don't really know. Gabriel knows that key fits a lock that does let you control slash destroy it. The chief of, or the director of intelligence knows that that thing is in the Sevastopol and he knows where the Sevastopol is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, Gabriel <laughs> decides to kill him because he's the only person who knows that. And I think the point there is to just make it so that no one can find the Sevastopol, therefore ensuring the entity's safety. Which seems, which seems like a crazy risky move, right? That the guy is like, yeah, I'm the only person who knows and he's using this as leverage, but surely he'd be smart enough to know that, yeah, just you can't just kill me because Funny. if you kill me, then everything, then, then the information will get leaked, or there's actually there's something that'll happen on my death, or I have a lot of people here to guard me on this on this train, and they'll kill you. Like he'd have a well, he wouldn't just go purely by trust, right? The evil Gabriel. Yeah, he does have such a he's such an idiot in that scene because Gabriel's like. So, you haven't told anyone else where that sub is. You're the only one that knows. And he goes, yes. And then Gabriel kills him. <laughs> and I was just like, why do you think he's asking you that? It was like, come on, have you seen movies? Like, he, he, wants, he wants to know that he doesn't have to kill anyone else. It's obvious. Come on. Yeah, when the obvious answer is, well, yes and no. You see, if I don't get off this train, if I don't leave this compartment, my men will make sure that the world knows where the where the sub location well, yeah, is so either you deal with that or you talk to me he's got to meet with someone within x amount of time that if he you know if he yeah. doesn't then they'll if release the all the information does, yeah if the train doesn't reach the destination or it, one of a million contingencies a a person of average intellect would be able to cook well, up the, and ready that's funny right it's like well but who is this guy and it's like oh he's just you know the director of intelligence <laughs> That's his actual role. <laughs> like, the, oh. the man's the man's role is a person who directs intelligence, and he's an idiot. <laughs> Everyone's an idiot. Yeah, yeah so, but so the still, is... in the in the land of the blind, like, come on, yeah, like, you, still, even then, you know, the director of intelligence. So they have to come up with a new plan because the machine broke. Everything is the same except Ethan will now no. get onto the train via. Uh, He's going to try and jump on when it turns a corner and goes slower on his little bike. Okay. And as anyone would know, if you're familiar with the marketing for this film, that we haven't had the stunt yet. The big stunt, the big bike stunt. So that's probably going to be how he gets on the train. 
maybe in ferrets, even in the little intro, quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and she says, promise me you'll be on that train. He says, I promise. Now, I have a question. Uh-oh. Very chunky question. Had he oh, gotten boy. the brother mask, he would have gotten on the train with uh, Grace, right? That's the idea? Yes. So, she's getting on the train as Grace and then putting on the mask, right? She wouldn't go on as Vanessa Kirby w Widow because he's already on, so that would arouse, like, levels of suspicion. I assume she's going as herself. Mm-hmm. That's already pretty risky. But that's actually not where my issue lies. Oh, oh. We can, if we just allow that, that's a risky move, but whatever. She gets on, she puts on the mask and stuff. Tom Cruise is going to have to come in a crazy way. Just like, by the way, Mantis comes in a crazy way. She jumps off of, like, one of the, some kind oh, of God. stand thing onto She's the She's on a bridge, train. isn't she? Yeah. She jumped off the bridge onto Why the train. Why can't she go in normally? Because that wouldn't look as cool. I actually think that is the correct answer, because the entity could, of course, cover it digitally. You know? I don't know what that's about. She could have just gone in normally. Tom Cruise. Is there any reason why he can't get on the train normally? Um, well, he's, a, he's for, um, a wanted man. There's, there's relatively good just... reason that he shouldn't just turn up at a train station. He might get spotted by anybody who's there, and he might get spotted by cameras, blah, 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 blah. And he can't wear the mask. So, of course, he's going to have to do some elaborate stunt, right? There's no other thing he could do, right? Hmm. Yes. There's one of them... Things that we know work, but also things that we have seen work in Mission Impossible 1 and 4, specifically. Uh, I mean, when it's leaving, you just run onto it? No, that's not... No? What, what else? Hmm. God damn it. I'll give you a <laughs> clue. Just because the face machine broke does not stop him from doing some other things. Oh, he could just do, like, more minimalist prosthetics. He could literally just wear a Halloween mask. <laughs> Look, he, that's the fundamental. But yes, he could wear the classic makeup. Yeah, the, the they more still normal have makeup. The more normal makeup that just makes him look a bit different, but it's still him rather than a complete... Yeah, dye his hair, give him copy. a fake beard and glasses, fades even, you'd be fine. Yeah. And he gets on, no problem. Instead of having to try and ride onto it with a bike <laughs> and then jump onto it. So, um, I don't know. That... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. He could have just tried that. It just cancels out the entire, like, why don't you just go in normally, bro? <laughs> <laughs> could have wore a fucking cowboy hat and a goatee. People would probably not recognize you. It's, uh... Yeah, I don't know. I think that's really disappointing because it just, all the things that happen as a result of this are insane and crazy and cause all kinds of calamities all would have been avoided. There must be a million other secret-ish ways to get on. I mean, they get a whole fucking coffin on the train at one point somehow without <laughs> anybody apparently noticing that. So there must know. be other ways. It's like someone says they wanted him to do the stunts, so they crowbarred it in. It's like, yeah, but they didn't. they don't have to. They justify so many stunts. So many action movies. Just a shame. I don't know. Well, it's just, you know, obviously, like, the Halo jump, right? That was a stunt that was... Th that was a stunt that was contextualized in the story itself. Yeah, Hanging yeah. off the side of the plane, even. You know, that one was... It's just I think like, they yeah, said you gotta get um, on the plane. It's, it's disguised as a carrier jet, and that they'll be so small when they drop out of it that they wouldn't be detected by conventional, like, scanners and stuff. But it's not, it's not the most, you know, safest way to do it. And then there's a storm that adds the variable. Yeah. Very straightforward and cause and effect. I don't know why we've not, we're not doing that anymore. <sighs> wasn't that the story when they were coming up with ideas for the film and before the story even, Tom Cruise had said, I want to ride a motorcycle off a cliff. And basically they were brainstorming stunts before they were brainstorming script ideas. Well, as far as I know, that's how Fallout was made. Hmm. Huh. I don't get it, you know, like, it, it, it's really weird that, like, the same teams made both films, because there's so much that I would argue could be learned from Fallout, but they're the ones that did it, so. 
Oh no. Uh, so Mantis knocks out some train guards and she unlocks Gabriel's coffin. I don't know how else to say <laughs> that. Like, oh, uh, are you are you on the techno coffin? The techno coffin. Oh, something I highlighted. I don't know if you would be interested to think about it, Rags, but like he could have oh, just used conventional makeup to get on the train. Could he not? Uh, yeah, he could just like put, you know, makeup and because they do it for. I mean, like I assume that movies exist in their universe, right? Well, we so they have it. like prosthetics and makeup and. Remember he went, when he went to the Kremlin? He had the. That's right. He on. did. He had the. He did when he went to the Kremlin. And in Mission Possible One, the first mission we see, he's dressed up as yep, like an he's old the man. old one. Yeah, in the white tux. That's right. And uh, um, I, I thought that was yeah, a good compromise because you get to keep Tom Cruise for the most part. We can still kind of see him. We know. And also, like, I know it's Tom Cruise in there acting. You know, like, I'm not so, like, I don't have such a short memory that I don't forget that this is the famous actor Tom Cruise because he has a mask on. Like, I, no, I know he's he's doing the acting wearing a mask and contextualizes him being a secret agent wearing a mask to hide his identity, you know. I hate it when it's like, no, we got to see his face. It's like, I know it is. I know that's Tom Cruise. He's acting in everything, and he's got an actual mask on, and that's cool. But um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just more... So maybe I'm... Gabriel's uh, coffin's weird. He seems to be communicating with the entity in this coffin. Um, don't I know... guess that's what I'm supposed to take away from it, because he has the custom-made helmet that has the eyeball digital thing on the and front, it's and it's got like... <laughs> yeah, and it's got like the, the gas, like tubes for him to breathe i assume and yeah. he's like in there like a vampire i'm like what are you what is going on what is this thing Again, what's up with the techno a, coffin i, I worry a weird creative choice of all the ways the entity has to communicate with it. it could have used a phone it could have used <laughs> vr goggles privilege goggles whatever you want to call them oh, yeah. but no coffin coffin is the thing they chose to do i don't understand what they were going for there and I have a feel like a lot of people are saying all these crazy nonsense pieces of poo poo that are everywhere. Like the second film will explain it all and contextualize it all. I worry that the techno coffin will never be mentioned again. <laughs> it's, like... it's so casually just like in the film. Like, I come to that? rise on the train. Oh, I don't know. Uh, um... that, that's the whole plan, isn't it? So, yeah, so Ma uh, Mantis jumps off the bridge, she gets in, she twats the guards, she goes to the coffin, which is just Tech there and no one has spotted it before. And she has coffin. to unlock it, yeah. Why, well, why, don't, you just, unlock it, so... why don't you just walk onto the train like a normal human being? I don't being? know. I actually did don't you, know. Did you know, like, I, I think that it's like with Tom Cruise, right? Like, why didn't Tom Cruise just get on the train, right? Why don't you just buy a ticket? Because I'm pretty sure that the people who run this train would be more than happy to accept your money in exchange for a ticket to get on the train. It doesn't take that much convincing. You can just get on the train like a normal person. And if anything, it's less suspicious than lugging around a techno coffin. <laughs> I'm inclined to agree. Just get on the train. Is, what they're are they built for the train. As they they're walk built up for and passengers. Down. The staff walk up and down, and they they go past this techno coffin. What what do they think every time they see it? And who moved where, it? Where did that come from? <laughs> did they not Why go? Is there a coffin what are we here? moving, Bob? And he's this like, is I don't weird. Know, and Frank. how do we fit it in this <laughs> weird, like fenced off area? Why is it making this weird whoop 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 whoop, whoop noise every time I go past? That's uh, a bit that's, suspicious. Gen Z techno coffins, man, they're everywhere these days. I don't TikTok understand generation. the techno coffin. It's <laughs> I don't get like, it. They, they made the props and everything, the I sound did. effect, the noise, and I'm like, what? Is yeah. this ultimately leading to probably yes. nothing it will probably be forgotten that it was even a thing and then it makes me think about the questions of how is gabriel in communication with the entity does he have like a microchip in his brain is he a cyborg what's going on here with the techno coffin and the vampire stuff i don't know is he actually and a robot is that his charging know. station is that where he is has he to, an to sleep there every now he and then he might be a robot i don't know he might be fill this the batteries. is the one moment and this is something a little bit later but that i was like oh god oh don't do it <laughs> don't make him a robot cuz remember ethan said like he thought he was dead it was like oh going to be a robot <laughs> so uh we see uh gabriel then fucks up all the controls the ability to hit brake and stuff and kills the people operating the train and um he attaches he hangs one of the drivers doesn't he he hangs yeah, a driver from is it the cord for the, the, the horn? yeah it's the choo-choo string yeah. and he he 
he hangs him up on the choo-choo string. Why? And so every once in a while you hear the choo-choo. And I'm like, why did you do that? Is the idea What's the that, point of that? Is, is the idea that it implies that there are still train operators there? Is that the point? Oh, yeah, that could be it. But then they would have noticed that something was wrong when it didn't slow down for corners well, or slow down but, at stations. But that's things. okay. But Platoon, that doesn't matter because no one notices that the train is... Like, nobody it's, knows it's, it's a runaway it's train. It's a runaway train, but it's not really a runaway train because it stays on the tracks and no one goes like, oh, and then like, oh my gosh, the train is so fast. And someone go up there and tell those crazy guys to slow down. You know, we can't be too ahead of schedule or like what? No one notices. It's pointless. Why make the train speed up? Just go like the train is scheduled to arrive at a certain time. Why not just have that be part of the plan? It's way less suspicious and it involves the not destruction of an entire train oh, like yeah, don't you want is... to leave as little of a footprint as possible that is the, the big realization about this entire scene why why trying. did they crash the train why did the entity want that why oh sap pace this is literally the only thing i can think of yeah it's like better. to cover what tracks to most to people get live rid of what evidence <laughs> yeah uh, virtually it, everyone I mean, lived the poor it, conductor it is really guy. interesting it's interesting to yeah they did actually um it's interesting to think about the way that the set pieces are bound together in Fallout compared to here. How, like, just seemingly disconnected each of the ones are here and how plot uh, integral the ones are in uh, Fallout. Well, yeah, uh, final set piece. Why is Ethan hanging off a fucking helicopter? It's like, because Henry Cavill's in there with the detonator to the bombs. To get well, away. To get away from the blast radius. Yeah, and why, is, and why are the bombs going off? It's like, it's because the Syndicate want to create such a devastating event that it brings the world together as a result. That's their logic. That's what They believe that most so peace, now? the best of peace comes after the greatest of war. And so they're going to so detonate gonna near a, a water source. It's going to poison the whole world or a significant portion of it. And, you know, Solomon Lane and his apostles believe that that will bring about the best peace Earth has ever known. Like, got it. Okay. And now they have a fight in a helicopter and it's a cool fight. Yep. And you have a cool fight with Ilsa and Solomon and Benji. And then, and then it's the same as well with, like, the chase through, uh, through Paris. It's like, why did that happen? Well, it's because... Uh, it's because Ethan specifically sabotaged the plan that was being developed, that had been developed by uh, the group that he was with, in order to, you know, minimize casualties, essentially. And because of that, as a result of that, he just ends up getting into a chase with the police. You, you like, by the way, the... we haven't mentioned really at all since the beginning, the agent people. They just, we just, they've yeah, been they're popping just, up. they're just... They've been around, but, like, they were relevant to the story, <laughs> yeah, essentially. The, the one time the film kind of gives uh, something here is that they're having a conversation. It's what we mentioned, where one of them just goes, what if what if Ethan has a good reason to do what he's doing? And the other guy's like, whose team are you on? And it's just embarrassing. That's all they have. I feel is bad it explained, for them. I, I think this might be just something I missed, but is it explained how they knew to be on the Orient Express? They in say that the White Widow is there, place. and that they believe that Ethan would be there if the White Widow's there. Okay. Yeah. But then, so they just but buy a ticket, go. get a table, they walk on normally, notably, and yep. they sit down, yeah. and they wait. <laughs> like normal human beings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, part of me is thinking, or so I'm thinking, right? So I think the Orient Express, as it runs today, I think it is supposed to be like how it would actually be done back in the like 1920s or something 1930s 1920s yeah. 30s right so okay i think it's like still coal powered and even like coal heated and stuff um something okay because they specifically have gabriel shoveling more coal in there um to like fuel the train even more so it can go fast i guess i'm mm -hmm. thinking is there a point to any of that why it needs to be specifically the Orient Express, I, I would assume for the fact that it's still like a coal-powered train. Is that a... Is that plot relevant in any way? I, so. or is I, it just, just, I don't think so. The place that... Cause it's a memorable. Known. It's a memorable name, and it gives the impression of class and like, sophistication. Much like going to like Paris or Venice for no very good reason. Um, it just gives yeah, the impression of class, I, I think. Which is fine. I'm just like, all right. Yeah, uh, so the meeting is about to take place. The White Widow, and I'm not kidding, is supposed to be meeting with Kittredge in about two minutes. And then she's like, I need to go to my room. Don't disturb me until the meeting. So weird, because it's about to start. He's probably there already. 
but lucky for our that heroes. That would be a great that'd be a great naked gun joke where you have the person go into the cabin, right? Like don't wake me until the meeting and then you, you don't even leave. It's like literally just like a minute passes and he knocks on the door because it's a minute away and that's the joke. Well, they did it for real in this. Oh, okay. That explains why it wasn't funny. I, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. So um, she goes in, and they're doing a thing of her being, like, stressed out, the widow. She's like, oof, I'm, I'm a bit in way over my head, oh my god. And she looks around, and she spots herself. Uh, obviously, we know it's Grace, about to take the position of the White Widow. And the first thought I had was like, wow, her brother is a meter away behind that door. All she has to do is say anything. Just like, What the? What, yeah, just say anything at all. But uh, she manages to not, and Grace... Uh, does the little injection thing that knocks her out. You hear the thud of her body, and the brother's like, hmm, that's weird. Are you okay, sister dear? Sister I care so much about and know so well. Hello, sister Ura. How are you doing in there? And then she opens the door, and it's Grace in her outfit. It's completely different from the White Widow's. And she has the wrong eye color. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh no. He just doesn't seem to notice really at all. He's What's like, so oh, great? you changed. Is that not only did uh, he not notice? I've seen basically everyone talk about this. Like, well, it's, it's such the, an it's obvious mistake. It's the first mistake. thing you notice. It's the first thing. It's like your eye color is different. Which because you but... look at someone in their eyes. Well, that least that's what I do. I guess I don't know what everyone else does. But when I'm looking at someone, like talking to them, I look at their eyeballs, right? A lot so of time, maybe yes. I'm the crazy one here. Maybe I'm the crazy one, and that's why everyone's been looking at me weird this whole time. I don't know. But I feel like that'd be something you notice immediately, especially if it's your sister. I would notice if my, I'd notice if my sister, or brother, or mother, or father, or really a lot of the people I know had randomly different eye colors. You notice when they dye their hair, you know. So it's, um, um, it's not even just that though. It's the it's the weird noises. It's the change of clothes, and it's just like I'm going in here. Don't disturb me. Hello, I'm back. It's like, <laughs> okay. And uh, you and, live in a world oh, wait, where wait. people wear fucking masks all the time. Something that is doubly, triply, quadruply weird about this is that, think about this from the, the filmmaking standpoint, right? In order to film the scene, you obviously have the Miss um, Kirby, I guess her, her name is, I forget her first name, Valentina, whatever. Vanessa. Um, Vanessa. Vanessa Kirby. Uh, she is playing her character White Widow and Grace is White Widow, right? That same actress is playing both of those roles, right? Which right. means in order to have this fuck up, they had to physically go through the effort of giving her contacts that would recolor her eyes as brown. Yes. Yeah. Which is really weird that they would go through that effort when it makes problems for the movie. It is so if you odd. just you just leave the actress at her eyes as they are because of course you would because that's what they would do in the movie but you instead decided to make her wear contacts which is a fuck up i don't get it yeah they they had to put in a bit of effort to make this screw up yeah weird because uh in the past movies we've seen them put in contacts to match eye color and we've also seen in uh ghost protocol They've actually done tests before to make sure you are who you are. They do DNA tests. They did it on uh, Ethan once. I was so surprised to see it. I, I, I was like, fuck, this is... They never do this in any other movie. Like, to make sure you're not, like, impersonating somebody. Oh, well. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. That was a little bit embarrassing. That they fucked all that up and that the brother didn't notice anything. Should probably check for masks, which, by the way, this film has characters do. But not whenever it actually matters. Yep. Oh. If anything, it's used for it's used for comedy because the when when uh they with salt and pepper they're at the, the uh, they're at the, the 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 airport the place where the planes live they like reach it from people's faces and like try to pull at them and it's like it's like funny because they're real people and they're strangers and to them it's just yeah. this random person just went up and grabbed their face. It's played for comedy, which is you know it's amusing. Yeah, sure. But like you can't. But then, what about the other times you don't do it? You know. 
you think of all the times, this would be the time because you've got this collection of characters, all of whom have been duped by masks before or they've seen the mask before. They all have acute well, knowledge of who's after them and what technology well, they have. And this is the most important meeting most of them have had in their entire lives. You'd think of Considering all the who the buyer is. Yes. You know, doubly so, triply so. So, moving so, right along. I thought it was funny, but right they along. don't address the... Um, Getting the, the voice information, they just say they have it. In MI3, it's actually a scene I quite like, where they have to get the uh, voice of Philip Seymour Hoffman. They have to get him to read out a selection of words, and then they have to process it and form it into the uh, the thing they put on their throat. That's how they get, you know, the voice changer. It's not just like you you don't just tell it, like, I want the voice of this person, and then it knows. But um, Also, a funny sketch that. on Taskmaster. They skip that on this. Uh, I, I don't know, it's just, I guess it's good to skip because it would have caused them a shit ton of problems. Get the White Widow's voice lines all done before. Yeah, I don't know. It's it, That's less of a problem because you just have to assume maybe they're working with old audio from her that they've recorded or something. Sure. Just I can assume for that. So, the, uh, I thought it was interesting that she went into Does Grace a... have to do the accent? Oh, uh, I don't. I uh, I've never thought about it beyond just if you have the thing, you have the voice. I don't think it's worthwhile to even try. And <laughs> All right, yeah. All delve right. into that. Uh, the fact that they were about to have their meeting, she walked off to her uh, room, makes you think like so. It's lucky at all that she did that. It's really lucky that she didn't go in there and just sit in with her brother. If that had happened, Grace was fucked. Mm -hmm. And then it's also fucked that. Imagine she left the door open. She just went. I just want to sit down a sec. What? The yeah. whole mission's fucked. And it's just like, yeah, but, you know, we're just hoping it kind of works out. It's like, okay, remember in the original plan? The original plan was to knock them both out together. That's yep. what the, the... And so it's like, yeah, you'll go in alone, Grace. You can take on the White Widow and her brother at the same time, right? Sure. And they don't give her a gas or something that can easier take out these people? She has to, like, stab them with the injector. And there's an additional convenience there as well, because she remains unconscious for exactly the right amount of time. I can't believe they got... Uh, anything had gone wrong, then like, she could have woken up too soon, yeah. or like, there's plenty of failure points in that situation. I just don't understand at all how you, you wouldn't have gone for a sedative that would have... Like, Lasted a bit longer. Yeah, why would you like cut it that minutes? fucking close? Like 10 minutes. It screws up everything. Uh, it, do, it, it actually does screw up everything yeah nearly it, it could have screwed everything up even worse but it screwed it up real bad yeah um, so yeah anyway Grace is now White Widow Bodyguard does not have any suspicions it's gonna be great uh, she also acts pretty retarded she doesn't uh, really capture the White Widow at all I guess I would give room for that because she has no idea who the White Widow is So yeah and I guess it's a little impromptu and they can be yeah, comedy right. with it. I don't think they really use it for that, but they could have been. It'll give Grace's character a chance to make things up on the fly, see her improvisational skills, you know? And so she meets with Kittredge, which is supposed to be a big old shock to us, but, I mean, we know that he and all the intelligence agencies desperately want the keys, and they have good reason to want the keys. It wasn't really a surprise to me. I, I was curious what the film wanted me to think. Like, am I supposed to think he's evil? I don't think so. This is just he's just trying to get the keys, I guess. But I don't know why he's there as opposed to someone representing. But he said all the evil stuff at the beginning. He did say evil things. This is true. True. Uh, so they have a conversation that's pretty much as simple as you've got one of the keys, uh, I guess. Like the brother says, we've only got one of the keys, and then she's like, no, actually, we have both. And the brother's like, what the fuck? And it's such a funny moment because with everything else, like, hey, br hey, bro, he clicking on yet? No. This is clearly I, I, something's up. <laughs> I don't understand how he couldn't figure it out. How it not, it, even if it wasn't any one thing, which any one thing probably should have been a big enough giveaway, she was wearing different clothes, she inexplicably has a different eye color, and she doesn't behave the same way at all, and, yeah, she's got both of the, uh, the keys. Like, come on! Yeah, then she tells him to go away. <laughs> He's like, okay. Like, oh, okay, yeah, alright, bye. Yeah, everything she does is designed to be detected. And then she goes that one step further when she, she tries to make the deal and says that, you know, you have to protect me even from myself. I won't remember that I made this deal. <laughs> why, so why don't we talk about that? Talking about? Uh, yeah, let's, please. So while she's talking to Kittredge, she's like, 
you know, the deal in total is I get 100 million, is it, sent to a, a thing of my choice, a bank account of my choice. You get yeah. the keys, and um, I want something more. And he's like, okay, I'm listening. And she's like, well, first of all, I'm going to want protection because everyone's going to be coming after me when I give you the keys. And then she says, I also want you to protect Grace and gives him a passport of her and says, like, I know it's going to seem strange. And he's like, I, I know who this is. And she's like, yes, well, I want you to put all the effort in to make sure, like, no one hurts her. And uh, even even from me, I'm, I'm going to... I don't want anyone to know that I'm protecting her. I'm going to come after her. In fact, I'm not even going to... I'm going to pretend like I don't fucking remember this conversation. I, I'm going to... You know, and you're thinking as an audience member, oh, that's very clever because the next time he mentions it to White Widow, she's going to be like... I don't know what you're talking about. And he'll be like, ha ha ha, very good, because it's already set up. What's more uh, likely to happen <laughs> next time is there was no conversation. Somebody who was disguised as me drugged me. <laughs> Everyone on the train. Yeah, I was drugged on the train and you some... fucking I never met you. Even talking to me. <laughs> it's not that I won't remember this conversation. I know that it didn't happen. Not only that, I know that she, I will, supposed to happen. she will ask yeah. Kittredge, what did I say to you? And he'll be like, well, you wanted me to protect some girl called Grace? And she'd be like, what? Oh, I'm going to uh, fucking. No. Like, <laughs> no <laughs> Foiled <course>. again! <laughs> Yeah. yeah there's, uh, sort of... it, it, there's no way that he would do it because she would just be like, "You weren't even talking to me, you idiot!" Like that, that's, that's yeah. so completely different. Stupid. I don't know why Grace thought that would work. I don't know why the film thought that would work. It was super embarrassing. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, it's just they don't need to think about it too much. It's just like, eh, well, it's fine. Um. So anyway, we cut over to uh, Mantis kills the director of intelligence's bodyguards, and she facilitates the meeting between Gabriel and himself. And that's where you get all the information. I don't like how that fight where she takes the two guards out, that's just like, oh, it's lame. And I think I said before that whenever you have a little woman who's taking on some big boys, fighting them, I feel like Extraction 2 is kind of where my, my brain's going to be going for, you know... Uh, for, for sort of the standard right now for whether or not it's believable or not. Yeah, she gets quite... She's, it's a tough fight for her, um, but Mantis kind of yeah. fucking wrecks them with ease. Yeah, and they're just... They don't try hard enough. I don't believe... These guys just aren't trying hard enough. Um, so this is the... We find out all about the Sevastopol and its history. We kind of covered that at the beginning because I, I just felt like it's better to do it then. And um, as we've kind of talked about already, uh, Gabriel kills him. Because he just, I guess, wants to protect the Sevastopol. Only, what to consider is that they heard everything he said about the Sevastopol, him and Mantis. Those are two people who now know. Gabriel well, is, is, you know, I, I, is pretty... pretty. Of course. I don't know. Well, before, before you do that, though, because he kills him because it's like, you can't know. The secret has to... You can't keep it. What if the dude recorded it? How do well, you yeah, know well, that he didn't record it? Why like you... an off-site... There's so many okay, issues with it, because it's like, what if he lied? What if he said, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm the only one who knows, because he thinks that gives him more leverage when he knows that other people yeah, know. Yeah, exactly, and that's not true. Like, the rea you just don't know shit. You really don't. You don't know anything about and what's happening. And then someone happening. says, well, they do, because the algorithm can tell whether he's lying. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, like, it's so useful. It's a like one-size-fits-all. Uh, but yes, this is the point where he's like, you know, the entities... Yeah. They're weird. It's weird. It's so fucking weird. Uh, I got caught off guard at this cinema. I was like, wait, what the fuck? So, the the shot itself is they're both standing, look at him bleeding out, and then the shot flips to the other side of the room, and and Gabriel looks back at Mantis and says, uh, you will betray us because Ethan Hunt spared your life, and then starts attacking her. And it's like, whoa, what the fuck? Where did, where did this come up? Do you have, like, a, a live connection to the entity that gives you, like, updates you... as to future changes? Why would you tell her? Why would you give her any warning whatsoever about what you're about to do? It's that's exactly what the character, when written well, would do. He would he would stab her, and we'd be like, "Whoa, what the fuck?" And then she'd be like, "Why?" And then he'd be like, "You know, he might not even say anything. Why would he? He knows. Yeah, why would he? It's he knows, and she's about to be dead." This is so. where the usefulness of the personality comes in to explain why they would do certain things. If he likes to, if he's that he kind like, of guy, he. Nah. he no, why? Never tell her. Why would he tell her beforehand? It just gives her a chance her, to. I, I guess her, you just want her to know because it's well, like more of a sting. She's a really good fighter too. She's a really good fighter, and you're giving her warning. And as we, of course, no, learned, I mean, this, I don't mean like give her a warning. Spectacularly, 
I don't, oh, I don't mean give a warning. Okay, I mean, like, right. explain as she's dying on the floor. Oh, sure. If, if you want to do that, sure. Yeah, but yeah, like, that's, yeah, but he wouldn't, know. yeah, this is stupid. <laughs> like, you're just dumb. Let's, so, it, you might as well just say it now. Because he narrowly she escapes survived. being killed by him. Yes, she she nearly or, shoots sorry, him in the he head. Nearly, yeah, yeah, he nearly she escapes nearly, being killed nearly by her. She nearly shoots yeah. him in the head, and she survives this attack and relays incredibly important information to Ethan later yeah, on. Yeah, this needs, if we and slow also, it down and rewind again. Let's slow down. <laughs> yes. There's so much. Like, I kind of want to talk about the whole, like, before he even attacks her, this means that this is information that he got just now, right? Because he, he I acts assume on it so. just now. So either it that's what the coffin was telling him the side yeah, of the coffin. E either he he's out of the side. He's out of the techno coffin. Either it's an earpiece it. that's directing him with new information. Like the entity's like, oh hey, Ga oh Gabriel, Gab I just, I just, I typed in a few ones. Yeah, news zero. flash from the future. Oh my God, you'll never guess. So Mantis is gonna betray us apparently. And Gabriel's like, wow, what? really? And he's like, yeah, because she got spit. It's dumb, but yeah, you got to take her out, buddy. I, I would yeah. like this movie better, by the way. <laughs> the entity's like this chill computer dude who's like, oh my god, if you go down... Well, you Ultron get had the... a personality, and that was one of those cool little things about him. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, Not so much I fan mean, of could... that personality, but... Yeah, we, we, we could talk about <laughs> Ultron for a while, but we, we're busy with the entity right now. So... Yeah, so like either it got told by him through an earpiece, or he computed that himself which was the worry i had i was like oh god he's not a cyborg right but just like he's <laughs> running with the entity in his head or some shit but then of course why does the entity only know this now well this and, be... and, and, is it impossible uh, you know, that, that he that he knew it for a while and he waited until this moment because the plan still, still had a use for mantis and so now she's yeah. finally exhausted her use so then he should have the been able to click him I mean, this was always the case anyway, but he should know that she doesn't die from that and then tells Ethan the, the, the information. Why isn't that a part of the algorithm? Yes. And then, of Maybe course, the like, algorithm it, thought he was a better stabber. Well, the funny you part is that it doesn't doubly even, sure that she's dead. Yeah, you don't because, even need you know, the consequences. to know that she would tell anybody. That is the last source of information you consider to be so sensitive it basically defines your existence. You make sure she's dead, even if it costs Gabriel's yeah. life. Doesn't uh, matter. Get rid of her. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I was just thinking, by the way, on the cyborg thing, if he's a cyborg, he shouldn't be losing any of these fights, right? No, this is the I don't <laughs> think they're gonna make him a cyborg, <laughs> <laughs> but you worry because no, like, oh, oh. well, you imagine if it's like Barry from uh, from Archie, you know, like I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean the backstory's similar, they're rivals. Maybe he dropped him out of off of uh, like a building, and then they turned him into a, the entity turned him into a robot. And then he comes back to fight him. Oh my god! Barry's funnier and more entertaining than Gabriel, though. I should have mentioned, by the way, uh, one of the lines from the director of intelligence. He uh, Gabriel says to him, "You want a super state that can rule the world?" And remember, he also says he wants to erase some of the old thing from America. Uh, but then the camera like tightens up on uh, Dr. Fuck, I forgot it again. Gordon. Um, and he says, for the greater good. I was just like, is this film <laughs> fucking around? Just like like, it's yeah. so evil. He's what so evil. Mean, are we just Why does so he, clouded? He, What's going on? The way he speaks is evil. He's got an evil tenor. It's such a, it's, it's such a moment of the writers and the director being like, that guy is not he's bad news. And I'm like, yeah. I get this guy it. is not a hero. <laughs> He's one of the bad ones. Yeah, just so you know. So I do have a question though, because um, I forget specifically if there's any consequences of it. But wouldn't firing multiple gunshots like that in a train yeah, alert a gonna... lot of people that something's no. up? Oh, okay. Well, carry on then. I know this because it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. well, I mean that, oh, that, that does. Trains can be loud, louder than bullets. <laughs> it's a, as it's as a someone who has been there, in things. a. I've been in a literal coal-powered train before with open windows, and I can assure you that um, if a gun went off, you would definitely hear it. They're not that loud. The The horn is loud. The horn is really loud. They didn't do the, the meme that some films yeah. and games do, right, where you have to synchronize the... Uh... What's, what's, the, what's the movie that did that, where you have to synchronize like the sound of... Um... Well, Enemy at the oh. Gates... And World oh, War. Oh yeah, Call that's right. Yeah, yeah. Call of Duty did it because Anime Gates did it. Sorry if you mentioned it already, Rags, but The Great Escape, right? 
Oh yeah, the Great Escape. They do it at least. Oh, and of course twice. Shawshank as well with the uh, use, with the I, the old uh, lightning and thunder. The because the, 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 the one in Indiana Jones is accidental and kind of hilarious, but the Great Escape one is actually deliberate as part of their plan, where they look out the window and make sure that it's synced up so that sound isn't detected. Oh yeah, they have both the singing and they have the uh, yeah the hitting the pole outside and the yeah. Um. So anyway. Grace, well, uh, yeah, Grace as Widow, she's able to press the accept button on the exchange. She hovers over decline and hits it. And then Kittredge is like, wait, what? And then she says, I just had the strangest feeling I was selling more than just the key. That's this so, made me so lame. sad. I was like, why, why would movie? you do that? I why got would it you when she hit decline. <laughs> I understood. I understand the choice. No, you see, if I did this, I would be selling my soul. I yep, know. I got it. I understand. Maybe, it. maybe that's a good time to talk about the Fallout example because we said we would at some point. And I can't think of a better time to do it. <laughs> it won't take yeah. too long. It's just more of a um, recognition oh, of mean. how they used to be able to do a thing. Okay. Ooh. You talked about Fallout. We did that summary earlier. We've mentioned it a lot because, as you may know, this film is a sequel to that film. And it's kind of the best Mission Impossible film. I don't, I don't know if that's controversial. I don't think it is. but um, It's the best one. They arrive at the place that uh, Solomon is going to be exploding the nukes. And unfortunately, they realize that uh, Ethan's ex-wife is here. And so he's quickly realizing, oh shit, this is why Solomon did this. He set this up to be this way. And that's like already dawning on him as a fucking horrible thing. And in this scene, you, you can see from the way that um, his ex-wife is looking, she's starting to realize that. Like, why would Ethan be here? That's weird. And the first thing she realizes by seeing the group is that, oh, fuck. This is, this is a serious, this, this, there's actually things going on. This is, this is a mission. And she already knows what his missions entail. And then, um... Her, uh, her new, I think, is it is it her husband or is it just boyfriend? I can't remember. Well, he walks up and he's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Um, you know, wh where were you? And he, he mentions some country or whatever. And then he's like, oh, you're there on work? And then she says, no, 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 he's here on a holiday. To try and give him a cover story. And then uh, Ethan goes, no, I'm here on work. Like, the implication being to her, things are bad right now here. There's a problem. Mm-hmm. And that she gets to know, like, understand that and starts to worry. And then you see on her face, she starts to realize because the husband's describing their project here. He's saying, like, oh, it's great. Someone contacted us to come out here to use the, like, the, I, I forget what they're doing here. Some they kind made of a big thing. anonymous donation for, yeah. uh, to have them set up here. Big, big anonymous donation that sent them out here to do great work. And he's talking about it with so much pride. And she is at first, and then her face falls because she realizes. Oh shit! That wasn't that was this, Solomon Lane that did that, or rather, from her POV, well, that some someone, bad person did that. You someone know, did it to like put this. me here because this is where some horrible world-ending event is probably happening, and it's to manipulate Ethan again, just like in the third yeah. film. Yeah. Yep. And she realizes it. Ethan realizes it. And then, on top of all this, this is all done with facial expressions, by the way. It's fucking great. Uh, we get a shot of Ilsa watching all of this happen. And now this film is about how she's taking drastic measures to get her life back, and she's watching someone have his life dragged back into his work all the time to fuck with him, and he's desperately trying to keep her safe in a way. It's like the opposite of what she's doing and how much he has to sacrifice. Like I said, this moment, I'm pretty sure, is what facilitates her to be inspired to be like, you know what? I'm probably going to join the IMF and instead of trying to get back to the life I had. Instead of trying to commit my own like individual missions that benefit me, I should be benefiting as best I can, just like uh, Ethan does. The really good scene, it happens in like a minute, and a lot of the most meaningful stuff in here isn't explicitly said. It's all stuff you have to draw out by paying attention. Mm -hmm. What happened? It's so layered. I don't know what happened. I, it's, it's, uh, I don't get it. It's like they're made by different people, but they're not. Very not. <laughs> it's it's, it's the, the same these, team. The exact same. Dunn is my last team. name. It knows who I am. So, uh, yeah, really sad that we've been through so many examples of the dialogue in this film. Uh, absolutely not trusting that the audience could pick up fucking anything. Just 
almost like to the point where they kind of they're a little bit awkwardly embarrassing like oh fuck we said it once but maybe we should do it again just in case what did it be? you could have you know the, the 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 stupid lie where they say uh they organized the party the entity organized the party the party is the entity in fact you could say it's all the but like they didn't have any of that they could have just had us realize that symbol is the entity he, he, what if the entity put it all together like for us we don't need any of the characters to realize that does it even or benefit the scene? Maybe the reveal of the entity's face, so to speak, or well, something. Well, just with the symbology surrounding the area and the nature of like this exchange, we, the audience, can be like, "Oh, the entity put it together," exactly. and that, that can help us predict how something's going to go down in future or whatever through more complicated guess, and more subtle writing. In a different world, in a different film, a better written film, there could be some utility in having the characters realize that they are literally surrounded by this all-powerful thing which hitherto has only really existed as concept for them and now they are you know there's a visual representation of it basically suffocating them i don't think that's what we get i don't think the scene does enough with it but i think yeah. you could have made something good out of it well i mean this an ai that is going to take over the world has enormous potential but it's a tough writing challenge that's not something yep. that and they were not lightly. up for the task nor so uh kittredge has the key She's like, you know, happy for him to have it. She goes to walk away, but she pickpockets it out of him and then says, I need to go. Uh, brother, stay here. I'm fine. And it's so annoying. It's like, Kittredge has the thing that he considers to be the most important, like, item in the history of the world, and he just lets it get pickpocketed. He doesn't put it in any kind of... I would expect a fucking full-ass briefcase. A special, yeah, a special case that is designed specifically for this key that has biometric scanners and a lockbox and like it just pure analog. That would be yeah. cool if it was purely analog. We're talking like tumblers and an actual physical lock, because you know you don't want something digital really because it can uh, be messed with. Cuffs, cuff it to his hands. Thing a lot of people do to make sure you can't steal it. <sighs> so um, then they realize. Because uh, the White Widow wakes back up and she stumbles into the room, which again, if she hadn't, uh, Grace would have been able to get away, more than likely. Um, but she does, right, at the right time, and so they start chasing her. And it's weird because she doesn't get very far before the brother is in the same carriage as her and he shoots up, which makes everyone panic and crouch, and then she puts her hands up. At this point, I, I don't really know why he isn't killing her. There's not really any reason. He's like, give me the key. And she's like, why don't you just kill her? I guess he wants to, like, find out who this is and how they did all this and a, a great theory but he tells his men to kill her after he gets the key off her okay well yeah <laughs> because <laughs> of course her. they do because this you know facility yeah. well so Which that's he the should thing. probably want to know this info but he's got right. him and a henchman in there they both got guns on her she put the key on the table it's all over they got guns on her she's dead dead as a donut there's nothing this is all over dead 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 <gasps> in comes ethan he... oh my goodness how, but like wait, a, what do you mean in comes Ethan? Well, that's a good what question. I suppose we didn't properly talk about <laughs> they're on a, they're the on famous a... stunt. He couldn't get on the train because it was going too fast. So it wasn't slowing down around curves. So he couldn't get onto it. Therefore, he had to drive really high up on these, like a cliffside and drive his motorcycle across like a ramp, like rock structure and pull a parachute out and land on the train. That was his plan. Before it's, he does that, I think we mentioned this on Open Bar that, because, yeah, it's an impressive stunt, but the film really, really, really wants to make you aware how impressive the stunt is. So he, he goes up in the first instance, looks down and says, basically lists all of the difficulties. There's ledges and there's rocks and it's jagged and it's going to be really difficult, just so we know how difficult it is. So when he eventually goes and does it, we can be even more impressed than we might otherwise have been, because we know the challenges he's overcoming, um, which is a bit heavy handed. I, I think the stunt's really impressive, but I don't think it necessarily it, needed all of that lead in. It's good. There's a lot to say. It's good. It's neat. Uh, but, Drinker was you know. possibly one of the most critical of it when we were doing open bar, which surprised me. He was he was kind of saying like the way they shoot this, um, it's hard to tell. It's hard to they're not quite showing off just how real it is. To the point where an audience might be fooled into thinking there's more CG here than you'd like or would think. Because uh, the, the only comparison I think that's, that's most viable is the Fallout Halo jump, which is very CG-ified. There's loads of CG and there's a whole fucking storm getting CG'd in there, but it's, um, it's, it's still Tom Cruise actually doing the dive. It's, you still know a cameraman dived with them to ensure all that's happening. And uh, then there's just the stakes of how everything's going wrong. They set up how the, the oxygen tanks work for the pressure and stuff, and, and that comes out of Walker's uh, tank 
when a uh, lightning strike hits them or gets near them, whatever. And so he's out, and uh, Ethan realizes that the he can't reconnect his tube either, so he has to reinstall his own one onto Walker's to get him up. And as soon as he does, it starts saying, like, alert, alert, pull the uh, parachute. He's got to pull Walker's, but also his own, but also when he's out of the range of Walker, but also not before he's too late to hit the ground. And this is all while the camera's spinning around, he's spinning around trying to get all of it. You know, <laughs> the cameraman died with them. That's not what I meant, dived. But um, oh. there's uh, a lot to it that's super cool and, and, and super interesting. This one, I mean, yeah, he goes up the ramp and then down and pulls the chute. Um, that's about that's about it. It's very straightforward, and it, the camera's far enough away that a lot of people could assume it is actually CG. I know it's not, because I saw all the marketing stuff. I saw it being done several times in a row. It's real cool. Um, but it just didn't hit as hard as a lot of the main stunts in a lot of Mission Impossibles. Cool. Yeah, it was really yeah, neat. Yeah, it's but strange. Like, you, know. um, you compare it to yeah, climbing the Burj Khalifa or hanging off the side of the plane... Uh, or even even just jumping from one roof to the other in the London chase, like to me that was more impactful than uh than this yeah. one. Even though this as a stunt is crazy, <laughs> like you by you know by comparison. So he does this, and he's saying as he's landing, like Benji, I don't know if I can make it to the train. I don't know if I'm, I can get this right. And so unfortunately, that set of lines confirms that he randomly entered the train. And he happened to knock out the two men who were trying to shoot Grace. Guys, entering the train means crashing through the side of the train. And he goes head first. His, his human ass, his human ass body. Train. Not the windows, the side of the train itself. He's not wearing a helmet. He's <laughs> he is he is paced. He is he is paced and on yeah, this the is side the of the thing. This is the thing I've seen the most complaints about from most people is this one bit. Um, a lot of people say, hey, man, I don't know crazy. why they wrote it to be this way. This crazy is nuts. things happen like, in obviously Impossible this movies, is... okay? It's like, mm. No, but, but uh, uh, think like, about... And, obviously, and just this is silly. To, to, so, Grace is about to get shot. He crashes through the side of the, the, the train at just the right moment to stop that from happening. At just the and right place. And he's okay. Yeah, and he's okay. Right place, right time and an impossibility in terms of actually making it through the train by crashing through it. Uh, or at the very least, if he managed to get through, he has no bones left. He just It's just paste inside of he him. might have an ankle bone. Maybe. Like, a human then... being isn't tough enough to go through the side of a train to the point where like the, there's a hole in the side of the train. To where, to where when the, the thing it's like, which one breaks in this situation, the person or the train? Well, the train. To the metal fair, train. It is only the glass that breaks. It's nothing more than that. Is it actually? Yeah. I thought no, it was the whole... I wanted to check it because when you said it... I... Wait, is it really the glass? Just the glass. Is it just the glass? Doesn't Even he go then? through it at, a, at a pretty I much believe... at the right angle though? And then you've still got the train traveling very, very quickly at a right angle to the direction he enters the train. So even if he just goes through the glass, the train is still going very quickly across him. Well, so wouldn't he get twatted by the frame of the window and cut in half? <laughs> What's worth mentioning, too, is he goes through two. He goes through the other the one on the other end, too. His head. <laughs> he just... Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, ow. His head is how did done. He okay, so then it changes to how the hell did he manage that? I don't know. If he was they're... aiming to go through the window. Maybe they're inspired how by John Wick. That? I don't know. And... And then, of course, what if, uh, why, what if he fucking hit someone, like an innocent person? How would, he didn't know who was in that train. And if he hit them, they probably would have been killed. Um, yeah, it just, it stretches far beyond what Mission Impossible usually does for, um, believability. It, it okay, I guess, it. I, I thought he went through the, the side of the train. <laughs> okay, if he went through the window, even then, that's still pretty bad. Yeah, He's not as bad paced. as I thought, but still, just, He's like still I said, a huge problem. Both windows. <laughs> Yeah, both. Yeah, Mash he's still smashed. paced, and then of course he gets yanked because his parachute's still hanging out of the the window. So he gets yanked back. Yeah, but uh, it's all good that that happens for him. It's 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 very ideal because it, it stops a bad guy. He's so about to like, be executed. Wow, the wind picks up and he knocks out the guy who was about to execute him. That's incredible. That's like seven conveniences all stacked on top of each other. <laughs> A little bit. Timing, place, and, you know, actually how Timing, he was multiple to... times, place, multiple times, the fact that this didn't kill him, the fact that he was even able to get through the windows, seemingly angled through the windows to get through. 
just yeah dun, dun, it's insane dun, dun. <laughs> guys the entity knew what would happen you joke but yes the entity knew all of this was going to happen and we're about to find out how or rather proof that that's the case so uh she says are you okay and then he says are you okay and um she she has like a good 10 second reaction of her trying to hold on to her emotions but admitting that this is way too much for her and again just good stuff it's a pity yeah, it's that uh, such a great character to be killed for us to have this character yeah. Um, and she's doing such a great job with acting it. So I think the editing here is at its like people have made fun of the editing in this film in general, but this is the worst as far as I'm concerned. When he got the wind picked up his thing and he hit that guy, that guy was also holding the key. He dropped it, and then it, it like cuts to Gabriel. It's at Gabriel's feet. He's in the carriage, and then they look. It cuts back and they look, they're looking around like, where is it? Well, what the what the hell? Where's the key going? Oh my god. And then he's holding it and looking at them like, haha, I win. Turns around and starts walking away. And then it cuts back to them and they slowly look over at the carriage and his back is already at the, you know, at the, the door, like he's leaving. It's like, how did, how did that happen? Like, the, it's like the shit with the serial killer is chasing someone. They keep getting reversed back every single shot or the dinosaur. Yeah, every the time world. there's a cut, we get to reset the distances between the parties, yeah. He took like 10 fucking minutes picking up that key, and they like look at everywhere, and somehow they just don't think to check, I don't know, maybe someone's in the carriage? Oh, he doesn't kill him because um, he doesn't have a gun. And he oh, doesn't okay. have a gun for fair no enough. reason at all. All right, well, fair enough. Um... I mean, it's gonna come up again. He should have a gun. Anyway, should have probably had a gun. He yeah. picks up the key and he's heading to his extraction. Ethan's like, "I gotta go get him. You go stop the train, Grace." And there's a boss fight. Ethan versus Gabriel. And, and uh, it's a fight. Gabriel doesn't have a gun. Ethan didn't bring a gun with him because he's fucking stupid. And so they actually have to have a fist fight. Ugh. And then. He actually gets to the point where he almost kills Gabriel, and you even have a moment of like, you can't kill me, Ethan, I know what the key does. And then Ethan's <laughs> like, I'm gonna do it anyway, here I go. Oh. Then uh, the fucking agents turn up. And they're like, mm. hey, Ethan, you stop that right now. And it's like, oh my god. <laughs> did we, I'm sorry, did we have a... um? Did we have the the chat about uh, salt and pepper here? How come they're uh, how come the, the, they had like that bar talk about the what they would do with the uh, um, what they would do with the entity if they got the key and stuff? I didn't mention it because I didn't think there was anything worthwhile in what they. Said. Well, that's kind of like the reason it's almost worth mentioning, right? Like they they we specifically stop the movie sort of and take a time out so that they can have a so that they can have this brief conversation one of them about well if i got the key then i would turn it over to my superiors because one person shouldn't have all that power and they like start to delve into this like thing about like like they start to touch into like institutions and individuals and power and how much they should have and stuff but it's just like it happens so fast and kind of out of nowhere and then it's gone and it's not really brought up again like it's weird how it's that the just sort of happens. Yeah, the disagreement between them, I thought, you know, had the potential to be interesting, and certainly if it pays forward to a, a split, and like you know, one of them does side with Tom Cruise, and one of them sides and sticks with the government, and they fall apart essentially, and that has some kind of plot relevance or significance paying forward, but it doesn't. It it is just there, and it doesn't. It's not even that well fleshed out because the like, one person no. doesn't deserve to have this much power. So I'm going to give it to my superiors. Yeah, that's to, to give it to the government. A bit and of I'm a like, non well, but it's it's like it's weird. It's honestly strange that it just sort of happens and it's brief, and they're just chilling at the bar talking about it. And I think it's odd that this just sort of is a thing. As some people have mentioned, some of this stuff might make more sense once the second part is out. Like in terms of writing Maybe. goals, like what those agents talk about might come up again in the next film. Mm -hmm. Even if this is a setup, I feel like it's not a good setup, weak. you know? Yeah. yeah, like, this is weak. Like, this technically checks a box, but it's, like, just, like, uh, like barely 
scrapes oh, by because it is such a small thing as well and from two characters who really are not relevant throughout the rest of it it's not exactly the most memorable thing to like if you're relying on the audience to remember this exchange because it becomes really significant in part two you probably ought to have put a bit more weight behind it to actually make it memorable because i would be very surprised if many people when part two comes out look back and say you know what that bit i really liked and want to see the payoff for it was fucking laurel and hardy having their little moral moment that would be i want to see where that's going uh it's really weird that we end up having almost a one-to-one -one with dial of destiny as an action moment here they go through a tunnel oh, and gabriel the tunnel has the thing. knife and, he starts... and the, he's crawling towards him and he has the knife yeah it's yeah. like shot for shot the same it's disconcertingly similar it's uh and i mean it's it's probably worth touching on as well in terms of the fight on the top of the train in mission impossible one it's like going so fast that they can't like stand up or fight on the train it's like they're actually on top of a train here it doesn't feel like that if it was like well, a standard movie fight on top of a train like again, the first one like a bullet that. train or yeah, something crazy like a really fast yeah, train yeah so to be to be clear the train in mission impossible one is going faster but even then this train is going at like its top speed you got to imagine that it's going fast enough that it would be difficult to stand on top of it. Well, and, I, and since they did film some of this on an actual train, I have to imagine they were not going at full speed when they were filming it, you know? I don't see how they could have. Well, I, Which I, I makes me wonder what the whole point of... Do that. Well, it's, it's, if you were going that fast, you, I don't think you'd be able to stand up on... It's like Archer said, you know, fighting on top of a train. It's like, you're still on the train, except there's, like, dust and shit blowing in your well, eyes. Um, you know it's hard to stand up. Maybe you guys know the answer to this, because it's cars. But, like, you can go to a certain speed where it's fun to, like, put your arm out the window to mess around or whatever where there's high winds, but it can get high enough that you need to not do that because it's dangerous. Like, if you... Your arm can get pulled back really far because of the wind, and that's in a car. Yeah, like you know, not even. A... Yeah, yeah, like I, I don't as know. Well, if you've got like a rush of exactly. air coming very, very quickly, it actually makes it very difficult to breathe. So if you're the person facing into the wind, you're at an immense disadvantage. Well, and like Archer said, it's like being shot in the eyes with a glitter gun. <laughs> like it's all that dust going in your eyes. Um, I don't know. It's, it look and and people and I see people saying it's like the train is an old train. It's like, but in the film itself, it looks like they're going pretty fast. Like in the film, it looks like they're going fast. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't look like they're going slow. I would be curious what the maximum speed of the Orient Express is. Probably something we can find I'm out. I'm actually right? looking at it right now. Um, I'm gonna take a guess and say ninety miles an hour, but that is a guess. Because it because it's a coal powered train and. But it probably has some modern stuff in there, like the brakes and things, some sort of safety chug. stuff. But um, let's just do coal train top speed. Yeah, that might be the way to go. Maybe, yeah. Um, you got 88 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. The fastest was the the mallard which was 126 miles an hour but that's oh, specifically God. the fastest um okay what about average yeah um i'm trying to look what's the max speed of a steam train here's what i thought there'd be stats for the specifically the orient express but maybe wow yeah maybe like maybe it. it uh maybe i'd have to look and find it but in it, the film, it depends it the probably has is it 80 in the film is that kilometers or miles if it's if it's Orient Express, it's probably in kilometers, right? If based on where uh, they are, the, right? well, the Orient Express was built a long time ago, so it'd be miles probably, right? Well, Before a lot of things started getting moved, to, maybe I would. I bet the gauges I mean, would be updated, but maybe not because I mean, both of them are still used now. I guess but... that's. But even a conservative estimate, if you're standing on top of a train that's going eighty kilometers per hour, and I'm wondering, that's... like, because it it looks like it it's a number of bends and curves. So, I, and I, I just would want to emphasize again: in the film, it looks like they're going really fast. Like yeah, in guess, the movie, yeah. it looks like they're going fast. The point is, I don't know. Fights point on is, top yes, of trains fast. are kind yeah. of like it's fun when you actually have it deal with the fact that trains go really fast. Like I saw someone in chat mentioned the Wolverine. It's like again, that was a bullet train, so it's gone a lot faster. But like that film, it feels like they're on the top of a train. This one it doesn't feel like that. It, feel, it doesn't feel the same. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like, uh, they're kind of, you know, getting blown around and everything, but it's, yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, 
It's kind of interesting to compare, though, because, like, the first Mission Impossible, the fight on the train is really, like, the only high-octane action scene in that film. Everything else... <coughs> oh, pardon me. Everything else is, uh, much more, um, yeah, subdued. Yeah, more tension and, yeah. Yeah, and, and even then, on, on that fight, it's, like, less of a fight on the train. It, like, it, it, well, it feels like a fight on top of a really fast train. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, yeah, they have their boss fight, it's broken up by the agents, and then, uh, I guess because the entity predicts everything, he, his watch says, jump off the train in five, four, three, two, and Gabriel does, and a perfect setup for him to not be hurt is right there, a car with, like, a pad in it. Oh, fuck off. So it, no, I, no, I do not it's... think he was flying down there at, like, a hundred miles an hour going No, it's fine, naturally. shut up. That's not the possible. The entity did all the calculations, okay? <laughs> The yeah, funny... calculate my asshole is what you can do. There's just I don't I don't believe it. But I do. This is the best I don't part, believe though. it. If you're gonna buy that, you, you this is the 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 crossroads of oh fuck I'm screwed because if you buy that, if it has the best computational power that it could predict that, why the hell couldn't it predict Ethan taking the key from him with a pick? Besides. Pocket? Yeah, because him taking the key would alter the mass of his body so that when he went off the train, he would have to time and <laughs> he me, me, just me, flings me, me. right out See? and splats. Well, like, the amount of, like, let's say that the computer predicts it perfectly. But that's almost irrelevant because that means that Gabriel, the human being Gabriel, not to be confused with the angel, what he would have to do, or Chris Angel, mind freak, who is a human, but Gabriel would have to be on the train standing at the exact spot at the exact time and mm -hmm. the train would have to be moving the exact speed based on how he fiddled with the train and he would have to react to that at the exact way and fall off like like the amount of precision involved with him landing on that because he's not jumping in a river you know like or he's not a, a big thing of hay or something that's been like prepped for him it's a it, it's, it's just a little it's like a what, what what would you even it's describe it? It's a small flatbed truck, isn't it? Basically? it yeah, it looks like, like it's about a shipping yeah. container size, and he falls on it at an angle, without even looking. You'd be fucked. Fuck off! I don't believe it. That, no, that, that all relies believe. on the fight on top of the train ending in exactly the right place. Yeah, this, this is what I'm saying. It is in exactly so, the right direction. It's, it's just... so fucking absurd that if you want me to believe the entity can account for that in a calculatory way, and the key ended up at his feet because Ethan was predictably going to smash head first through two That's glass just, windows. Sorry, the, the entity is super good at predicting yeah, the physics as but a it's result also of the not. consequences of the act. Yeah, it's, it's guys. It's just it's bad. It's just it's bad. Really bad. It's bad writing. It's bad writing. What would have writing. made it That's slightly it. more believable is if they hadn't jammed the train on top speed and the truck was positioned on a corner for which the train had naturally slowed down, making it much safer to jump off at that particular moment. And given that jamming this train at top speed hasn't changed anything else about the proceedings, it just makes this less believable overall. So again, I don't really know why they bothered with that. I can believe 100% that if you wanted to, and you were decently intelligent, certainly if you were as intelligent as the supercomputer, you could arrange all kinds of stuff for him to be able to jump off of and land in that's soft. Big piles of hay, a big thing of pillows, literal stunt mats and stuff that you lay out, or you just have it to where, oh, the first bridge he jumps off and parachutes, or he... some Something, right? But not this. This is too... Precise, and I guess that's the point of it, right? Is that he jumps in just the way that he happens to land on this tiny little thing, but that just makes it unbelievable. No, uh, you could have made it work, but you didn't. Which uh, is more? Which is more unbelievable? Is it this one, or is it the random crash mats in the Mandalorian season three when they jump off that train? Apparently, crash mats on the side of train tracks are just oh, quite a common occurrence. What are you talking about? Yeah. You made it work. Which one? Which it's one? The are you good about? episode. Well, the episode that has some good stuff in it. Um, remember when they jump off the train, we were all like, what the fuck? <laughs> hey, little platoon, well, I've just been asked to ask, I've been asked to ask you a question. What is the, what is your character's eye color? My, my character's eye color, I think yeah. is just black. You think? I don't pay much attention to my character's eye color. I can't really see him very clearly. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have one. If it is, it'll be blue, but I think it's just black pupils, I think. All right, I, I think it's just black pupils, but if they do have a color, they're blue. He's okay. an imposter. All right. That's what I've been. That's what I've been told. So, that's what I've been told. Mine are like a an, an orangey gold, like a brown gold, brown, like a golden brown kind of orangey brown gold. 
So I'm going to mention so. this again because I think it's just it's it's just that bad to be mentioned again. But uh, you know, we'll, we're about to deal with what our heroes do next. But we do get a little shot of uh, Gabriel getting away, real happy, real chuffed. He activates the bomb that's going to be destroying a bridge ahead of the train. He's like, "Oh, I've won! I'm so good! Oh, yes!" And then fiddles in his pocket. and He's like, "Wait a minute!" He realizes <laughs> he does not have the key. Then we have a nice little camera shot. Getting it all right and ready, that he gets really angry and he goes, Ethan. <laughs> I almost laughed in the theater. I was I... so mad. <laughs> it's just like, what the hell? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't think I've ever been angry enough in my life to yell out someone's name like that. You know, <laughs> like, like I can't even imagine what would I have to do. Like, do you think any of like, do you think anyone ever went like Hitler <laughs> or anything like that? And Maybe. he was a pretty bad guy, allegedly. So, like, no one probably did that. Like, come on, this is like a cartoonish thing. Stop it. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, again, because he's also the kind of personality that he, I thought the whole point of him was that he sees everything, you know, and it's all, it's just like, would there even be anger normally, or would he be like, all right, this needs to happen now? But the fact that they did that means that it fucked up. The entity didn't realize. The entity was like, oh shit, he pickpocketed you, right? Yeah, that was in my files. I just forgot. Oh, fuck. And it's just like, what am I supposed to think of this? Obviously, the second movie might recontextualize some of these things and improve them, but I have a feeling, I have a bad feeling that the second movie is going to make all this even worse. Is there any way of doing it that makes sense that isn't the entity deliberately trying to fuck over um, Gabriel at some point? I'd be your only chance to argue that all the events of this film were what the entity wanted, but it's hard to make it so that it ends up at a point where we go, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right, though. You would have to make it to where, like, the events that this film ends are one of many possibilities that it has prepared for. Like if they if they gave the idea that it doesn't know which one it's going to be, but it's probably going to be like one of 10 or 12 possibilities where people end up, and it has specifically prepared for each and every one of them, and then it doesn't actually have to be that precise, as long as it prepares for all of the possible outcomes, which is more just a testament to its effort than its you know predictive capabilities. Which would be is... more believable, and also like in like like that would still be a problem. Like no matter what happens, it has probably gone through the effort to prepare for that possible outcome. It's gonna be like Endgame, where what we get to see is the L entity's ultimate plan. We'll be like, man, you could have done that so much easier if you'd just done this, this, or this, this, or this, this. Why the hell did you do this? And that's what the conclusion is gonna be because it's too hard to contextualize all of this properly at this point because we know that a lot of it is just a result of the fact that. They're kind of get, just trying to get to the stuff they want to get to. They didn't really care how they got there. And what what is its ultimate plan? I'm still really confused about this. We'll one. find out. I think world domination. World domination. We'll well, do but it already has that. I know. And th there's a much more the most effective way of making sure that no person finds your key is to use your control of national defense to launch the nukes and wipe all the people out. I mean, that would do a job, I guess. Like, it's funny that it has. Plan basically that capability, but the people in that room in the beginning of the film don't really behave that way. They're kind of like, yeah, it's, it's getting out of control. I'm going to have to see if we can do anything about this. But these keys, they might give us control of it. It's like, guys, we could all be dead in a minute. You seem to be feeling that way. You seem to be like, chill. I don't know. That's good, I guess. Stay calm. Get the job done. So... The agents have got their guns on Ethan, but he gets a gun off them and then hands it back and says, Listen to me. Everyone's going to die unless you do exactly as I say. And I thought this was strange because they need to take him in above or else. Uh, and they don't have any reason necessarily to trust him considering the job that they're doing. If they saw that the train had been sabotaged and they need to sort it out, I guess that's fair. But they don't actually know that that's happening yet. And I guess it's a, it's top speed, and he could say, like, it's a runaway train. Trust me. Uh, but, you know, like, I, I the thing for me is just that, wow, they could easily have just arrested you. Been like, we're taking you in, Ethan. Enough of your bullshit. Because um, they do go back and get everyone to safety, and then later on they try to capture him no matter what, you know? I just, um, I felt like there needs to be a bit more 
to that, and uh, you probably could have done it easily just by having him go with them to the uh, front carriage, right? And they all were like, oh, fuck. And Ethan's like, I'll work on this, you get everybody to the back of the train. Well, if you, if you build up that, that conversation they had, um, when the, the doubts first start to arise, but you have that as an on. Hello? Uh-oh. Little platoon? Hello? To kind of believe and trust him. I won't dial the train unless you stop me, so you're going to have say, to run forward Say that again? You, you, you cut out for a bit. What, what was that? Hello? Hello? Hi. Mahler? No, I can hear you. You're right. Oh, okay. I guess it's a little platoon, right? Yeah, because I think... Cut oh, out did and... I break up? Oh, there you are. Yes, you did. Oh, no. Sorry. Bad countryside internet. Is this any better? Sounds better. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, you're good. What were you saying? No, I, was, uh... I was saying that if you'd build out that conversation they had when they're, you know, the first doubts emerge when they start to say, well, maybe he's doing it for the right reasons. If you build that out throughout the film to the point where they're prepared to go along with it just in this moment when he says the train is going to crash, come and help me, then that's a bit of a payoff to some nice character work and a moral well, yeah. decision that's been invited. Like, that's, well, that's what we could have used the bomb for at the airport. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, we think Ethan's the bad guy, but why would he turn in this bomb to us that he defeat was able to defuse and like they would assume that he had disarmed it or something because there's no warhead or something in there or like maybe it was an act it actually was a bomb and he did this uh, something i don't know like you could come up with these ideas and the writing process to where oh maybe they don't even entertain so the bad. idea that like the the train has been set to its highest speed and that ethan can put it back to normal in a sec and then run away you know what I mean? Like that could just he could be lying to them, but they're just like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure you're telling the truth, and then we'll arrest you later. It's just like, okay. good that this is how it's working out. Could have gone much worse. Um, so trains barreling forward, and uh, Ethan and Grace decide that they can disconnect the front carriage. That'll go off, and it'll automatically uh, start up the brakes. You disconnect that for the the um the carriages behind. The first one fucking flings off because the uh, the bomb goes off and destroys there's a bridge coming up and so it's just doomed. And then they break just enough to create a very specific action sequence where <laughs> each of the carriages is slowly falling off and they have to move through them before they fully fall off. Like, it, it doesn't fall off so much that they die, but it doesn't fall off, like... It, Words. It's perfect for an action scene, is what I'm trying to say. When really, so many other things should have happened. Of all the bits, the, of all the things it reminded me of, it was the Lost World Jurassic Park. Yeah, where the T Rexes yeah. knock the carriages, and yeah. they very slowly start falling over the cliff. The well, this one is filled with insane, crazy shit. Um, my favorite bit being a character bit. The rest of it's sort of just like they'll be fine, more than likely. Um, how did he unhook the train with the force of the engine pulling against the resistance of the cars? Uh, what do they mean exactly? Hook because the train... Because the, the way that the trains are hooked up, they're... I, I don't know. There's... He puts like a device on there and then he starts spinning it around, like unscrewing something, right? For him and Grace. Yeah, like he kicks it down and spins it and she rotates it. Those yeah, threads would be like locked that. by pulling force. That might I, be true, I, I don't know. Maybe I do not know the mechanisms by which train cars are connected to each other. I legit just don't know. So I'm not I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe not. I just I just don't know. I think um, back to my Thomas the Tank Engine law when all the <laughs> minecarts roll away. Like how did they come unconnected? So something I found strange about this right at the beginning is when the first one goes off, they try to go into the carriage with the first one, but if you remember earlier, Gabriel locked it. So they're like, oh shit, we gotta climb up on top. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. Didn't Ethan say in the dining carriage, like, you go to the front, and then later when he meets up with her, she is at the front. How did she get there, and then also not realize that door was locked? Do you understand what I'm saying? She would have had to go through that door to get to the front that they have to go back through later. And even if she didn't and went around, she would have tried that door first, meaning she would have learned that it was locked. I think... But so why is it a surprise that it's locked and they're trying to get through? Shouldn't that not be a surprise? Shouldn't she know that? Why wouldn't she have told him? Maybe she forgot. Not the best time to Maybe forget. She... Maybe she didn't want to have Ethan worry about it because he's already got a lot on his mind. Ooh, good point. More of them should do that more often. Yeah, that sounds helpful. It's very considerate. Um, 
I when when the I forget what carriage it is. It might be the dining one. When it's like over the edge and soon to break. I like the moment the where, galley. Uh, Grace is terrified and not 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 ready for a situation like this. She does a good job, Haley Atwell, spraying it, and I believe it for the character and the the situation. Like the power levels have flipped so hard now that she doesn't want Ethan to leave her. Like desperate that she, there's like him uh, her lifeline. Sort of reflection of how the film has moved her along. She's had a big old arc in this film. Yeah, I generally I like this uh, the the train sort of escape thing. Um, I I appreciate yeah the acting that goes involved between the two and how they deal with it differently, and sort of how they kind of help each other. And I really like how even though they go through essentially they go through three trains, they go through two and over one. Each one of them is distinct from the other. It's they're not just climbing through the same way each one. They have to get on top of the first train and then run. And then they have to get through the galley, which has all the slippery stuff and it looks distinct and stuff's kind of fallen and slippery everywhere. Like a kitchen um, with oil on the floor, I think it will. Yeah, that's the galley. Yeah. I don't know what galley means. Your, your it's your train terminology. Land. It's also called that on a ship. Uh but there you go. There's What's your it train knowledge. And a car, a kitchen on a car, um, galley, a fridge. No, I that's think. just the that's just the <laughs> dashboard where you put your salad together and everything. Um, now then they go through the the blue the blue one right with the piano, and by now it's like proper vertical, so they have to really climb up it. Mm -hmm. There's a couple so, of bits there that I could have done without. I think I could have done without the dangling piano because I, I kind of like the dangling. The I kind of I like the funny. I like the. I like the falling piano that is held by just a little latch on the bottom to keep it from scooting around. Um, I, of course, she jumps at the last possible moment, you know, when he's telling her to jump, which is like, yeah, I roll last possible second. But I like that that's hanging above them and it is getting looser and looser because it's not designed to hold the weight of the piano. Just to no, keep it's it from not. I, I'm pretty sure a single latch couldn't hold the weight of a grand piano for more than about five seconds. But um, I, I, don't know. I think it's more just I'd... a case of like, I understand the threat, and I think the threat and the peril is already conveyed without the kitchen exploding and without the piano dangling over their heads. They have something dangling over their heads. The kitchen exploded, really right? To. The gas well, disconnected like, and it caught fire, didn't it? There's definitely fire. I can't remember if there's there an was, explosion. I don't think there's an explosion. I think it's just one of like the many hazards that they portray, like the hot oil, the the gas, the slippery soup. Um, all it's, it sounds weird putting that in the list of dangers, <laughs> but. Um, but, you know, I, I still think w that it's, you know, it, it's all, you know, it, it's all decently distinct from each other as they go through the three cars. And I, I like, I do like the grand piano hovering there and it's slowly stretching the little thing. And it where, where on the scale thing. of threat is soup? Is it near the top or near the bottom of the, uh, well, you see, that's a good question because it, 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 it depends <laughs> almost entirely on what kind of soup we're talking about here, because there's a great difference between, um, like a chicken noodle soup, which could, I mean, be even construed as stew depending on how thick it is, versus like a gazpacho or something like that. So it's uh, it depends on what kind of soup. But either way, bad news, bad news. That slippery soup, soup belongs in bowls and in my belly. It doesn't belong in the floor when I'm trying to escape a train. Bringy, what's your opinion of the incredible action sequence? I mean, there's some f kind of, like, fun stuff happening in the carts themselves, but, like, I couldn't get over the fact that, like, the carts inconsistently, like, fall. Like, it seems like the amount of, uh, there's, like, an amount of force essentially being exerted on the joints between the trains, but they're all different just to facilitate, like, the drama that's happening in each of the, the train carts when they probably should have been in one that fell off and then that was it. So yeah, it was kind of fun stuff happening in them, but like I just couldn't get past the fact that like why is this one, why is this card remaining attached to this one for so long when like the last one <laughs> went like almost instantly? Yeah, so, yeah. I, I I don't know. I didn't really I didn't really enjoy it. Was it was funny because uh, all the things that have been mentioned, I have differing levels of issue with them. But dude, when when Mantis grabbed his hand. To prevent oh yeah, yeah, I was legit like, what the fuck? Yeah, that was so that like, part okay, was yeah, like where you whatever. where'd you come from? How'd you know that they were here? Are you you are a strong lady. Yeah, how are you um, alive? Yeah, how are you alive? I I guess it's the getting stabbed in the chest is like uh, it's, it's Schrodinger's health. Bar. Schrodinger's <laughs> to yeah health bar. 
and in that weakened state, how are you strong enough to hold him? And like, how did you even get down here without them noticing you? Yeah, no, you're right, because that's no, that's not a small thing. She would have had to move from all the way back there to the front, and remember, all those uh, those agents, they're filtering everyone forward. They'll check yeah. every nook and cranny. Their whole job and is to save not everyone. Them while having a grief, like a serious wound. Yeah, and why? Like, I guess the only thing you can imagine is she found out from them that, oh, by the way, Ethan and thingy, but but the thing is, she killed all their friends. They have a big issue yeah. with her. They know who she is, and they don't like her. They, they really don't like her. The fact that she's here, bullshit. The fact that she's even still alive, bullshit. It's like, yeah. But the fact she can the hold only reason up, bullshit. Is, yeah, bullshit. And then, of course, what is it all for? It's so that she can tell them uh, about the Sevastopol. Yep. So it's like essential. Why would she know without, about the Sevastopol? She overheard. Well, she, she was in the room with yeah. them when they were having that conversation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But, yeah, but it's gotcha. just like, wow, without her being alive, you're like a dead end. Like, yeah, you got the key, but you have no idea what it does. And there's only one person who seemingly knows who it does. And he ain't ever going to tell you. Like, so... And you don't also, know where yeah, he is. As mentioned, those agents probably would have found um, the dead director, by the way. And his probably. Man. And I mean, what's to be concluded other than she might have been a part of it? That's Yeah, that... <laughs> she might even admit it at it's, this point. She seems to have yeah. a change of heart. Yep. <sighs> Don't know, but yeah, none of that made any fucking sense. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. what a shame. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and she sits down to die, but uh, not before explaining all of that. But she doesn't die, because an agent catches up with her and it's like, oh, I feel a heartbeat. She's gonna be okay, maybe. And I'm just like, I wonder, how much of a gap do you think there'll be between this movie and the next one? In, uh, in universe time? Mean, like, in in universe. universe time? Oh, I have no how, idea. Uh, well, what's actually on a big timer right now? Kind of nothing. Uh, and the thing is, that's the bigger the gap, yeah, the more justification thinking. you can have for finding the Sevastopol. I think it could... I mean, we try... I'm thinking maybe... Uh, do you think it'll be over or under a month? Oh, well, so a big reason I assume it's going to be over is so that we can justify uh, Mantis healing coming back. Yeah, that's true. It's um, really weird that they would highlight that she's, uh, she's going to she... make it if they're not going to bring her back, I guess. Yeah, but she can be back, but in like a. Because well, she, she, it let's could literally say, be they just go, she made it, and that's nice, and that's it. But I because she'll be in custody, so she won't be able to like do any action sequences anyway. Oh, so right. why bother? Like I'm sure she'll be oh, in the IMF oh, by the next well, movie. Everyone can join uh, the IMF. I think the longer the gap is, I think the more implausible it will be, because the more real oh, yeah. world event will either have to be overlooked, written off screen, or probably just forgotten about entirely. That's the backfire um, of this. The more time the entity has, the more it wins. Because yeah. well, you know, it has it has plenty of leverage. It has many ways to threaten people. So giving the cure, I kill everyone, would be one. Um, it can do a huge amount of damage in that time. So I, I wonder if they will actually have it over a month, but the film will feel like it's less because they just haven't done anything. I think it's weird too, it's worth acknowledging, because uh, I know that the tunes we want to talk about this, I think, but it is switch over. It doesn't really just, it, you look broadly at the film. She's the crazy murderer person who runs through the whole of like several areas. She's she practically ran over women and children, right? She didn't give a fuck. But then she's like, wow, Ethan Hunt, he didn't kill me. What a nice man. You know, it's, it's like I should reward okay. him for his good behavior. But it's like, was she not aware that like she's going to encounter plenty of people that don't just want to kill her? It feels a little weird. It's like that was going to be enough for you to switch. What was your investment in all of this? Were you a paid yeah, mercenary? Did you believe in the job? This we is why playing up next time, playing up the idea like we did with Salt and Pepper about the whole like who should we give to you know who should we give this kind of power to and what happens to me if this plan comes to fruition, that should be littered throughout the entire movie and how all the characters like deal with that so that we can at least try and set up reasons why certain characters might do certain things like swap allegiances or something. I think I would have tweaked the, the earlier scene when um, Gabriel turns around and says, you'll betray me because he saved your life. I think I would have cut that entirely. I would have had him try and kill her because she's overheard the important information. And if you combine that with the fact that Ethan saved her life, then she has a reason to turn co- It wouldn't be a very good like reason, that, yeah. but it would be a better reason than we have. Yeah. I was, I was kind of thinking about that earlier, where, like, she- when I, when I asked how she knew, I was thinking, oh, yeah, why would he let her overhear all that? He would tell her to go outside or something, right? So she can't hear? He'd want to be the only person who knows this. Like, and the entity would give orders, make sure no one else 
I mean, ideally, not even well, you, we but make sure no about. one else finds out. We right? would be like, why would the entity have allowed her to be in the room? It should have anticipated that she might learn something that would mean he'd have to get... You know what I mean? Like, this Less is the problem variables. with the entity. Problem with it. Every decision that leads to a negative in any way for the team entity should have been avoided with how much it... How insanely powerful uh, it is sometimes. Mm. Sucks. Yeah, uh, she has a pulse. They're gonna get her to a hospital, I assume. And um, Tom Cruise has to leave on his speed shoot or something, and it can only take one. So Grace got to be left behind. But that was kind of the original plan anyway, because he told her to say to Keytridge that she's willing to accept become an IMF agent. And I thought that was really funny because he could have just been like, "You're under arrest." <laughs> and then she's like, well, but, "But I want to be an IMF agent." And he's like, "That's great. You're under arrest." Yeah, well, people yeah. in hell want ice water, so I don't know what you want me to say, man. We've got so much to fucking ask you about Ethan, about the keys, about the fuck, all of this shit. This was insane. We, you, you're in trouble. You've been a naughty girl. And yeah, it ends with Keytridge saying, "This key brings you a new challenge, Ethan. The world is counting on you. Good luck." And by the way, your usual insubordination will not be tolerated. <laughs> yes. I don't even know Next what... time, <laughs> this is your last warning again. Um, and that that's... I mean, you kind of just stumbled upon it. That, that's the end. That's Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Yay. Uh, I mean, hey, before uh, yeah. we do conclusory thoughts, chat, what do you think? What do you, mm. uh... What do you think? Do you think it's incredible? Do you um, think it's... Do me a favor, you before you say your opinions, chat, say you've seen it or not seen it. And then dash, and yeah. then your opinion, so that I can, because I I know some of you have, but a lot of you haven't. Um, yeah, let's let's see what we got here. That's um, what a bad mid. Seen it <laughs> bad. Seen it. Well, they didn't have an opinion. They've just seen it. <laughs> hey man, I've been there. I still like it a lot. Haven't seen it. Confused. Pretty good to be honest. Masterpiece. I've seen Oof. it. Oh, we got too many to read now. Damn it. Uh-oh. Plan's been foiled. <laughs> Seen it? All right. Good. Sounds a wee bit on the Wombo side. Fast approaching Multiverse of Madness and the Flash levels of bad. I don't know about that. I wouldn't go that far. But I mean, it's... There's no multiverse in it for a start, so it can't be quite that bad. Still, or time travel, for that matter. Still a high tier of, like, fucking all-knowing AI gets you in trouble. All right and stuff. Not as bad as multiverse. Fun but flawed, seen it, enjoyed it, seen it, had two screenings booked and cancelled my second one. Well, okay. Um, I guess, who wants to go first about, like, sort of how they feel about it as a whole after all that? I mean, Gosh. <laughs> it's, like, deeply flawed. Yeah, a lot of problems. A lot of problems. And a lot of missed opportunities, too. Which almost hurts as much. I just can't get over the... It's, it's the ridiculousness of the premise, I think, that just makes the entirety of the rest of it nonsensical. Um, there's some really good, long, fun action sequences. I can see a fun film in there somewhere. But every time you have to go back to the stakes and the premise and the villain and the villain's actions and capabilities... And none of that makes any goddamn sense. <sighs> the entity is something that bleeds throughout the film, causing all kinds of issues. But even if you got rid of it, there's so many other issues that uh, mm -hmm. that are just general. Like, man, this is probably the worst dialogue in all of the Mission Impossibles I've come across. Maybe except two, um, which is so bad. Like <laughs> to say, like two is awful. Uh, and like heavily disappointed. How could this come after Fallout? What happened? Yeah, I'm incredibly guys? disappointed. Uh, yeah, uh, I was expecting a lot better. It's very jumbled. It's stretched out. It it feels like the a lot of people are butter kind of... scraped over too much bread. Absolutely, <laughs> a lot of people are hoping, I guess, that part two makes all of this work. Just like, but I mean. Let's get real, it probably won't. But like, I don't even think, is that what part ones are supposed to be? Films that we go, well, that was I, right, yeah, but, I, mm. I don't even know how we feel about th that idea, right? A lot of <laughs> like, people, a... I'm included in this, claim Fellowship as their favorite Lord of the Rings movie. The first I, one. I do, it's my, it's my favorite. One. 
I don't need the other sure. ones to make Fellowship good. Fucking brilliant. Well, I don't know. And there's only so much you can fix. So, th yeah, there are certain yeah. open plot threads which need to be resolved, and that there's more work you can do with some of the characters, but in terms of, like, people who are already dead, and the basic setup of the villain, and inconsistent abilities, I don't think any of that's going to be fixed by a part two. The main I thing is going to be continued. more of the, the nature of the Sevastopol and what happened there, and then what the entity wants, and what we can do with it ultimately. What's, what's Ethan going to do to it? Because, you know... I'd be surprised if it's that we get both keys, we put it in, and he deletes it or kills it, whatever. That's probably too simple. They're probably going to want something different to happen. A little bit more complicated. Yeah, I would imagine that they wouldn't do that. That just does sound too simple. And, you know, we're going to find out all about this past that Ethan has that I'm not looking forward to because I'm really annoyed that they didn't use their actual past. How many film <laughs> franchises get to fucking seven entries? That's crazy. Mm. Use it. <laughs> the, the first one was ages yeah, use ago. Use your history. Use it. Use your history. Come Don't on. Don't make shit up. Why would you do that? Um. Yeah. And then of course there's Ilsa, who got completely fucked over in this film. Yep. Fans the villain, of... like Gabriel, is like incredibly lame and stupid compared to Solomon Lane. Holy fuck. Yeah. Lane and uh, uh Walker. Well. Yeah. And there's two of them in the same movie. <laughs> you got two awesome villains. This film ain't anywhere near as coherent as uh, Fallout. Fallout rises above Mission Impossible as a franchise, in much in the same way a lot of I, I really so. good individual entries to like franchises can. I love mm -hmm. Fallout. I recommend people watch it. You don't need to see any other Mission Impossibles, though you should probably check out Rogue Nation, I guess, if you want it, because Fallout hits a bit harder with that. Um, yep. But I would never recommend this. I'm sorry. This is incoherent. <laughs> like, very hard yeah, to follow. Yeah, it is. But it's like, well, wouldn't you recommend the action scenes? It's like, I'm so sorry, but maybe you should go to YouTube's clips for that at that point. Well, I mean, if it's like a huge portion of the movie isn't action scenes, I get annoyed. It's like this room, Godzilla. Oh, well, the action scenes. Like, so it's right at the end. And there's like a substantially larger portion of the movie that isn't the action scene. Humans it's being stupid here. as fuck. But like, yeah. I don't know, is that, yeah, it's, I, I guess it's just lame that it's like, yeah, well, I enjoyed the action. It's like, yeah, but I mean, we've seen that you can have great action and a good story as well. It's possible. And it's possible in this franchise. It was the last movie. Why not do both? Why not? Well, indeed. yeah, why not do both? Isn't that it's tend, possible? You know, doesn't that tend to be a, 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 a pretty how important would, How could it agent? be worse? How could it be worse if the story was more coherent and the action was good? You know, like all the all the a lot of the great um, action movies that were made, even you know decades ago, they have good characters and writing in them, and they have the really cool action, and it helps it's, something it's, to last. Yeah. Fallout will last. Makes the, yeah, will. Yeah. You know, but then again, it seems like uh, I don't know. Something I get a little bit concerned about is like, damn, do we appreciate Fallout for the same reasons? Like, do so. we, or do we not? I don't know. I get a little bit concerned, especially, like, if someone was saying, like, that this film is as good. It'd be like, damn. Because, like, I don't know. It seems like on its face that it's, uh, it's just not, it's not the same. It's not the same. And in a lot of ways, it's similar in terms of, you know, like, the filmmaking, like, cinematography, acting, uh, composition, like, soundtrack, you know, sound design and everything. But, like, in terms of the actual storytelling itself it's yeah it's not the same thing and and fallout's not the same as rogue nation either it just it's just this it's this strange sort of film that somehow managed to come to be yeah and I... it, it has a lot of positive will because it's well there's the difference factor as one thing i think if you'd had a decade or more of almost nothing but action films this one would probably not stand up uh, to as much scrutiny, or wouldn't, it wouldn't be given the benefit of the doubt just by being different, um, because it, it wouldn't be different. So th there's an element of, well, at least it's not cape shit. Um, also, at least it's not preaching anything at me. Also, uh, at least uh, it's not your generic girl boss story. Also, Tom Cruise is, says nice things about fans. Like, there's all of these other things that I think predispose people to be charitable toward the film. This is probably um, the best time for this film to come out, is a way to put it. Yeah, pretty mm. much. It's just that. I think if you really compare just on the story level, there's a huge amount in this film which just replicates all of the flaws we're used to seeing 
in, say, the superhero meta, this temptation to always blow up stakes and having comprehensibly big bad guys. And it must be the world that's at stake. It can't be a personal story too much. Um, and who really cares if character decisions make sense? Like, the, a lot of it is not that dissimilar in terms of story structure and, and pitfalls to the MCU stuff. But because it doesn't look the same and because it says nice things to fans sometimes, I think it's probably going to get given a pass much more than it perhaps should. Boy, it's, it's that... being praised to high heaven. I've seen people say it's a mean, masterpiece. It's, I think it's got a 99 on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. So 99% of reviews were positive, and I think the Metacritic is 80. This reminds me of John Wick 4. Yep. Where or similar, and it's just, I don't know. I just uh, I the that impression that I get when movie. that's the kind of response that a film gets is not just yeah. No, I, I mean I really enjoyed the action scenes. Usually, what that represents in the broader conversation about these movies is people saying no. It's not just that it has cool action. It's like a quality film. Um, <laughs> well, which is know, what, how I feel about like, Fallout. I think Fallout is a quality. Well, I think film. that's yeah. I think that Fallout is quality. Um, but I don't know, it, it's frustrating Which when is... it seems like, you know, the takeaway is, yeah, it's a great movie, and then when you start talking about the storytelling, you sort of run away from that, back to, well, I mean, I like the action scenes and stunts. It's weird because... Or, uh, well, Mission Impossible claim, like, was always silly, don't you know? Yeah, it was that, always silly, so it doesn't matter. That claim really doesn't work very well when Fallout is the previous film. And uh, it's, it plays itself pretty seriously, for the most part. And it has it really much all of... more complex and varied layers between all the characters. Yeah. I mean, Rogue Nation plays itself seriously too, for the most part. It's definitely got some moments of levity in there, but it's definitely like, especially from Rogue Nation, which makes sense, right? Considering that it's Christopher McQuarrie, there is like a unified tone of trying to play it somewhat seriously. Better than John Wick 4, you don't get exhausted from the action. Which is better, this or John Wick 4? This is better. Three? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> damn you that was gonna be my answer i'm not sure as yeah, much as I, I appreciate the grace aspect i'm not sure there's anything in john mcfall that's as damaging as the entity i, I mean the entity yes in the entity of course, totally. yeah being a villain yeah. Ilsa faust kind of fucking counters like the, well yeah because by the time we're in john wick 4 there's nothing left to be invested in <laughs> there's no character to destroy <laughs> oh, I guess, I guess character. Yeah. whereas um, coming from fallout into this there's a lot to be invested in in terms of character i think i'd much rather watch this again than fallout or uh john wick 4 but oh man um, i might go the opposite way because john wick 4 is quicker Ooh, playing like this it's one a little bit shorter. This one takes a little longer to get through. Hmm. Well, um. All right. Possible. Well, we'll be Mission there for the, the Are final we entry. Give it a number? Are we going to give it a number out of 10? Um. <laughs> The people will uh, be very uh, sad if we I do don't that. think people will be happy with that, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. They know us you. so well, they know what number we'd give it. Why would we need to do that? Yeah. They, we've given you all of the arguments so you guys know exactly what number we'd give it. It's Probably a good. seven, you think? Seven, Maybe eight, about a seven, seven, eight. Maybe even a nine. Pushing Possibly nine, ten. Definitely. Yeah. So, yep. They, uh, hmm, look at them. How about that? And wow, that was uh, coming up to seven hours. Jesus, that flew by for me. Go. I think it's because I was just so ready to get all of these this stuff out. Because like, mm. like I told you, this this movie was difficult to untangle. There is so much that, and I don't blame people for this, but I don't know that anybody knows who the fuck anybody was working for at any point or what they wanted. Like, yeah, what if I get Dial of Destiny? That too. If I had asked people after they'd seen this movie who was the White Widow working for, they'd probably be like, well, she's kind of, she's like a a person who, well, I guess it was, was it the, was it the, and you'd be like, well, kind of the CIA is the answer to that. That's who she's ultimately working with and for. But she is afraid of the entity and she brokers CIA. between everyone. That, um, that feels in keeping with what you were saying as a conclusion that you were kind of forming, that people don't really remember Mission Impossible films. They don't remember them very it's well. It's unfortunate. I'm not sure how many people remember Solomon Lane anymore. Yeah, like if they could, yeah, or or like what his goals were or how he conducted himself. I think most or the people change between Rogue Nation and Fallout. Most people remember Henry Cavill. Don't think they're going to remember his name. No, and and yeah, 
It's it's like you remember the most prominent set piece from the film, seemingly. And even then, yeah, I don't even I don't know. Could be interesting to see how they play that in part two as well. Like the fact that you can get away with people out not paying too much attention. And I think it's mm. probably understood that they don't expect people to pay too much attention to what's going on or to remember it. I reckon that makes it much less likely they try and resolve all of the many open uh, questions than more. Well, because you're right. By the time, you know, when all's said and done, is this story, this one in total, going to be like five hours more than that? Uh, and then expecting people to remember all of those elements, you know, for the because I think part two comes out next year. And I wonder how they... much everybody's going to remember about uh, good old part one. I think they shot con back to back. Oh, okay, I think they yeah. did. So two is coming out next year, I believe, part two. All right, and then I yeah. think that's the end of uh, at least back Tom to... Cruise Mission Impossible stuff. Go back to the next film, and the, the broker is played by Ray Winston, and the fans are, <laughs> well, it was, she was always played by Ray Winston. That's what it was like in the first film, wasn't it? Like, that's what I remember. I would, I at this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. It's like if we can't, if we can't do Fallout again, just go to space, fight demons, whatever. I'm just, it's kind of. Or are they? Wait, they're currently filming, but then it's... I thought they shot back-to-back. -back. I have no idea. If the film's coming out next year, they wouldn't be shooting now, right? They would have shot, like, two years ago. Well, and the strike would stop them from out now, right? Uh, I mean, if if the film is in post-production, mm -hmm. I guess it probably I wouldn't know. be I too no, disruptive, I mean, if, right? Uh, if they needed to film... If it's filming film... right now, then it's... Yeah, then, then they, they yeah. can't do anything. Everything's come to a halt, like Deadpool stopped... Mortal Kombat 2, I think, stopped. Like, yeah, everything that was actively being shot right now has stopped. Well, what, how, how much money has this film made? It's opening weekend. How's it doing? A whole bunch, probably. Uh, apparently, the initial projection for its first five days in America was 90 million, and now it is 78 million. Hmm. So it's down from what they projected by about by about $10 million. I would really, do, like, um, I really do think that if this script was as tight as Fallout's, that it would make more money. I think it does matter. I don't see how, I don't see how it being better would mean that it would do worse if it, it had it, the same action Well, if well. someone was to say it'll do the same because people go into Mission Impossible for action, it's like, I really do believe the, I don't know. the idea that when you have that kind of character work, that people get more invested in the action. I think, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> do people get less invested when they care no, about the characters? characters they care about, I don't know. Well, it's just like, look at John Wick at this point. The character shit is just hilarious. But, <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, you're just sitting there like, you can make more money if you wrote it properly. Just saying. Oh, man. Oh, what, what, happens, if, what happens if this film underperforms compared to on a 300 million? Because it's, yeah, 300 million dollar, 291 million dollars well, budget. They'll get that second Dude. one and then they'll end it, I guess. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the second one happens no matter what. Well, it's the same, right, with Fast X, right? That that film cost, like, $350 million. Right. And made twice that, which I don't know if that means that they made their money back. And then they announced that they were going to make two more films. It's like, oh, maybe they gotta, maybe they got to shave it down to one, <laughs> you know, like, and, and finish it off. Oh, oh, man. Huh. I guess we'll have to see how this one does. We'll yeah, see if yeah. it's how, how it performs, if it's got long legs. I imagine that this film does knock all of the wind, whatever wind there was, out of uh, Dial of Destiny's uh, sails. Oh, I think oh, that was yeah. already dead, was. wasn't it? He's I've, gone. I think it's... I mean, pretty yeah, much, I'm, but this is, like this is it, right? This is... It's a pile <laughs> it's of planks over. and sails on the water, and you just drop a batch on it, and it's like... I, I don't Wait, think... <laughs> like, how, much, how much money has Dial of Destiny made so far? Uh, 263 million dollars, oh. and this is third weekend, right? So we're gonna find out soon how much. Oh, dude, it's over. Yeah, it oh, needs to double that. I think just just to break even, it has not to double going over that. 300 mil. Well, I mean, Wikipedia. I, I, I read that it needs to make. I read that it needs to make uh just shy of 600 million to break even. Oh no way! No Which way! Is just not going to happen. No. It's not gonna make it halfway there. And I just saw someone saying, I guess for Mission Impossible, it'll be fine, no competitions. Like, I mean, isn't Barbie and Oppenheimer coming out this week? Yes, but I really don't I know they're feel not like necessarily competing effects. for the same audience, yeah. but still, like, they're, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that won't be as disruptive as I imagined that this was to our, I mean, to our Indiana uh, Jones. Oppenheimer will 
bump it off of a few IMAX screens, won't it? But I don't think uh, there's going to be a yeah. Huge I love the idea, by the way, that there's like a huge cross section of fans between Barbie and Oppenheimer. <laughs> Statistically, I mean, they figure I know that it's, out. It's a, I know it's a, like a funny meme, but Barbie wins that competition, right? As far as I'm aware, yeah. Yeah. What my money would yeah. be. Yeah. I do not know what's going to happen for the box office with Barbie or Oppenheimer. I have guesses, but Me nothing neither. concrete now. Barbie will do surprisingly well, would be my guess. I think it'll do well. Yeah, I think it'll make a lot of money. Uh, Oppenheimer, I'm not so sure about uh, Oppenheimer. Barbie's rated but, PG-13, right? I mean, probably, yeah. That alone has me curious. Oh, yeah, because Oppenheimer is R-rated, isn't it? R. Yeah, he said he won't, he's got there's some sex scenes gotta be in there. It's like, alrighty. For Oppenheimer? Oh, wow. Yep. All right. And then, uh, isn't, not well the, known, not not the mushroom I thought I'd see in a... <laughs> and, then, uh, and then a couple of weeks after that, right, we got Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle. It's coming out in a month, right? Yeah. It's going to be great. Oh, uh, wow. I'm going to take a guess and, and say that one will underperform. What? You, wild what? guess. Why would... Wow, why? So the, what? That the, the question be, like, does it make more or less money than Shazam? Because I think that's... Uh, less. I think it'll make it, less. Um, I mean, my... It's gotta be less, right? Like, I don't know. I have no idea. I, I think, legitimately I think, think the reasonable I think expectation the trailer, is less. I think less is the reasonable expectation as well. Um, I think so too. But at the same time, like Shazam, kind of it was like a foregone conclusion that that film was a joke. I don't know if Blue Beetle is quite. Got I don't that even think. Going for well, it, I don't even know, think but... it has the notoriety to be considered yeah, yeah, a joke, that's... or really to be considered at all. Yeah, and the trailer think... for those who have seen it is just like this is who was this for? This looks mm. like shit. Yeah, this uh, looks actually terrible. Is it for stupid. a genre that's widely considered to be completely running out of ideas? It's yeah. probably one of the most unimaginative responses to that criticism. It could be funny, and it could make like like fifty million. <laughs> like, oh no! Oh, dude, that would if be... I wake up. One day, and I was like, oh, yeah, Blue Beetle, it made $56 million total, global. I'd be like, oh. And well, then, and then last off, what I expected. you got, uh, you got you know? Aquaman at the end of the year, and how, how's that? First film inexplicably made a billion dollars. Yeah, how the fuck did that I don't know. Crazy. I don't know that this one, uh, I don't know that this one even makes half that <laughs> with the way that DC's looking. And then Flash is out on digital this week, so... You know, make up for all those lost sales. People will just be eating up those well, Blu-rays and... As I understand, The Flash is going to be one of the biggest box office bombs ever. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, was well earned. They worked hard to do that. Yeah. This back-to-back -back with Dial of Destiny is like, man, a lot of movie... Not a lot of money to be lost in Hollywood. And Elemental is not doing well either. So, like, it's a lot of, a lot of films yeah. this year have, have failed. Like, Elemental a lot of films is, this year have just yeah. failed. Undeniably, categorically, they failed. They lost money. Um, Fuck off. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? The only two, like, runaway successes this year was Mario and Guardians. And even with Guardians, it's like, did about as well as the last two. So... What's the, yeah, what's those the are good. Uh, qualified success. It's going to be I'd rough as well, because I think as recent is it 2021 when more than a third of total box office was Marvel on its own? And then you add in a few other big marquee things like Avatar, for example, which put in inexplicable amounts of money. Yeah. But now that's all sort of going, and it was masking a general know, decline in the box office. We all knew that would make a lot of money, right? <laughs> uh, inexplicable in a sort of a... I no inexplicable is the wrong word. Yeah, um, unjustifiable maybe is, is um, it. One. It made yeah, like it made uh, an unfortunate amount of money. Well, Spider Verse has made a lot of money as well. So it's those three movies, are like the main successes of the year, and every everything else that was presumed to be a success. And is not Mario well. was the best. Mario was the right? highest grossing film of the year. And like, quality make... wise, wasn't Mario the best of them all? You think Mara is the best movie of the year? Wait, wait I mean, of, of those, I mean... Well, what else Between Avatar, year? Avatar, Mario, and well, of the ones we just listed that made, like, a lot of money success-wise. Mm -hmm. So, like, Avatar, Guardians, Mario, and... What was the other one? Was there another one you mentioned? About big box office successes? Oh, was it Spider-Verse? That was a good one. 
Oh, in Spider Verse. Well, oh, it depends. Ooh, is Mario better than Spider Verse? Do you prefer Mario? Do we know yet? Um. What? Yes. Um, I think I do, but well, I don't know. I will be willing to figure out what my position on Spider Verse is once they release when the second Spider -Verse half of that story. Do, yeah. I'm not sure how I feel about a bunch of things in that movie just yet. Um, which is probably something worth mentioning. Like Some people might have said, like, well, why would you cover this then? It's like, well, not all part one, part two stories are the same. They could recontextualize some things in this movie, and that some of those could be justified with inferences from this one, but I doubt much is yeah, going to change, yeah. and the majority of our issues are still isolated to this film. Spider Verse, there's a very specific and large, all encompassing mechanic that I need the answers on, because it not only tells me how things worked fully in the first film, but also what every character thought and what they were doing. I'm missing a lot of information. Um, so I, I really don't know what I think about Spider-Verse yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure what I think of Dead Reckoning. Yeah, I think Spider-Verse has a much better chance of being improved by its sequel than this one does. I don't know how you retroactively fix a lot of these issues. Um, but I'll check out part two of Dead Reckoning, and I will yeah. hope mm -hmm. for the best. Hope for the best. We're almost yeah. Hope Any for more the best. Of those action set pieces. I want with... it to be good, damn it. Yeah. Yeah. But before yeah. uh, we mm. go, Little Platoon, thank you so much for joining us for this this insane deep dive into a movie that no one wants to hear you talk about the plot on. <laughs> like, well, thank you so much for having me. It was great fun. As always. Always appreciated. Do you want to tell the nice people at home what you're up to, where they can find you, what you've been doing lately? Yeah, I've got a nearish four hour Indiana Jones 5 video in the works, uh, and I'm hoping that'll be out next nice. weekend. Are and you the only editor? Uh, I am the only editor, yeah, for this one. Oh. I had a friend do some of the audio for me, uh, just like cut some mistakes out and things, but um, yeah. And then I'm, yeah, I might try and put out a shorter one for this film. We will see. Uh, and I might try and hire an editor for that one just so I have time. But those are the next two things, I think. Well, exciting stuff. You, uh, you've you been covering a lot of the giant calamities that have come out here. I've, uh, the shortage they're of on giant my... calamities. Unfortunately, I fucking subscribed to so many people. They're all on my to-watch list. I've seen a couple. <laughs> I caught up with the... Uh... I was up to date at Little... It was almost Little Mermaid. That's where I was. And then I got distracted with all kinds of things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to them. Listen to your Mahler's probably sick of rude, Mission Impossible right now. Anyway. Well, you won't be making a video on Mission Impossible, so <laughs> like, I'll be fine on that front. <laughs> unless you are. I don't know. I don't want to predict anything here. Maybe you hate it that much. Yeah, follow your heart or whatever. If you have one, yeah. little platoon. If you have one, or if you just hate art and it's you want to destroy it. When we're on uh, Open Bar and there's a new movie out that me and him don't like, the audience will be like, wow, do they like anything? Like, <laughs> no, don't we, we no, they don't. do things positively all the fucking time. <laughs> what do you mean? But yes, also no. Uh, it's not you our, have to ignore our all, fault all the bits fault, where you say nice shit. things about Mission Impossible Fallout. That doesn't count. The fact is, you hate this one, and that means you hate all Mission Impossible. I'll I think tell you that's this how much, man. If Fallout were a bad film, I probably wouldn't have cared that much about this one. I'd have been like, well, there goes Mission Impossible. Just again. another, yeah, just another in the franchise of. Basically, meh, bad movies, with that one exception, but, yeah. Well, this is so weird, because at that point it would just be Mission Impossible 1, and the rest yeah. of Yeah. Got all this weird shit. Uh, yeah, uh, Rags, Springy, anything you guys want to mention? Uh, might have a video out tomorrow, Sunday, but I'm not sure. I got some family stuff that'll be happening. But I might be able to wrap it up and have it posted tomorrow before I leave in the afternoon. And if not, it'll be out Monday. Uh, work carries on on the main channel stuff in the background. Um, and I'm sort of back in the saddle, so to speak, on that. So, yeah, just expect some, you know, dog bite stuff uh, coming out here and there while I work on the big boy. And one day um, that'll be out, I think. I'm working. All right. <laughs> just, <laughs> that's all I got. Well, working away. Uh, I will say, since we're around about a month out uh the anniversary is on the 22nd but since that's a tuesday this year it's going to be the 26th and uh around about now is where i'll start trying to organize all the different things to do with it and it's worth mentioning i suppose since yeah it's a month and three days uh the 19th everyone the 19th 
where I will release next video. <clears throat> it's going to be um, more than likely around about five and a half hours. Been tooled on every single day by uh, myself and Fringy. Um, it's been, been a large project. They have yep. been working very hard on it. Um, it, most of you will be able to guess what it's going to be. Maybe next EFAP. Maybe next EFAP, I'll tell you. It's definitely mm, happening at this secret. point. But, a little uh, secret for longer. Yeah, a little longer. You can think about what it could possibly be. But don't get too crazy excited. You're going to be like, what I tell you, you'll be like, oh, right, yeah, okay. <laughs> <I'm gonna be laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> probably. Uh, but yes, uh, probably five and a half hours. It's not quite finished, but it's mostly there. Been nightmarish to edit, but I think you'll 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 really like the editing on this one. We've we've got some crazy different sources all over. I know the place. I'm looking I'm looking very forwards to seeing it. Um. So yeah, that'll probably premiere on that day, and we won't have an EFAP because we're still one ahead, and we've still got we we recorded another meme fap, so that's gonna go out at some point. Um. Good memes, by the way. This will be good memes for meme fap. Don't miss it. Some of that stuff's to, crazy good. Obviously, Super Chat catch-ups are on Wednesday. We're still trying to get them done. And we've got uh, something cool on the way. I guess I can't say much. Hmm. Done yeah, it, it's yeah, it's some, some pretty cools cool on stuff, the way, I think. Things. Some cool stuff, some cool things. Something course, new, not so new, maybe. Who knows? Say this yeah. for anybody who doesn't know already. But yes, it, the, 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 what I'm referring to on the 26th will be anniversary be our fifth year of EFAP, which means oh uh, boy 24 hour stream and we're gonna be doing all kinds of things with all kinds of guests hopefully little platoon shall join us we'll have yeah a... i'm pretty but sure i'm been, around yeah he's been pulling his weight around here on EFAP, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we will get him to play gothic yeah, phone have you done that before Ooh. yet i have seen you guys play it and i have always wanted to but i haven't oh, yet excellent. also my drawing skills are abysmal so oh, oh good like <laughs> oh, great. And, and, and like tiny penises and otherwise i'm basically done excellent nice. tiny penises uh, Tiny penises. All right then. Well, that's that's about that. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, hopefully, you, you enjoyed the breakdown. Even though I'm sure yeah. that everybody loved this film, except us. <laughs> that's okay. Good memes. And we will see you in the next thing that we do, whatever it may be. Yeah, everybody. everybody. You guys have a great day. And wait, wait, wait. We got to do the thing. Do the th Frangy, do the thing. Oh yeah, M mission accomplished.